Therefore, we refrained from presenting Hitler with a final demand for the breakout of Sixth Army or from ordering it on our own responsibility. One might add here that General Paulus, faced with the dilemma of whether to obey Hitler or the headquarters of his army group, would hardly have been able to opt for the latter. For the rest, it was perfectly clear to us that even if the relief groups were able to get through to Sixth Army, the latter could not possibly be left at Stalingrad any longer. The essential thing to ensure was that it retained as much of its fighting power as possible in the meantime. It was much more likely to achieve this in the Stalingrad area, provided that it were properly supplied from the air than if it were caught out in the steppes while trying to escape. The criterion of whether Sixth Army could be freed in this way was twofold, however. First, would the Luftwaffe be in a position to meet the Army's vital needs? Secondly, could the Supreme Command furnish further relief forces, and if so, would it be prepared to do so? Both questions were clearly expressed in our message to OKH only Hitler, who as Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht had power over all forces of the Army and Luftwaffe in every theatre of war, was able to judge what the prospects were and take the appropriate decision. If the decision were an affirmative one, we should be justified in shelving the desperate measure of an isolated breakout and in leaving the army at Stalingrad. Should Hitler, however, be unwilling to commit every available man to the relief of Stalingrad while there was still time, or should he indulge, against his better judgment, in illusions about the capacities of the Luftwaffe, he would be guilty of dire irresponsibility. The same may be said of those who, as it later turned out, awakened and fortified such beliefs in him or who would not understand that the fate of Sixth Army must have precedence over the demands of all other theatres. That Goring would commit the supreme frivolity of promising an adequate airlift and then not even lay himself out to produce at least what he had available was something no soldier could foresee. Neither, however, did we foresee to what extent Hitler would ignore all factual considerations in favor of his hold or bust theory? Who could suppose that he would accept the loss of a whole army for the sake of the name of Stalingrad? First impressions and decisions in the afternoon of 24 November we continued the journey from Starobilsk to Novokokarsk. Ten years before I had traveled down the same line to Rostov to attend the maneuvers of the Red Army in the Caucasus. On that earlier occasion all sorts of interesting impressions had lain ahead of me, today it was a mission as to the gravity of which my staff and I had no illusions. Time and again our thoughts went out to our beleaguered comrades at Stalingrad, despite the efforts of my ADC, Lieutenant Stahlberg, to divert us with good gramophone music and talk of other problems. He had joined our staff after the death of Pippo having been brought to me by my former colleague Dreskow, whose nephew he was. Stahlberg remained my constant companion till the end of the war. Throughout those years he was a faithful assistant to me in all personal matters. On the morning of 26 November I broke my journey in Rostov to see General Hoff, the head of the German military mission to Romania, who had originally been designated as the German chief of staff of Antonsku's army group. He painted a most disagreeable picture of the state of the two Romanian armies on the Stalingrad front. Of their 22 original divisions, he told us, nine were completely wiped out, nine had run away and could not be sent into action for the time being, and four were still fit for battle. Given time, however, he hoped to form a few extra formations out of the wreckage. The antithesis to Hoff's report was provided by a letter written to me by Marshal Antonsku. He had some bitter things to say about the Supreme Command, which he accused of not paying enough attention to his frequent warnings regarding the mounting danger in the Kremenskaya bridgehead opposite Third Romanian Army's front. He also complained of the way his own assumption of command had been repeatedly postponed. With every justification, moreover, the Marshal pointed out that of all Germany's allies, Romania and he personally had done most for the common cause. Of his own accord, he had made 22 divisions available for the 1942 campaign, and unlike Italy or Hungary, had unreservedly placed these under German command, 
despite not being bound to the right by any obligation of a contractual nature. His letter voiced the justified disillusionment of a soldier who sees his troops lost through the mistakes of others. Inwardly, I could not dispute the justness of the marshal's criticisms. I wrote to tell him that as one who had not previously been involved in the events in question, I was unable to comment on his strictures myself and had passed his letter on to Hitler at whom, of course, I knew them to be aimed. It could certainly do Hitler no harm to have to read such unvarnished criticism by his most loyal ally. Besides, the letter touched on a political question, that of confidence between allies. Antonsku mentioned that his mortal enemy, the leader of the Iron Guard, had been put beyond his reach by Himmler and was now being kept in Germany for a rainy day. The Iron Guard, a radical political organization, had earlier staged a putsch against the Antonsku regime and initially succeeded in surrounding the Marshal's official residence. Though the Marshal had ultimately been able to put down the rising, the Iron Guard leader had escaped abroad. It was understandable that Antonsku should consider himself disloyally treated when Himmler now held a protecting hand over this man. Such underhand tactics were hardly conducive to the strengthening of an alliance. Antonsku's original reason for writing to me was to complain that German officers and men, in both their official and unofficial capacities, had been guilty of roughly handling Romanian soldiers and passing defamatory remarks about them. Although such occurrences could be accounted for by recent events and the poor showing made by many Romanian units, I naturally took immediate action. However much one might sympathize with the indignation of German troops who had been left in the lurch by neighboring units, incidents of this kind could only damage our common cause. I have already shown what could and could not be expected of Romanian troops in various situations. But they were still our best allies and did fight bravely in many places. On 26 November, we arrived at our new headquarters in Novokokarsk. The only guard unit available was a battalion of Cossack volunteers, who obviously considered it a special honor to do sentry duty in front of our office building. As our main channels of communication were ready the next night, we were able to take over command of Don Army Group on the morning of 27 November. The task confronting us was a two sided one. Its chief feature, and the one on which everything depended, was the relief and rescue of Sixth Army. Apart from being a priority in the humane sense, this was also vital from the operational point of view. First and foremost because there could be hardly any hope of restoring the situation on the southern wing of the Eastern Front or, indeed, in the Eastern Theatre as a whole unless the forces of Sixth Army were preserved. The other side of the task and this had to be borne in mind throughout was the already existing danger that the entire southern wing of the German armies would be destroyed. If this were allowed to happen, it would most probably be the end of the struggle in the East and consequently lose us the war. Should the Russians succeed in tearing through the flimsy screen for the moment consisting mainly of Romanian remnants and German B echelon troops and emergency units which, leaving aside the so-called fortress of Stalingrad, constituted the sole protection of the whole operational area between the rear of Army Group and the still existing Don Front, not only 6th Army's position would be hopeless. That of Army Group A, as well, would become more than critical. 20 It was thanks to the commander of 4th Panzer Army, Colonel General Hoth, and the recently appointed Chief of Staff of 3rd Romanian Army, Colonel Wenk, that we ever succeeded at all, in the critical days at the end of November, in raising the screens which, by covering the enormous gaps between 6th Army, Army Group and the Don Front, prevented any exploitation of the situation by the Russians. Had the enemy been able at that time to thrust a fast-moving army down to the lower Don at Rostov which he was undoubtedly strong enough to do the loss of Army Group as well as Sixth Army would have become quite conceivable. But even though this mortal threat to the southern wing remained constantly present, the Army Group did not allow one single man or round of ammunition needed for the rescue of Sixth Army to be diverted from that task. As long as there was the remotest prospect of success, 
it went to the very limit of its powers and resources to bring off the attempted relief. To do so, it had to accept the greatest imaginable risks. The fact that we ultimately failed in our mission was primarily due to the extraordinary preponderance of the enemy's forces and the deficient strength of our own. Further handicaps were created by weather conditions, which greatly hampered the activities of the Luftwaffe, particularly in supplying 6th Army, and by the transport position which did not permit the relief forces to be brought into action quickly enough. Furthermore, we now experienced for the first time the inhibitions which emanated from the German Supreme Command and had their origin in Hitler's personality, opinions and character. These have already been described in the chapter on Hitler's military leadership. Their effect in this case was that the Supreme Command would not run the risk of setbacks on other fronts in order to put everything it had into the relief operation. Furthermore, they caused repeated delays in the taking of priority decisions, although the trend of the situation could be clearly foreseen and had repeatedly been pointed out to Hitler by our own headquarters. Of the two different tasks I mentioned as confronting the army group on its assumption of command, the first that of extricating 6th Army was virtually all over by Christmas 1942, when it was clear that 4th Panzer Army could no longer succeed in effecting a link-up. With Hitler still clinging to Stalingrad, HQ 6th Army backed down at the decisive hour contrary to the army group's instructions from taking what was possibly the very last chance of salvation. With that the army's fate was as good as settled. Hitler's ideal of still being able to relieve it at a later date by bringing up an SS Panzer Corps from Kharkov in January was illusory from the first dot what followed in the Stalingrad pocket after 4th Panzer Army's attacks had come to a standstill was indeed the death struggle of 6th Army. Yet in view of the fact that the other part of the army group's mission was still to prevent the destruction of the southern wing as a whole, it was not until this struggle had reached its closing stages that we could justifiably attempt to cut it short and thereby curtail the losses and suffering of the doomed army by recommending a capitulation. The battles to save 6th Army were, of course, closely bound up with developments on the whole of the German southern wing. My object in considering the latter separately in a later chapter is to give greater clarity to the various operational considerations involved. Situation at the time of the takeover The situation facing the army group on its assumption of command differed very little from that of 24th November. The enemy had obviously committed his main forces primarily in the ring in closing 6th Army. Of the 143 Soviet formations reported in the army group area, some 60 at least had been employed all along on the encirclement of the army. The latter's southern front was subjected to a heavy attack on 28 November, but this the army managed to beat off. On all its other fronts at the end of November there was only localized fighting, in the course of which the defenses became more firmly established. Nevertheless it was clear that any attempt to break out just then would have run into powerful opposition and the stocks of ammunition and fuel still available in the pocket would inevitably have been used up. Even if the initial breakthrough had come off, the army would have reached the Don without ammunition or fuel at a time when there could be no relief group at hand. Otherwise the enemy was busy feeling his way forward against the thin screens being thrown across the gaps to the south and west of Stalingrad behind which the relief forces were to complete their assembly. The army group's immediate problem was to obtain the clearest possible picture of the condition and intentions of 6th Army. What it had been able to discover from OKH and Army Group B at a distance of several hundred miles was obviously not enough. As early as 16th November I had been handed a letter from General Paulus by an officer who had flown out of the pocket. 21 in it Paulus stressed the necessity of having freedom of action in an extreme emergency, since a situation calling for an immediate breakout to the southwest was liable to arise any day or hour. The information which this letter neglected to give on the army's supply position was provided in a report furnished by General Pickett, a Luftwaffe officer who had himself just flown out of the pocket, having been detailed by the commander of 4th Air Fleet, Colonel General Baron V. Richthofen, to organize the airlift. According to Pickett, the army had enough rations, albeit on short issue, for 12 days. 
ammunition stocks were a 10-20% of the normal scale, which corresponded to the amount which would be expended in one day's intensive fighting. The vehicle fuel was only enough for minor troop movements and would not suffice to concentrate the tanks for a breakout. If these figures were correct, one could only wonder how 6th Army had proposed to implement the breakout plan of which it had given notice four days previously. In the light of this information, I resolved to fly into the pocket and talk to Paulus myself. However, my chief of staff and chief of operations finally prevailed on me to abandon the idea, as it seemed more than likely, from the state of the weather, that I should be detained there for two days or more. To be away for all that time was inadmissible in view of the tense situation and the need to keep OKH constantly aware of the army group's views, so I dispatched my chief of staff, General Schultz, instead, and on a later occasion my chief of operations, Colonel Buss. Schultz's mission was primarily to gain a first-hand impression of the situation and condition of 6th Army and its command staff and to brief the army commander on the plans for raising the siege. In this way the latter was to be given an opportunity to comment on the prospects and timing of the operation. Everything depended on harmonizing Paulus's views with our own, as it was clear that in the absence of telephone lines or any reliable means of written communication the army group could exert only a limited influence on 6th Army's decisions. The need for complete understanding was increased by the existence of the OKH liaison officer whose presence at the army headquarters kept it under the constant sway of Hitler's thoughts and orders. Apart from revealing his deep but only too understandable depression over a situation for which not he but the supreme command was responsible, Paulus's letter seemed to me, in the desire it expressed for freedom of action in an extreme emergency, to indicate that he intended breaking out of the pocket if the position the became untenable. This might either be because the enemy had already penetrated or even broken through one or more of the army's fronts so that the tactical situation had become untenable or else because the strength of the troops was giving out. In either case, to my mind, an attempted breakout could end only in catastrophe. In the situation that now prevailed two things were of fundamental importance. First there must be a stubborn defense to keep the army in existence. Next must come a breakthrough not launched as a forlorn hope, but deliberately timed to take place when the army still had the strength to carry it out, and also to coincide with relief operations from outside the pocket. Such were the views which Schultz had to put over to Paulus. The overall impression he brought back with him and this was later confirmed by Colonel Buss was that 6th Army, provided it were properly supplied from the air, did not judge its chances of holding out at all unfavorably. That such an attitude could also be dangerous would be seen later on. With that I come to the question of whether an airlift to 6th Army could really be contemplated. In our report to OKH from Star Obilsk on 24th November I had been at pains to point out how crucial this was. Only if a guarantee of air supplies were given, I had said, could we afford to delay a breakout until the intervention of relief forces improved the army's chances of escape. By refusing to sanction Paulus's request for a breakout the day before my telephone conversation, Hitler had to all intents and purposes already given that guarantee. His refusal had been based on an assurance from Goring whose staff was indeed the sole authority competent to assess the Luftwaffe's ability to keep 6th Army supplied at Stalingrad. On assuming command of Don Army Group, I was told by Colonel General V. Richthofen, whose 4th Air Fleet was in support of us and responsible for supplying 6th Army from the air, that he did not think an adequate airlift could be flown under the prevailing weather conditions. Even if the weather improved, he said, he still did not believe it would be possible to maintain the lift for any length of time, and had already told Goring as much. Of course, he added, he was in no position to judge the extent of Goring's other resources. The army group immediately reported v. Richthofen's opinion to OKH, but its only reaction was to refer us to forthcoming increases in the strength of the transport squadrons. The same answer was given to our daily reports that the loads flown into the pocket were coming nowhere near the quotas envisaged. These new squadrons arrived right enough, 
and their crews did their duty with great self-sacrifice, but although the Luftwaffe lost 488 aircrafts and about 1,000 men at Stalingrad, it never succeeded in providing 6th Army with anything like its minimum requirements. It is thus established that the promise Goring gave to Hitler on 23rd November, or possibly even earlier, was entirely unwarranted. Whether it was due to a false appreciation of Luftwaffe potentialities or frivolously given in a desire to show off or humor Hitler, I cannot tell. In any event, the responsibility is Goring's. Nevertheless, Hitler should still have checked up on the reliability of his statements. Besides knowing what sort of person Göring was, he was also well aware of the strength of the Luftwaffe. Unlike Hitler, neither the Army Group staff nor the Chief of Fourth Air Fleet were in a position to verify the facts. Nor had they any immediate reason for seeing anything wildly impracticable in a short-term airlift. After all, in the winter of 1941, to the Luftwaffe had provided 100,000 men in the Demyansk pocket with everything they needed. Although in fact twice that number were surrounded this time, it could only be a matter to our mind of keeping supplies going for a few weeks or so. As soon as the relief groups drew near to the pocket, 6th Army must in any event break out. To leave it at Stalingrad for a longer period was quite out of the question. All the commander in chief of the Luftwaffe had to do in effect was to make a straightforward calculation. Sixth Army's minimum requirement of all types of supplies totaled 550 tons per day or at least 400 tons until all ration dumps in the pocket were exhausted. In order to lift 550 tons, if each aircraft made one run daily, we should need 225. 552s, or correspondingly more He 111s, which could carry only 1.5 tons at the outside. The distances to be flown from the air bases of Morosovsky and Tatsunskaya were 110 and 135 miles respectively, though in either case only the last 30 miles would be over enemy territory. Neither of these airfields was lost to the enemy until Christmas 1942 when the fate of 6th Army was already decided, in favorable weather conditions the aircraft could be expected to make two trips each in 24 hours. On the days when this happened the number of machines needed would be reduced by half. These figures formed the preliminary basis on which the commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe had to assess the possibility of supplying 6th Army by air. In addition, however, he had the following factors to consider first. There was the probability in winter that the squadrons working the airlift would be grounded by weather. The resultant deficit would have to be made up by lifting an extra tonnage on flying days, that is the number of aircraft must be proportionately increased. While it was difficult to predict to what extent the weather would prejudice flying, the Luftwaffe meteorologists should be able to turn up certain records from the previous winter. The second factor to be taken into account was that not all machines are ever airworthy at any one given time. This could be seen from statistics. To a large extent, the number of aircraft out of commission depended on what ground crews and maintenance facilities were available at the air bases. This is a subject to which I shall return later. Finally, it had to be remembered that a certain percentage of the transport machines would be shot down or crash. The rate of losses by enemy action was again largely dependent on how much fighter cover the Luftwaffe could provide. The commander in chief of the Luftwaffe thus had to weigh two questions with the utmost care before giving any firm promises about an airlift. Had he any prospect whatever of immediately assembling 550 tons of carrier space, bearing in mind the extra demands imposed by bad weather and the non availability of aircraft for technical reasons? Could he maintain this figure by a continuous flow of replacements, and above all by providing an appropriate number of fighter and pursuit aircraft to combat the air defenses anticipated on the enemy's side, until such time as Sixth Army was likely to be relieved? Goring was the only man in a position to give completely satisfactory answers to these questions. Only he was able to tell whether the requisite number of aircraft could be found and whether their use here was defensible in the light of the Luftwaffe's other commitments. If neither were the case, 
It was his duty to tell Hitler so point blank when the decision regarding 6th Army was taken that is around 22 ND 23 RD November. It was Goring's further duty, once Hitler had ordered the army to remain at Stalingrad, immediately to throw in the Luftwaffe's very last reserves of carrier aircraft, fighters and repair shops. It is doubtful whether Goring did everything he could have done in this field, and at the beginning of January, as a result of the army group's constant references to the inadequacy of the airlift, Hitler ordered Field Marshal Milch to take it over. As the latter had all the forces and resources of the Luftwaffe in Germany at his disposal, he was certainly in a position to improve the airlift's basic efficiency. By now, unfortunately, it was too late from the operational point of view for him to do any good. The same went for the airlift as such for in the meantime the two above named bases had been lost and the supplies had to be flown over much longer stretches. As if his original promise of 22 ND 23 RD November had not been frivolous enough, Goring proceeded to make things even worse by not exhausting all the possibilities open to him in the first vital weeks of the siege. For that was the time when the bid to save 6th Army might still have had some chance of success. The more debatable and confused the airlift issue became, the more important it was to relieve 6th Army at the earliest possible date. According to details passed to the Army Group by OKH, the latter was to make the following forces available for this purpose in the framework of 4th Panzer Army, 57 Panzer Corps under General Kirchner to be moved over from Army Group A, with 6 and 23 Panzer Divisions and 15 Luftwaffe Field Division under command. These forces were scheduled to arrive in the Kotlnikovo area by 3rd December. Deploying in the sector of 3rd Romanian Army, a new formation to be known as Army Detachment Hollet, consisting of 62, 294 and 336 Infantry Divisions, 48 Panzer Corps. General V. Nobelsdorf, with 11 and 22 Panzer Divisions, 3 Mountain Division, and 7 and 8 Luftwaffe Field Divisions. This group was to be ready to become operational on the aperture around 5th December. All told, the Army Group expected to have relief forces amounting to 4 armored divisions, 4 infantry or mountain divisions, and 3 Luftwaffe Field Divisions. It was assumed from the start. Of course, that the Luftwaffe divisions could at best be employed in some defensive role, such as shielding the flanks of the assault elements. The forces indicated assuming that they did become available in this strength and at the times stated might conceivably suffice to make temporary contact with 6th Army and to restore its freedom of movement. In no event, however, could they administer a defeat big enough to enable us as Hitler had put it in the jargon of static warfare to reoccupy the positions held prior to the attack. On 27 November the Army Group received a teleprinter message from OKH replying to the appreciation of the situation we had submitted three days previously. It appeared from this that Hitler was still prejudiced by the ideas already referred to. The reason he gave for deciding to hold fast to Stalingrad was that if we abandoned it now we should have to try all over again next year, at an even greater cost, to regain what we had sacrificed so much to win in 1942. Quite apart from whether a repetition of the 1942 offensive would be at all expedient or feasible when the time came, the question simply did not rise at the present moment. The real problem was whether the least possibility existed of somehow or other restoring the situation on the southern wing of the Eastern Front. Unless Sixth Army were saved, there seemed to be almost no hope of doing so. On 28 November, therefore, I sent Hitler a detailed appraisal of the position, appending a table which showed the strengths of enemy forces, in all, 143 major formations, operating against us. I also gave a clear picture of the situation and condition of 6th Army, noting in particular that it would shortly be deprived of the use of its artillery through lack of ammunition and loss of mobility. In the circumstances, I said, it was doubtful whether one could afford to wait for all the relief forces to arrive, particularly Army Detachment Hollett. Presumably the relief group of 4th Panzer Army would now have to move off ahead of it. 
naturally nothing decisive could be achieved by this, for everything depended as we had already pointed out on 24 November on the provision of additional forces. The best one could hope to do was to cut a corridor to 6th Army through which to replenish its fuel and ammunition stocks and thereby restore its mobility. After that, however, the army must be fetched straight out of the pocket, as it could not possibly survive the winter out in the open steppes. Above all, I told Hitler, it was strategically impossible to go on tying down our forces in an excessively small area while the enemy enjoyed a free hand along hundreds of miles of front. What we must regain at all costs was our maneuverability, as the solution applied in the case of the Demyansk pocket the previous year was now out of the question. The above appraisal was fully confirmed by later events. It was 3rd December before we received a reply on this fundamental question of operational policy. Just one more example of the way Hitler loved to defer answers which were not to his taste. The reply did state, however, that Hitler agreed with our views. There were only two points on which he had any qualifications to make. In the first place, he did not wish the northern front of Stalingrad to be pulled back or shortened for the purpose of finding extra forces. Secondly, while not disputing the number of enemy formations listed in my appreciation, he nonetheless contended that the strength of the Soviet divisions had been reduced and that the enemy command would have trouble in maintaining supplies and proper control as a result of its unexpected successes. He was possibly right regarding the reduction of divisional strengths. This was more than offset, however, by the extent to which our own forces had been weakened in several months heavy fighting a subject on which the army group had reported in no uncertain terms. That the Soviets were already having supply difficulties was unlikely, and the supposition that they had any control problem was mere hypothesis. At any rate, and this was of paramount importance, it could be assumed from Hitler's general endorsement of our views that he accepted the three essential points i, even in the event of our being able to fight a way through to Sixth Army, the latter could not be left at Stalingrad for any length of time. Two, the army must receive a daily average of supplies by air. 3. As the army group had been constantly emphasizing since 21st November, a continuous flow of reinforcements was needed. It will be seen in due course that Hitler really had not the slightest intention of releasing 6th Army from Stalingrad. Neither were the other two prerequisites for the success of the operation to be fulfilled. The first thing we discovered was that the strength of the forces being provided by OKH for the relief of 6th Army, as well as the timing of their availability, were by no means in keeping with what we had gathered from the promises made to us in Starobilsk. To begin with, there were considerable delays in transporting the troops to their new areas. In the case of Army Detachment Hollett this was due to the low efficiency of the railways, and in that of 4th Panzer Army's relief group to the fact that while the steppes around Stalingrad were in the grip of an icy frost, a thaw had set in down in the Caucasus. Consequently the wheeled elements of 23 Panzer Divisions were unable to move by road as scheduled and had to go by rail instead. At the slow rate of progress this involved. 57 Panzer Corps operational deadline was put off by several days in a situation where every single day counted. The strength of the relief groups proved more unsatisfactory still. 15 Luftwaffe Field Division, which was due to join 57 Panzer Corps, had not even been established yet a process which took several weeks to complete. When finally ready, the division had to be committed to battle at the height of an emergency at a time, incidentally, when the relief problem had long been decided in the negative sense, and disintegrated during its first few days in action. The army artillery to be handed over by Army Group A, except for one regiment of smoke troops, never arrived at all. Of the total of seven divisions earmarked for the Hollett Relief Group, we found that it had already been necessary to commit two infantry divisions. 62 and 294, on the front of 3rd Romanian Army to provide it with at least a modicum of stability. Their withdrawal would have led to the immediate collapse of 1 and 2 Romanian Corps battle fronts. Both divisions were thus excluded from the relief operation from the start. 
Another of the promised formations which failed to put in an appearance was Three Mountain Division. The first half of it, which had already entrained, was diverted by OKH to Army Grouper to deal with the local crisis, the second was retained by Central Army Group for a similar purpose. 22 Panzer Division, which had been thrown in with 3rd Romanian Army at the beginning of the Soviet offensive, proved to be a complete wreck incapable of any offensive action after the losses it had suffered in the November battles. Since it was impossible to employ the Luftwaffe divisions in an offensive role, practically the only striking forces left for the relief operations of 4th Panzer Army and Army Detachment Hollet respectively were 57 Panzer Corps, with a strength of two armored divisions, and 48 Panzer Corps, 11 Panzer Division and 336 Infantry Division, the first of which was still moving up. 17 Panzer Division and 306 Infantry Division, which OKH subsequently brought in to replace the divisions which had failed to arrive, could neither fully compensate for the deficiency of strength nor be ready to go into action as early as the relief operation demanded. In the circumstances, the original idea of relieving 6th Army from two different directions 4th Panzer Army from the Kotelnikovo area east of the Don and Army Detachment Hollet from the middle chair towards Kalash would be invalidated by a shortage of forces. The most we could hope to do now was to assemble sufficient strength at one spot. As things stood, this left only 4th Panzer Army eligible for the attack. It had a shorter mileage to cover to Stalingrad and did not have an obstacle like the Don to negotiate. It was also reasonable to hope that the last quarter from which the enemy would expect a relief offensive was anywhere east of the Don, as the whole situation made it extremely risky for the Germans to assemble large forces in that area. For the very same reason he had initially put out relatively weak forces in the direction of Kotelnikovo for protection of his siege front. Here, for the time being, 4th Panzer Army was faced with only 5 enemy divisions, whereas the enemy on the Chur had already 15 divisions in the line. The order issued by the Army Group on 1st December for Operation Winter Tempest thus envisaged the following on a date still to be fixed, but in any case not earlier than 8th December, 4th Panzer Army was to attack east of the Don with the bulk of its forces, moving off from the area of Kotelnikovo. Once it had thrust through the enemy's covering forces, its task would be to attack and roll up the southern and or western siege front encircling Stalingrad. A smaller force provided by Army Detachment Hollet's 48 Panzer Corps was to thrust from the Doncha bridgehead of Nizanchurskaya into the rear of the enemy covering forces. Should the enemy opposite 4th Panzer Army north of Kotelnikova be conspicuously reinforced prior to the attack? Or should the situation of 4th Romanian Army, whose job was to cover 4th Panzer Army's long eastern flank, take another critical turn, the following alternative plan would come into operation. The armored divisions of 4th Panzer Army would make a surprise move northwards along the west bank of the Don and launch the main thrust from the Nizanchurskaya bridgehead. It was also envisaged that a less powerful shock group should thrust up at Kalash from out of the Donche Bridge head west of the Don in order to cut the enemy's communications there and open up the Don Bridge for 6th Army. As regards 6th Army, the orders laid down that on a date after 4th Panzer Army's attack still to be fixed by the Army Group it would initially break through to the southwest in the direction of the Donskaya Zaritsa, its aim being to link up with 4th Panzer Army and to take a hand in rolling up the southern and western siege fronts and capturing the Don crossing. On express instructions from Hitler the army was to continue to hold its existing positions in the pocket. That this would not be possible in practice when it broke out to the southwest to meet 4th Panzer Army was perfectly obvious, for when the Soviets attacked on the northern or eastern fronts it would have to give way step by step. In the event, Undoubtedly, Hitler would have had no choice but to accept this fact, as he did on later occasions. Not that we could say so in the operation order, of course, as Hitler would have learned of it through his liaison officer at 6th Army headquarters and immediately issued a countermand. During the first few days after my takeover everything remained fairly quiet on the army group front. Evidently the enemy was preparing a concentric assault on 6th Army. On the other hand, 
he apparently did not care to venture an immediate thrust on Rostov with strong armored forces, nor did he even try to go for the army group's vital Dunitz crossings or the railway junction of Lukaka. Probably he thought he could save himself the risk attaching to a tank drive of this kind, since his preponderance of forces in the large bend of the Don promised to assure him of success in any event. Yet he undoubtedly sacrificed a big opportunity in this way, for at the end of November and in early December the forces we should have needed for intercepting such a thrust simply did not exist. Enemy attacks on 6th Army and 2nd December the enemy made his first attack on 6th Army. Like those which followed on the 4th and 8th of the month, it was bloodily repulsed by the courageous troops in the pocket. Fortunately the supplely position now appeared more favorable than we had originally dared to expect, for on 2nd December the army reported that by existing on a reduced scale of rations and slaughtering a large proportion of the horses, it could reckoning from 30th November manage with its present stocks for 12 to 16 days. At the same time the state of the weather encouraged us to hope for an improvement in the rate of air supplies a record load of 300 tons being flown into the pocket on 5th December. Unfortunately this was to remain an all-time high, nonetheless it was clear that no time must be lost in making contact with 6th Army on the ground and fetching it out of the pocket. As far as this went, the only thing in our favor to date was that the enemy had not ventured to exploit his chance of severing the army group's rear communications at the Dunitz crossings or at Rostov where he could have simultaneously cut off Army Group A. Otherwise the position deteriorated badly in the sectors from which the relief thrusts were to be made. In the case of 4th Panzer Army the arrival of 57 Panzer Corps from the Caucasus was delayed for the reasons already stated. The assembly date, originally 3rd December, was put off till 8th and then till 12th December. Naturally the enemy was not going to remain inactive over so long a period. On 3rd December he pushed forward in strength towards Kotelnikovo, 57 Panzer Corps main railhead, obviously with a view to clearing up the position there. The following day he was driven back by 6 Panzer Division, which had meanwhile become operational. From 8th December onwards there were signs of a major enemy force gathering on 4th Panzer Army's northern front, northeast of Kotelnikovo, where a new Soviet army, 51st, was identified. On the other hand, things remained quiet on the Panzer Army's eastern front, which was manned mainly by the troops of the subordinate 4th Romanian Army. The same applied to 16 motorized division around Yelista. With a view to setting the Romanians' minds at rest, we made this division dispatch a light motorized force up north to reconnoiter in the rear of the Soviet front facing them. It established beyond all possible doubt that for the time being the enemy had no forces assembled in any great strength west of the Volga. Crisis on the Chafrontvents took a much more serious turn in the area of Army Detachment Hollet, 3rd Romanian Army's sector. Here, on the Lower Chur, from its junction with the Don to a point some 45 miles upstream, the only troops on the ground, apart from a few anti aircraft groups, were alarm units which had been set up from B echelon elements and 6th Army men returning from leave. These were later augmented by the two Luftwaffe divisions which, after originally being earmarked for Army Detachment Hollet, had been found to be only conditionally employable owing to their complete lack of battle experience and shortage of trained officers and N.C.O.S. The rent torn between the bend in the Chirubolsh Oiternovsky and the still intact Don front when the Russians broke through 3rd Romanian Army in November had been patched up by bending back the right wing of the 3rd Romanian Army elements on the Don, 1 and 2 Romanian Corps and by bringing in the badly battered 22 Panzer Division and remnants of the overrun Romanian divisions. In fact, however, the infantry divisions destined for Army Detachment Hollet should also have been committed here in order to afford this 75-mile stretch of front a minimum degree of stability. By the beginning of December there were ominous signs of an impending major offensive on the Jure front and two days later strong enemy artillery was identified along the lower reaches of the river. It was here, on 4th December, that the Russian attacks began, striking without respite at one point after another. 
the more the enemy persisted in his attempts to break through, the more critical the situation became. It was absolutely vital that we should continue to hold this stretch of river, as our bridgehead in the angle between the Chur and Don, including the Don Bridge at Nizanchurskaya, was of fundamental importance for the relief of Sixth Army. Apart from that, an enemy breakthrough over the Chur would have cleared the way to the Morosovsky and Tatsinskaya airfields, which were only 25 and 50 miles away, as well as to the Dunitz crossings and Rostov. In the circumstances the army group had no choice but to agree that 48 Panzer Corps, whose 11 Panzer and 336 infantry division had arrived by this time, should temporarily be used to bolster up the front on the lower chair. The Cal found itself playing the role of a veritable firefighter, dashing from one spot to the next to intervene every time the thin screen of alarm units threatened to collapse. Naturally this temporarily deprived army detachment Hollett of the only divisions it could have employed in an offensive relief role from this direction. As soon as the situation permitted, however, it was still intended to bring the corps across the Nizanchurskaya bridge to cooperate with the relief group of 4th Panzer Army. On 9th December the attacks against 6th Army, in the course of which the enemy had come in for some very rough treatment, started to slacken off. This probably meant that forces were already being released to head off any German attempt to lift the siege. On the Chur front, the enemy kept up his pressure unremittingly, but on 4th Panzer Army's northern front, after the failure of his Kotelnikovo operation, he displayed a certain degree of restraint. The vain fight for decisions, he need hardly say that in this critical situation, I was in constant telephonic communication with the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Zietzler. He entirely agreed with my forecast of developments and the inferences I drew. But whether he would be able to get Hitler to take appropriate and timely action was quite a different matter. Apart from our constant demand for reinforcement of the Luftwaffe transport squadrons working the airlift to 6th Army, there were two outstanding issues. The first was that even if 6th Army could be relieved, it must on no account be left in the Stalingrad area any longer. Hitler himself still wanted to hang on to the city just as he had insisted on doing with the Demyansk pocket the previous winter and to keep the army supplied the by means of a land corridor. Don Army Group, on the other hand, was as convinced as ever that this was entirely the wrong solution and that it was essential to become operationally mobile again if disaster were to be avoided. This tug of war continued until the very last chance of saving 6th Army had been thrown away. The second issue was the reinforcement of the relief forces. Ever since the discovery that of the seven divisions originally promised us for Army Detachment Hollett's relief bid, we could at best expect to get 48 Panzer Corps with a strength of two divisions, it had been vital to strengthen 4th Panzer Army. Anyone could see that the latter was not going to reach Stalingrad with only 6 and 23 panzer divisions. There were two possible ways of effecting this reinforcement. Don Army Group repeatedly asked to be given Army Group A's three panzer corps of two armored divisions, which should not have been used in mountainous country anyway. On each occasion the request was refused because Army Group had claimed it could not release the Corps unless it were allowed to evacuate a salient projecting far into the Caucasus a measure which Hitler, in turn, would not countenance. We were just as unsuccessful in our attempts to get an Army Group a regiment to relieve 16 motorized division at Yelister, where it was covering the deep flank of 1st Panzer Army. By the time anything was done about this it was too late to make any difference at Stalingrad. The second possible way of reinforcing 4th Panzer Army in time for its thrust to Stalingrad lay in the provision of new forces by OKH at the time in question 17 Panzer Division and the newly established 306 Infantry Division were in that order on their way to Don Army Group. In consequence of the delay involved in assembling 57 Panzer Corps at Kotelnikovo, the former of the two could have arrived just in time to move off with it to Stalingrad. Unfortunately OKH had the division detrained as its own reserve behind the left wing of the army group because not without reason it feared a large-scale attack was impending there. Yet OKH could not have it both ways, 
success for fourth panzer army and security against a crisis which, if it did arise, 17 panzer division could not master anyway. While we preferred success for fourth panzer army, Hitler opted for the security he hoped to achieve by his retention of 17 panzer division. The upshot was that when Hitler did release the division after 306 infantry division had caught up, it arrived too late for the first phase of the relief operation. Possibly this was where the decisive opportunity was thrown away. To enhance the effect of my telephone calls on Zietzler, and also to strengthen his hand in the daily battles he had to fight, I felt obliged to have frequent appreciations of the situation teleprinted through to him, or even direct to Hitler. One of these appreciations that of 9th of December 1942 is given in Appendix 2 to show what pains we took to keep Hitler and OKH in the picture at all times. It also affords impressive evidence of the numerical preponderance confronting the army group and shows the type of forces with which, except for the few newly arrived divisions it had to conduct the battles outside the Stalingrad pocket. Last but not least, it demonstrates how the army group strove to bring home the gist of all operational problems to the supreme command. For the benefit of critical readers, two comments on this appreciation might be interpolated here. Some people may object to our having included any reference whatever to ways and means of continuing the battle in the event of Sixth Army's being kept at Stalingrad after a corridor had been cut through to it. The answer to this is that it would have been quite pointless to try to convince a man like Hitler of the futility of leaving an army in the city even assuming that supply by such a corridor were possible. Only by indicating the reinforcement problems which would beset him if he attempted to retain his hold on the city could one hope to make him see the need to disengage Sixth Army. Unfortunately even this appeal to reason failed to shake his obstinacy where prestige was concerned. At the time. However, we still cherished the hope that Hitler would bow to the inevitable when it came to the point. Secondly, it may seem surprising, in view of the number of enemy formations confronting the army group, that we still continued to believe in the possibility of relieving Sixth Army at all. We might well be reproached with having underrated our opponent. The crux of the matter, as far as we were concerned, however, was that the maximum risk had to be accepted if we were to bring our comrades of Sixth Army a chance of salvation. Events have shown that we came near enough to opening their way to freedom. The fact that we were fated to fail in the end was due to causes which I shall discuss in due course. A race for life or death when the enemy now set off on a race for life or death. Our own goal was to save the life of Sixth Army. But to do so we staked the very existence not only of Don Army Group but also of Army Group A. It was a race to decide whether the relief group of 4th Panzer Army would manage to join hands with 6th Army east of the Don before the enemy forced us to break off the operation. This he might achieve by overrunning our weak front on the Chur or the left wing of the Army Group, and possibly the right wing of Army Group B as well and putting himself in a position to cut all the rear communications of Don Army Group and Army Group A. To mount and maintain an assault operation east of the Don while the danger outlined above grew increasingly acute from one day to the next meant incurring a risk that can seldom have been run before. I cannot believe that Hitler realized its full import at the time, otherwise he would almost certainly have taken more radical measures at least to the extent of reinforcing 4th Panzer Army for a speedy relief of Stalingrad. Instead, as General Zietzler himself expressed it, he did nothing but put spokes in our wheel. Two examples of this were his retention of 17 Panzer Division in the wrong spot throughout the crucial phase of the operation and his failure to release 16 Motorized Division until it was too late. Many was the time Hitler declared that generals and general staff officers could only compute and would not take chances. There can hardly be any more striking rebuttal of his claim than the risk run by Don Army Group when it ordered 4th Panzer Army's drive on Stalingrad and kept this going till the last possible moment in a situation which threatened to destroy the whole southern wing of the German armies. This race with death, which began on 12th December, when 4th Panzer Army struck out for Stalingrad, can only be sketched in broad outline here, 
as it is not possible to depict the lightning changes of situation which occurred in 57 Panzer Corps battles against an enemy who never ceased to throw in fresh forces, tanks first and foremost. The versatility of our armor and the superiority of our tank crews were brilliantly demonstrated in this period, as were the bravery of the Panzer Grenadiers and the skill of our anti tank units. At the same time it was seen what an experienced old armored division like 6 Panzer could achieve under its admirable commander General Rouse and the tank specialist Colonel V. Hunus Storff, who, I am sorry to say, was later to be killed at the head of this same division, when it went into action with its full complement of armored vehicles and assault guns. How hard, in contrast, was the lot of 23 Panzer Division, commanded by General V. Vorman, a former colleague of mine in the OKH operations branch who had been five times wounded in World War I, which had a bare twenty tanks to work with. Let us now try to follow at least those features of the battle that were material to its outcome. While 57 Corps finished assembling east of the Don around Kotlnikovo, strong enemy forces had again been attacking our front on the Lower Chi since 10th December. It was now clear that there could be no further question of releasing 48 Panzer Corps on this front for it to break out of the Chidon Bridgehead and cooperate with 57 Panzer Corps. This made it more urgent than ever that 57 Panzer Corps should get on the move. After smashing an enemy attempt to overrun it while it was still in the process of detraining and final assembly. The Corps was able to cross the start line on 12 December. Its flanks were covered against the Volga in the east by seven Romanian Corps and up to the Don in the west by six Romanian Corps. The attack evidently surprised the enemy, who did not appear to have expected it quite so soon, and initially the Corps made good progress. Far from sticking to defensive tactics. However, the enemy hastened to bring up fresh forces from the Stalingrad area and counter-attacked again and again in attempts to recapture ground already won by our tanks or to surround small numbers of the latter with his own numerically superior armor. In spite of having wiped out one strong group after another, 57 Panzer Corps had still achieved nothing decisive by 17 December, the date on which 17 Panzer Division was at last able to intervene east of the Don. OKH had finally released it from its detraining area behind the left wing of the army group in response to demands from my headquarters. Before it could take a hand east of the river, however, the division still had to accomplish the long haul up to and across the Don Bridge at Potemkinskaya. While 57 Panzer Corps was striving for decisive results on the east bank of the river, the enemy redoubled his efforts to the west of it in order to bring about the collapse of the German front on the Cher. Above all, he had obviously grasped the significance of the bridgehead we were holding in the angle of the Chur and Don, together with the Don bridge contained therein, for ever since 12th December these had been the constant target of massed Soviet attacks. On 14th December we were forced off the bridge, and had to blow it up. By 15th December it was apparent that the battle on the Lower Chur front had only a few more days to run. At the very same time, however, a new danger loomed up in the large bend of the Don. On 15 December there were obvious signs of an enemy attack being prepared in front of the left wing of Don Army Group and the right wing of Army Group B, and the following day local attacks were launched. Initially it was not entirely clear whether the enemy was following his frequent practice of feeling out the front prior to a decisive breakthrough or whether he was seeking to prevent us from transferring any forces from this sector to the battlefield east of the Don. Then, however, our radio monitors identified new army, third guards, which implied that a breakthrough with some such far-reaching objective as Rostov was impending. The army group could not afford a decisive battle on its left wing as long as it had to fight for the liberation of 6th Army east of the Don. It had to hold off here if it could so that the responsible headquarters, Army Detachment Hollett, might find the necessary reserves for a delaying action, Army Group made it pull back onto a shorter front further to the rear, bearing in mind the need to preserve continuity with the right wing of Army Group B. December 18th proved a day of crisis of the first order. East of the Don, 
despite the arrival of 17 Panzer Division, 57 Panzer Corps had still not fought things to a point which offered any prospect of its being able to thrust swiftly into the vicinity of Stalingrad and create the conditions needed for 6th Army's breakout. On the contrary, it looked as though the Corps would be forced onto the defensive, since the enemy was continuing to throw forces in its path from the siege front round the city. On the lower chair, heavy fighting was still in progress although the enemy had not so far succeeded in penetrating our front. On the left wing of the army group, on the other hand, a most serious crisis was taking shape, the enemy having begun a major attack against army detachment Hollett and the Italian army forming the right wing of army group B. In the case of army detachment Hollett the two Romanian corps proved unequal to the onslaught and there was some doubt whether even the German divisions would attain their alternative position in any semblance of order after being abandoned wholesale by their allies. What made things worse still was that the enemy had been able to overrun the Italian army in the first assault, thereby tearing open the flank of Don Army Group. The same day the Army Group called on OKH to take immediate steps to initiate the breakout of 6th Army towards 4th Panzer Army. There was still a chance that once 17 Panzer Division had made its presence fully felt, 57 Panzer Corps could win further ground in the direction of the pocket. In other words, one could still hope for a favorable outcome of the struggle east of the Don. Yet how much earlier this could have been achieved if only 17 Panzer and 16 motorized divisions, of which the latter was still tied up at Yalista could have been available for 4th Panzer Army's relief operation from the very outset. Notwithstanding our insistence on the urgent need for a decision that would allow 6th Army to break out of Stalingrad, Hitler declined to sanction this although his chief of staff had simultaneously to inform us that all forces still in the process of moving up were being directed to Army Group B on account of the plight of the Italian Army. The fact that we were asked in this same connection whether Stalingrad could still be held showed what little idea the Supreme Command had or was prepared to have of the seriousness of the situation. Hitler's refusal to disengage the army from Stalingrad at this stage did not deter the army group from at least preparing for the inevitable. On 18 December I sent my chief intelligence officer, Major Risman, into the pocket to give 6th Army our views on the breakout operation which would undoubtedly become necessary in the very near future. The following were the salient points of what he had to say the critical situation on the Chur front, and even more so on the army group's left wing, meant that 4th Panzer Army's battle to free 6th Army east of the Don could only continue for a limited period. Furthermore, it was doubtful whether the Panzer Army could maintain its drive right up to the actual siege front because the enemy was constantly throwing in fresh forces from here to meet it. For this same reason, however, 6th Army's chances of breaking through the siege ring were at present better than they had ever been. A link up between 4th Panzer and 6th Army's depended on the latter's taking an active part in the battle from now on. As soon as it set about breaking out of the pocket towards the southwest, the enemy would be unable to weaken his siege front any further, and this in turn would enable 4th Panzer Army to resume its advance towards the pocket. The task allotted to 6th Army in the orders for Winter Tempest which it had received on 1st December that is to hold itself in readiness to thrust southwest as far as the Donskaya in order to make contact with 4th Panzer Army, would probably have to be extended. The army might now have to continue beyond the limited objective laid down for it in the Winter Tempest operation and keep pushing southwest until it actually joined the Panzer Army. While Winter Tempest laid down that 6th Army should still hold the Stalingrad area in accordance with Hitler's orders, the new alternative plan would mean evacuating its sector by sector in keeping with the progress of the breakthrough to the southwest. Major Isman was also to point out that while the army group had made every possible effort in this direction, it did not believe the airlift could be improved far enough to allow 6th Army to hold out at Stalingrad for any length of time. The outcome of Major Isman's mission, which had been intended to harmonize the views of the two headquarters, was not encouraging. Paulus himself had not been unimpressed by what Isman told him, though he did not fail to emphasize the magnitude of the difficulties and risks which the task outlined to him would imply. 
the Army's Chief of Operations and Quartermaster General likewise stressed these difficulties to Major Risman, but both men also declared that in the circumstances it was not only essential to attempt to break out at the earliest possible moment but also entirely feasible. What ultimately decided the attitude of 6th Army Headquarters was the opinion of the Chief of Staff, Major General Arthur Schmidt. He contended that it was quite impossible for the army to break out just then and that such a solution would be an acknowledgement of disaster. Sixth Army, he told Isman, will still be in position at Easter. All you people have to do is to supply it better. Schmidt obviously assumed that it was the business of the Supreme Command or Army Group to get the army out of a situation in which it had landed through no fault of our own and to keep it adequately supplied from the air in the meantime. It was an understandable point of view, and one which in theory he had every right to hold. Unfortunately circumstances had proved stronger. Isman pointed out that although the army group was doing everything in its power to maintain supplies, it was not to blame when the weather brought the airlift to a virtual standstill, nor was it in a position to produce transport machines out of a hat. But all his remonstrances were like water off a duck's back as far as Schmidt was concerned. Even when Isman sought to show that a breakout by 6th Army was necessary in the interest of operations as a whole, the chief of staff still would not budge. While the army commander was probably a better trained tactician and a clearer thinker, it looked as if his chief of staff was the stronger personality of the two. 22 And so the upshot of the talks was that General Paulus himself ended by pronouncing the breakout a sheer impossibility and pointing out that the surrender of Stalingrad was forbidden by order of the F.U. Diarasis her exclamation mark while Major Risman's mission had certainly made 6th Army headquarters fully aware of the situation and the Army Group's intentions, it had still not achieved any identity of views on the task intended for 6th Army. Could we expect an army headquarters staff to execute an extremely difficult operation successfully when the army commander and his chief of staff harbored doubts as to its feasibility? At any other time such a divergence of opinions would have been regarded as grounds for requesting a change in the army command. In the present critical situation, however, there could be no justification for such action. Any successor to the commander or the chief of staff would have needed time to play himself in, and when every day was vital this just could not be spared. In any case, it would have been hopeless to try to obtain Hitler's approval for such a change, since it would have affected the very men who recommended holding out at Stalingrad. In spite of everything, Don Army Group was not willing to let slip the one remaining chance of saving Sixth Army no matter how many difficulties and dangers the undertaking were to involve. It would entail issuing a formal order freeing the army commander of all responsibility for both the hazard of a breakout and the abandonment of Stalingrad. This was a step we were fully prepared to take. The reasons why this order was not ultimately implemented by 6th Army will be discussed later in their proper context. They were the subject of numerous conversations which Paulus and I and our respective chiefs of staff conducted on a newly established ultra-high frequency wavelength, as well as of discussions between my own headquarters and the Supreme Command. The next day, 19th December, encouraged us to hope that the situation east of the Don would shortly reach a stage where the projected cooperation of the two armies might lead to the successful extrication of the one now at Stalingrad. On this particular day 57 Panzer Corps scored a gratifying success. It managed to cross the Ixai River and thrust northwards as far as the Miskova, its spearhead actually coming within 30 miles of the southern siege front. The moment for which we had longed since the takeover, when the approach of relief forces would offer 6th Army its chance to break free, had arrived. If 6th Army now began its breakout while 4th Panzer Army either continued to attack northwards or at least drew off further forces from the siege front, the enemy in between would find himself between two fires and there would at least be a prospect of establishing enough contact to provide 6th Army with the fuel ammunition and food it needed for continuing its breakthrough. For this purpose the army group had assembled transport columns loaded with 3,000 tons of supplies behind 4th Panzer Army, 
in addition to tractors for mobilizing part of the 6th Army artillery. They were all to be rushed through to the beleaguered army as soon as the tanks had cleared a route, however temporary. The situation on the army group's front west of the Don on 19th December likewise indicated that the troops there should be able at least for as long as 6th Army needed to fight a way through to the southwest to stall off any decisive developments compelling us to break off the operation east of the river. Meanwhile, our front on the lower chair was still holding. Although the army group found it necessary to intervene with army detachment Hollett to safeguard the latter's withdrawal operation, there was every prospect that its alternative positions would be occupied as planned. On the other hand, the threat to the army detachment's open left flank was still present. The race with death on either side of the Don had entered its final and decisive phase. Would the army group succeed in preserving the situation in the large bend of the Don for a few days longer, until 6th Army had availed itself of what was undoubtedly its last opportunity? Certainly it could only do so if not a single hour were wasted. At noon on 19 December, therefore, the army group sent the Supreme Command an urgent appeal by teleprinter to let 6th Army finally disengage from Stalingrad and drive southwest to join 4th Panzer Army. 23 When this message, too, failed to evoke any immediate response, an order was issued to 4th Panzer and 6th Armies at 1800 hours, in which the latter was directed to commence breaking through to the southwest forthwith. 24 The first phase of the operation was to be the winter tempest attack detailed on 1st December. It would, if necessary, continue beyond the Donskaya Zaritsa for the purpose of making contact with 4th Panzer Army and enabling the Sapoli convoy to pass through. At the same time the order envisaged a second phase of the breakthrough which would, if need be, follow directly on the winter tempest attack. On receipt of the code word thunderclap, 6th Army was to proceed with its advance towards 4th Panzer Army and simultaneously begin to evacuate the Stalingrad area sector by sector. The reservation imposed on the issue of this code word arose from the need to synchronize the assault operations of both armies, as well as from the question as to whether it would be possible to coordinate the passage of the transport convoy with these operations. Above all, the army group had to try to persuade Hitler to rescind his order to 6th Army to hold Stalingrad at all costs, for although the responsibility for not complying with it would rest with the army group as soon as it gave the signal for thunderclap, the commander of 6th Army would still feel his hands were tied as long as it remained in force. Forfeiture of the chance to save 6th Army If there had ever been a chance to save 6th Army since the end of November, when Hitler refused Paula's permission for an immediate breakout before the enemy had consolidated his siege ring round Stalingrad, that chance came on 19 December. The army group had given the order to take it in spite of the difficulties Sixth Army's breakthrough might entail and the perilous situation that had meanwhile developed on the rest of the army group's front. The risk we were running in the latter respect will be discussed in due course. The immediate problem that is, from 19th till 25th December was whether 6th Army would actually be able and willing to carry out the order issued to it. Hitler did in fact agree to the armies attacking in a southwesterly direction for the purpose of joining up with 4th Panzer Army. Yet he continued to insist that it should hold its northern, eastern, and western fronts around the city. He was still hoping that it would be possible to cut open a corridor through which the army at Stalingrad could be supplied on a really long-term basis. There were two very obvious objections to this first, the situation of the army group as a whole, particularly with regard to developments in the neighboring area of army group B, no longer allowed two armies 6th and 4th Panzer to be tied down east of the Don. By this time not only the fate of 6th Army was at stake but also that of Don Army Group and Army Group A, both of which, if the enemy took resolute action, were liable to be cut off from their communications zones. Secondly, it was a sheer impossibility for 6th Army to mobilize all its remaining offensive power for a breakthrough to the southwest and still hold its present front around Stalingrad. It might conceivably be able to do so for one or two days longer until such time as the enemy had grasped its intentions, 
but there could never be any question of its making a long stand in the city and simultaneously maintaining a link with 4th Panzer Army. While Hitler's reasons for opposing the execution of the plan laid down in the Army Group Order of 19 December were unrealistic, the objections raised by 6th Army headquarters were not of a kind that could be dismissed out of hand. They showed how great were the risks which must necessarily be incurred if the army group order were carried out. When the army declared that it could not undertake the breakout as long as Hitler insisted on the retention of Stalingrad, it was perfectly right. That was why the army group had explicitly ordered the evacuation of the fortified area on receipt of thunderclap. However, the army commander still had to decide whom to obey Hitler or the commander of the army group. Furthermore, the army thought it would need six days to prepare for the breakout. In our own view the estimate was much too high and unacceptable in the present situation, even if due allowance were made for all the difficulties facing the army in consequence of its great loss of mobility. To wait six days more seemed impossible to us, if only because of the situation on the army group's left wing. Most of all, the enemy forming the siege front around the city was not going to sit doing nothing for all that time, while the breakout preparations went on under his very nose. It might perhaps be possible to conceal these preparations and the consequent thinning out of 6th Army's other fronts for a limited period. But if the assembly of forces for the breakthrough on the southwestern front were going to take six whole days, the enemy would already have started attacking on the other fronts before the breakthrough gained momentum. This must be avoided at all costs. The army also doubted its ability even to disengage the forces earmarked for the breakthrough from their present fronts, as the latter were already being subjected to local attack. Here, too, speed would be all important. Provided that the army started its breakout in good time, it would be spared the trouble of combating any enemy incursions on its other fronts and need merely fight delaying actions to cover a step-by-step -step withdrawal. The army rightly emphasized in the teleprinter conversations between General Paulus and myself and our respective chiefs of staff that the code word thunderclap must follow immediately upon winter tempest and that it would not be possible to pause, for example, on the Donskaya Zaritsa. This was a point on which we were completely unanimous, the army group order having in fact already foreshadowed that thunderclap would be linked directly to winter tempest. What undoubtedly weighed heavily with the commander of 6th Army was the fact that the general debility of the troops and the reduced mobility of units following the slaughtering of horses for food made it most unlikely that such a difficult and risky undertaking particularly when carried out under conditions of extreme cold could possibly succeed. It was the fuel position however, which finally decided 6th Army against attempting to break out and persuaded the army group that it could not insist on its order being implemented. General Paulus reported that he had only enough petrol to take his tanks of which about two must still have been serviceable, a maximum distance of 20 miles. This meant that he could not move off until either an adequate supply of fuel, and rations, were guaranteed or 4th Panzer Army had advanced to within 20 miles of the enemy siege front. Now no one could dispute the inability of 6th Army's tanks which represented its essential offensive power to bridge a gap of some 30 miles with fuel stocks that were only sufficient for 20. On the other hand, one could not possibly wait until the army's fuel stocks were brought up to the level it demanded, 4,000 tons, quite apart from the fact that we were aware from practical experience of the utter impossibility of lifting such quantities by air. Any such delay would have meant wasting the time that could still be spared for the army's breakthrough. One had to be prepared to live from hand to mouth and to go into action with what one had including, of course, the quantities of fuel which could be flown in during the next few days, while the army was still assembling. Beyond that one could only hope that stocks could be constantly replenished from the air in the course of the breakthrough. A point worth remembering here is that troops always have more fuel in hand than they care to admit in official returns. But even if this were not taken into account, one could still hope that things would develop on the following lines. The moment 6th Army launched its attack towards the southwest things would become easier for 4th Panzer Army. 
for henceforth the enemy would no longer be able to keep throwing out fresh forces from the Stalingrad siege front to meet it. Fourth Panzer Army, whose further progress over the Miskova was by no means a certainty on 19th December, would doubtless be able to accomplish the outstanding 12 miles once the pressure were relieved by the action of 6th Army. It was obviously risky to include this in our calculations, but without it we simply could not expect to save 6th Army. But the really crucial reason why this fuel question was ultimately decisive in bringing about the retention of 6th Army at Stalingrad lay in the fact that Hitler had a liaison officer in the pocket. By this means he learnt of Paulus's contention that the fuel situation made it impossible for him not only to launch a breakthrough operation but even to move up to the start line. I spent some considerable time on the telephone trying to make Hitler allow 6th Army to break out and abandon Stalingrad. I failed to see what you are driving at, was all he would say. Paulus has only enough petrol for 15 to 20 miles at the most. He says himself that he can't break out at present. Dot and so the army group had to contend on one hand with the Supreme Command, which made any attack by 6th Army to the southwest dependent on its simultaneous retention of the remaining Stalingrad fronts, and on the other with the command staff of 6th Army, which declared that the fuel situation rendered it incapable of complying with the army group order. In support of his decision Hitler was able to invoke the army commander who would be called upon to tackle this difficult task. Had he not had this pretext to hand, he might still have been forced by the pressure of events to give up his demand that the city continue to be held even when the breakthrough was in progress. But then, in all probability, General Paulus would likewise have seen the whole problem with different eyes since he would no longer have been acting against an express order from Hitler. The fact that I have dealt in such detail with the 6th Army commander's motives in not seizing the last opportunity to save his army is due to my belief that I owe this to him irrespective of anything connected with his personal character or subsequent conduct. As I have already stated, none of the reasons he advanced for his decision could be turned down as inadmissible. Yet the fact remained that this was our one and only chance of saving the army. Not to utilize it, however great the risks meant to resign all hope of salvation. To take it implied staking everything on one card in the view of the army group, this was now imperative. It is easy to criticize the attitude of the future Field Marshal Paulus in those vital days. Certainly there was more to it than mere blind obedience to Hitler for there can be no question that Paulus had grave conscientious doubts as to whether he should mount an operation which must inevitably lead in direct contravention of the wish clearly expressed by Hitler to the surrender of Stalingrad to the enemy. In the same connection, however, it should be noted that when it occurred as the result of overwhelming enemy pressure, even this surrender would have been justifiable in relation to Hitler's order, and that since the army group had ordered the evacuation. It was the latter's own responsibility. Apart from this conflict of conscience, however, the army commander was faced with a tremendous gamble if he obeyed the army group order. While a breakout certainly offered the army a chance of rescue, it could equally well lead to its destruction. Should the first attempt to break through the enemy's siege front prove unsuccessful, should 6th Army get stuck halfway while 4th Panzer Army were unable to make any further progress? or should the enemy manage to overrun the German troops shielding the breakout from the rear and flanks, then 6th Army's fate would be sealed in no time at all. The task confronting it was an incredibly formidable one and hazardous in the extreme. Like a square fighting in all four directions at once, it had to move out to meet 4th Panzer Army under the constant threat of being fought to a standstill in its attack to the southwest or alternatively of having its rearguard and flank protection overrun. Furthermore, this task would have had to be performed with troops already worn down by hunger and greatly restricted in their mobility. It is not unlikely, however, that the hope of regaining their freedom and eluding death or captivity would have helped them to accomplish an apparent impossibility. When General Paulus let the last opportunity slip, when he hesitated and finally decided against the venture, he certainly did so on account of the responsibility he felt on his own shoulders. 
although the army group strove by its order to absolve him of that responsibility, he still felt unable to acquit himself of it, either vis-à-vis -vis Hitler or before his own conscience. In the week that followed the army group's order for an immediate breakout, the fate of Sixth Army was decided. For six whole days, the army group ran every conceivable risk in order to leave the door open to Sixth Army to fight its way back to freedom in conjunction with Fourth Panzer Army. Throughout this period the army group was constantly threatened by the danger that the enemy resolutely exploiting his breakthrough in the area of the Italian army would either drive across the open on its crossings to Rostov, where he could strike at the lifeline of our whole southern wing, or else that he would wheel round into the rear of the left wing of Don Army Group, Army Detachment Hollett. We had to see the attempt through even at the risk that the thin protective screen serving us as a front on the lower chair. 3rd Romanian Army, and in the area of Army Detachment Hollett might finally disintegrate. In spite of everything, the Army Group left 4th Panzer Army in its exposed position east of the Don as long as it was possible to hope that 6th Army would avail itself of its last opportunity of escape. The time limit was reached when developments on the left wing of the Army Group left us no choice but to throw forces in there from the eastern bank of the Don in when, on 25th December, the position of 57 Panzer Corps on the Miskiva became untenable. Let us now briefly survey the dramatic events of that week. It all began on the left wing of the Army Group, or, more precisely, on the left flank of Army Detachment Hollett. Exactly what happened to the Italians was not known. It seemed that only one light division and one or another of the infantry divisions had put up any resistance worth mentioning. Be that as it may, on the morning of 20th December the German general commanding the corps on the Italian's right wing came in to state that the two Italian divisions under his command were at that moment beating a rapid retreat, evidently because of a report that there were already two enemy armoured corps deep in their flank. As a result the flank of Army Detachment Hollett was completely exposed. When the Army Group headquarters was informed of this situation by General Hollett, who actually came under Army Group B, it directed him to use every means at his disposal to halt the Italian divisions. The army detachment under his command received orders to hold its position on the aperture and to cover its left flank by an excellent defence. In the course of the day, however, the army detachment's own flimsy front was penetrated in two places. Seven Romanian division carried out an unauthorised withdrawal and HQ-1 Romanian Corps abandoned its command post in a panic. By the evening of 20th December the situation in Army Detachment Hollett's deep flank was utterly obscure. No one could tell whether the Italians who had been in action next to it were still offering any resistance, and if so, where. The enemy's armoured spearheads were reported everywhere in the rear of Army Detachment Hollett even as far back as the important Dunitz crossing of Kamensk-Shiktinsky. During the next two days the position of Army Detachment Hollett became increasingly acute. With even its front penetrated, it presented a no longer protectable flank and rear to the enemy armor, which now enjoyed a completely free hand in the sector where the Italians had been overrun. Before long this perilous situation was bound to have its effect on the 3rd Romanian Army front on the lower Chidot Army Detachment Hall at first had to do its best to establish a new front roughly level with that of 3rd Romanian Army in order to cover both the latter's flank and the Morosovsky and Tatsinsky and airfields that were so indispensable to the Stalingrad airlift. Everything possible also had to be done to keep the important Dunitz crossings of Fortstadt and kamensk shiktinsky open. That such temporary expedients could contain the situation on the Army Group's left wing for at most two or three days longer was only too evident. As early as 20th December the Army Group had sent OKH a teleprint a message stating point blank that if the enemy acted decisively following his breakthrough on the Italian front, he would bear down on Rostov and seek a major decision against Don Army Group and Army Group. It was characteristic of the state of affairs prevailing at the Supreme Command that even the Chief of Staff of the German Army was unable to take this message into Hitler on that particular day because the latter with only OKW. Representatives in attendance was busy negotiating with an Italian delegation. The only reply we got was an OKH directive received on 22nd December, 
assigning Army Detachment Holly to defense line which had long been overtaken by events. On the very same day it was actually touch and go whether the German and a handful of Romanian formations which the army detachment had fighting out in front would ever get back to form a new line at all. Clearly the army group could not expect any effective measures from the Supreme Command to stabilize the position in the gap torn in our front with army group B by the Italian debacle. It had even refused to allow the quick transfer of an infantry division from army group to ensure the immediate protection of Rostov. All we could do, therefore, was to draw on our own resources a decision rendered particularly painful by the fact that it could only be carried out at the expense of the army group's right wing, that is the forces now in action east of the Don. Yet there was no room for any delay, for on 24 December the crisis at Army Detachment Hollett reached its climax. Three enemy tank and mechanized corps had driven through the breach in the front where the Italians and three Romanian division had been. Two of them, 25 tank and 50 mechanized corps, were already approaching the vital airlift bases at Morosovsky and Tatsinskaya, while the third, eight tank corps, was round behind those elements of the army detachment which were still fighting on either the middle or upper reaches of the Chidot, while the situation on the left wing of the army group, particularly on its open western flank, became increasingly grave, we continued to strive for the breakout of 6th Army, which still depended on Hitler's renunciation of Stalingrad and on the army's readiness to take the plunge. 4th Panzer Army was meanwhile doing everything in its power to accomplish the last lap to Stalingrad hoping at the same time that 6th Army would make its task easier by starting to attack to the southwest. In the days following its arrival at the Miskova on 19 December, the relieving army had become embroiled in heavy fighting against the never-ending waves of forces thrown in by the enemy from Stalingrad to halt its advance. Despite this, 57 Panzer Corps had succeeded in gaining a foothold on the north bank of the river and, after a series of ding-dong engagements, in forming a bridgehead there. Mass attacks by the enemy brought him nothing but bloody losses. Already, on the distant horizon, the leading troops of the corps could see the reflection of the gunfire around Stalingrad. Success seemed to be within striking distance if only 6th Army would create a diversion by going over to the attack and at least prevent the enemy from constantly throwing fresh forces in the path of 4th Panzer Army. For reasons which have already been stated, however, 6th Army's attack never materialized. Dot on the afternoon of 23rd December, the Army Group was regretfully compelled to take account of the situation on the left wing, which was more than critical by this time, by shifting forces to that area. 3rd Romanian Army on the lower chair was directed to release HQ. 48 Panzer Corps and 11 Panzer Division to restore the position on the Army Group's western wing and to make good this loss 4th Panzer Army had to give up one armoured division, without which the lower Chur front could not possibly be held. The very next day showed how imperative this measure had been. Tatsunskayan airfield was lost, and with it went a means of supplying 6th Army by air. It could not be recaptured until 28 December. The army group had only taken this agonizing decision to deprive the 4th Panzer Army Relief Group of a whole division when it became clear that 6th Army could no longer be expected to break out in time. Even now, it could have put off doing so if only 16 motorized division had been already available. On 20 December, admittedly, OKH had yielded to the promptings of my own headquarters and finally given orders for this division to be relieved at Yalista by the Viking Division from Army Group B, but unfortunately the process was to take 10 days to complete. As it happened, 10 days was the exact period which had elapsed since the Army Group's first request for 16 motorized divisions release. Had approval been given forthwith. The division could have been immediately available for action on the Chur front on 23rd December and 57 Panzer Corps need never have been deprived of an armoured division. As was so often the case, the decision bore the stamp of Hitler's dilatoriness. Although Hitler now promised to let the army group have 7 Panzer Division, it was bound to arrive too late for the relief operation already in progress. 
At the same time he hoped to see events take a turn for the better now that the first battalion of tigers was due to arrive, but this was to prove equally fallacious. Apart from the fact that some considerable time was to pass before the tigers showed up, they had never been tested under active service conditions and were afflicted with so many growing pains that they could not initially render any worthwhile assistance. This, incidentally, was typical of the way Hitler overrated the power of new weapons. And so, in the battleground east of the Don, too, the hour now came for the initiative to pass to our opponents. On 27 December 57, Panzer Corps was attacked in the Miskiver sector, where a steady enemy build up had been going on, and was pushed back to the Xi. It became clear in the next few days that the Soviet intention was to envelop the Cal from the east and west. Two Soviet armies, 51st and 2nd Guards, comprising three mechanized, one tank, three rifle, and one cavalry corps were identified on the northern and eastern fronts of 4th Panzer Army. A large proportion of these forces had been drawn from the Stalingrad siege front, though reinforcements had also come from over the Volga. Within a day or two the enormous preponderance of forces now amassed by the enemy compelled 4th Panzer Army to withdraw as far as Kotelnikovo, whence it had originally begun to drive to Stalingrad on 12th December. What rendered this withdrawal quite inevitable was the inability of the 4th Romanian Army units under command to rise to the task of giving flank protection to the troops of 57 Panzer Corps in their hard battle on the Xi. The troops of both 7 Romanian Corps, which was to have held the army's eastern flank towards the Volga, and of 6 Romanian Corps, which was meant to safeguard the ground between 57 Panzer Corps and the Don, had lost all will to fight due in part, no doubt, to the scant efforts of either of the command staffs to maintain morale. For all his assurances that he was doing everything possible to rally his troops to fresh resistance, the commander of 4th Romanian Army proved powerless in the face of such disintegration. We were left with no choice but to pull these units out of the line and send them home to Romania. The attempt to relieve 6th Army undertaken on 12th December had failed, at least for the time being. Could there, judging by the way things had developed since, be any hope of renewing it? Today, with one's retrospective knowledge of the turn events took in the area of Army Group B, the reply to this question must be in the negative. At the time, though, it could not be foreseen that the catastrophe suffered by the Italian army would be followed, before January was out by an even greater one in the Hungarian army's sector on the Don. And so, despite all the objections which existed, the army group still did not feel able to abandon its policy of getting help through to 6th Army. With this in mind, it submitted the following proposals to OKH on 16th December. In order to maintain the position on the left wing of the army group, where the enemy was threatening to break through towards Rostov, for at least a limited period, we called for the earliest possible intervention of an army-sized battle group, Army Group, which OKH had already begun assembling in the Malarovo area, just behind the right wing of Army Group B. In addition, we wanted an infantry division of Army Group A's 17th Army moved quickly over to Rostov for the purpose of affording it direct protection. Likewise 7 Panzer Division which had provisionally been promised to the army group and would be arriving too late to be committed east of the Don, must now take a hand in the battle on the left wing of the army group. The worst that need be expected in the center of the army group front was a withdrawal to the Don, done its line. Besides, the situation on the lower tier had relaxed somewhat in the last few days, as the enemy had obviously concentrated his forces further west to capture our airfields at Tatsinskaya and Morosovsky. The question of whether a second attempt to raise the Stalingrad siege could be made or not depended on our ability to assemble enough forces east of the Don to enable 4th Panzer Army to beat the enemy now pursuing it. To this end Don Army Group called on OKH as it had been doing repeatedly since 18th December and even before that immediately to transfer three Panzer Corps and an infantry division from 1st Panzer Army to reinforce 4th Panzer Army. These forces, when combined with 16 motorized division, whose arrival must likewise be expedited, would have sufficed, in the Army Group's opinion, 
for fourth Panzer Army to renew its advance on Stalingrad. We reckoned, moreover, that they could be made available to the latter within six days. The same period must suffice to fly in Sixth Army's urgent requirements of fuel, 1,000 tons, and food, 500 tons, the Supreme Command having meanwhile promised more squadrons of transport aircraft. Tatsinskaya and Morosovsky would be free again in a day or two. It goes without saying that at the same time we repeatedly demanded freedom of movement for Sixth Army. Even though the latter might consider it hopeless to attempt to break out at the present juncture, the Army Group headquarters insisted that there was no alternative, since it was quite impossible to keep the Army supplied inside the pocket. In view of the general situation and the state of Sixth Army's troops, however, we considered that the latest possible date for a breakout must be around the new year by which time 4th Panzer Army always provided that its reinforcements arrived could have started attacking towards the pocket again. Admittedly, even if the breakout were a success, one could now hardly expect 6th Army to reach 4th Panzer Army as an intact formation. Nonetheless, a considerable number of its troops would presumably have an opportunity to fight their way through. The question was whether 1st Panzer Army could spare the above-mentioned forces at this time. Both Hitler and Army Group headquarters contended that it could not. Dot whether this refusal was justified must be left for others to decide. At all events, on 27 December, Don Army Group sent OKH for Hitler's attention, a statement of comparative strengths, indicating that the transfer of the three divisions we had asked for was perfectly feasible. According to the figures given, the ratio of German to enemy forces in the area of Army Gruppe was unquestionably a more favorable one than that existing in the case of Don Army Group. The latter's formations, moreover, had been involved in some extremely heavy fighting in the last month and a half and were correspondingly run down. Don Army Group was having to fight in open country. Whereas ever since the Caucasus offensive petered out the armies of Army Group had been holding positions which must by now be reasonably strong. But even if 1st Panzer Army had been unable, after handing over the three divisions in question, to withstand a more powerful enemy attack, it could still have employed elastic tactics to delay the enemy's advance until the battle to save 6th Army had been settled one way or the other. Hitler, however, would not admit this possibility at the time, although our own headquarters had pointed out several times already that even if we could get Sixth Army out, it would not be possible to hold the Caucasus front permanently. The grand solution advocated by us which meant taking Sixth Army out of Stalingrad and going over to mobile operations throughout the areas of Don Army Group and Army Group was something which Hitler would not accept. His refusal to weaken Army Group may apart from his fundamental unwillingness ever to surrender anything, have had yet another reason. He evidently believed he had another possibility in hand of bringing assistance to Sixth Army, even though not till a later date. According to an OKH directive received by us on 31st December, Hitler had resolved to move the SS Panzer Corps, which had had a rest and refit and consisted of the Bstandarte, Death's Head and Reich Panzer Grenadier Divisions over from the western to the eastern theater. The Corps was to concentrate around Kharkov and from the carry forward a relief offensive against Stalingrad. On account of the limited capacity of the railways, however, its assembly in the Kharkov area could not be completed before mid-February. How Sixth Army was to be kept alive in the meantime was not stated. Even though it was not yet possible to foresee the same sort of disaster in the Hungarian sector which had just befallen the Italians, the provision of the SS Panzer Corps was still necessary in view of the ever-increasing gravity of the situation between Army Group B and Don Army Group. However, there was no basis whatever for assuming that the forces of the SS Panzer Corps would ever suffice to carry an offensive as far as Stalingrad. What might well have been achieved over the relatively short distance of 80 miles from Kotelnikovo to Stalingrad in December, when the reinforcement of 4th Panzer Army had been entirely feasible, could only be regarded as sheer fantasy in February, when it was a matter of covering 350 miles from Kharkov. If Hitler really did believe such a drive possible, 
it merely substantiates what was said about him in an earlier chapter. When Hitler rejected all Don Army Group's requests for the speedy reinforcement of 4th Panzer Army at the end of December, the fate of 6th Army was finally sealed. In vain had we staked the last available man and the last available shell on the liberation of 6th Army. In vain had we striven till the last possible moment to get the relief operation carried out and thrown the fate of the whole army group into the balance to do so. From the beginning of January onwards, events in the area of Don Army Group could be more or less divided into two parallel phases, that is 6th Army's final battle around Stalingrad and the struggle to preserve the entire southern wing, embracing Army Group A. B and Don. Dot, while the latter must be dealt with separately for reasons of operational continuity. The former is covered in the last part of this chapter. Therein will be seen what an immense bearing 6th Army's last battle was to have on the preservation of the southern wing of the German armies. 6th Army's last battle at death struggle of 6th Army, which began around the turn of the year, is a tale of indescribable suffering. It was marked not only by the despair and justified bitterness of the men who had been deceived in their trust, but even more by the steadfastness they displayed in the face of an undeserved but inexorable fate, by their high degree of bravery, comradeship and devotion to duty, and by their calm resignation and humble faith in God. If I refrain from dwelling on these things here, it is certainly not because we at Army Group Headquarters were not intensely affected by them. Respect for a heroism which may never find its equal renders me incapable of doing full justice to these happenings at Stalingrad. There is one question, however, which I feel both impelled and qualified to answer as the former commander of Don Army Group. Was it justifiable or necessary, and if so, for how long, to demand this sacrifice of our soldiers? In other words, did Sixth Army's final battle serve any useful purpose? To answer the question properly, one must examine it against the background of the current situation, and the stern exigencies this imposed, rather than in the light of Germany's ultimate defeat. On 26 December, the commander of 6th Army sent us the message reproduced below. We passed it straight on to OKH, our policy all along having been to present the Army's position in a quite unembellished form. From this moment onwards, the only reports we received on the position inside the pocket came by radio or from officers flown out as couriers. We had been unable to maintain the ultra-high frequency radio link by which it was possible to hold teleprinter conversations over a brief period. The message from Colonel General Paulus ran as follows Bloody losses, cold, and inadequate supplies have recently made serious inroads on division's fighting strength. I must therefore report the following colon 1. Army can continue to beat off small scale attacks and deal with local crises for some time yet, always providing that supply improves and replacements are flown in at earliest possible moment. 2. If enemy draws off forces in any strength from Hoth's 25 front and uses these or any other troops to launch mass attacks on Stalingrad Fortress, latter cannot hold out for long. 3 no longer possible to execute breakout unless corridor is cut in advance and army replenished with men and supplies. I therefore request representations at highest level to ensure energetic measures for speedy relief, unless overall situation compels sacrifice of army. Army will naturally do everything in its power to hold out till last possible moment. I have also to report that only 70 tons were flown in today. Some of the core will exhaust bread supplies tomorrow, fats this evening, evening fare tomorrow. Radical measures now urgent. The contents of this message confirmed how wrong Paulus's chief of staff had been only a week before when he asserted that the army could hold out till Easter if properly supplied. The message also showed that when the army group had ordered 6th Army to break out of the pocket one week previously, this in view of the approach of 4th Panzer Army had not only been its first chance of being rescued but as could be seen from the state the army was in its last one, two dot otherwise, except for local attacks, there was relative calm on the 6th Army fronts around the end of December and beginning of January. 
This was either because the enemy wished to munition his artillery for a grand assault or because he was putting all the forces he could spare into an attempt to destroy 4th Panzer Army and to score the success he was after in the large bend of the Don. On 8 January General Hube appeared at Army Group Headquarters on his way back from seeing Hitler. The latter had had Hube flown out of Stalingrad to Lotzen to brief him on the situation of 6th Army. Cube told me that he had given Hitler a completely unvarnished picture of things in the pocket. This cannot, in fact, have differed in any respect from the one already available to Hitler from the Army Group's daily situation reports, but presumably he was not prepared to credit our own version without further evidence. Nevertheless, it was remarkable how Hube's stay in Lotzen had impressed him and to what extent he had been influenced by Hitler's display of confidence genuine or otherwise. Hitler had declared that everything would be done to supply 6th Army for a long time to come and had drawn attention to the plan for its relief at a later date. With his confidence thus restored, Hube returned into the pocket only to be flown out again on instructions from Hitler to take over the running of the airlift from outside. Not even he was able to improve it, however, its slow efficiency being due to the prevailing weather and the inadequate resources of the Luftwaffe and not to any shortcomings in the actual organization. One statement of Hubes which touched me personally concerned a rumor circulating in 6th Army that I had sent them the signal, hang on I'll get you out, Manstein. While I left no stone unturned to extricate 6th Army from Stalingrad, it has never been my custom to promise the troops anything which I was not certain of fulfilling and did not trust with me alone. General Hube, who was a fearless man had tried to bring home to Hitler how damaging such events as the encirclement of 6th Army must be to his prestige as head of state. By this means he wished to suggest that Hitler should hand over command, at least on the Eastern Front to a soldier. In view of the fact that Hube had called in to see us on his way to Lotzen, Hitler doubtless supposed that Hube's demarker had been inspired by me. This was in fact not the case. When, after the fall of Stalingrad, I myself proposed a change in the supreme military command to Hitler, he was already forewarned and flatly refused to consider such a thing. Otherwise especially as he was then still under the impression of his responsibility for the loss of 6th Army he might have proved more receptive to my ideas. On 9 January the enemy called upon 6th Army to capitulate. On Hitler's orders, the demand was rejected. I do not think I can be reproached with ever having taken an uncritical view of Hitler's decisions or actions in the military sphere. Yet I entirely support the decision he made in this instance, for however harsh it may have been from the humanitarian point of view, it was still necessary at the time. I do not propose to deal here with the purely soldierly viewpoint that no army may capitulate as long as it still has any strength left to fight to abandon it would mean the very end of soldiering. Until we reach the happy era when states can do without armed might and soldiers no longer exist, this conception of soldierly honor will have to be maintained. Even the apparent hopelessness of a battle that can be avoided by capitulation does not in itself justify a surrender. If every commander in chief were to capitulate as soon as he considered his position hopeless, no one would ever win a war. Even in situations apparently quite bereft of hope it has often been possible to find a way out in the end. From General Paulus's point of view, at all events, it was his soldierly duty to refuse to capitulate. An exception could only have been made if the army had had no further role to play and could serve no useful purpose in prolonging its struggle. And this in turn brings us to the crucial point which justifies Hitler's order to refuse to capitulate and also barred the army group from intervening in favor of such action at that particular time. No matter how futile 6th Army's continued resistance might be in the long run, it still had as long as it could conceivably go on fighting a decisive role to fulfill in the overall strategic situation. It had to try to tie down the enemy forces opposing it for the longest possible space of time. At the beginning of December, an approximate total of 60 enemy formations, that is, rifle divisions, armored and mechanized brigades, etc., had been identified in the siege ring around the army. 
Some of them had doubtless been temporarily drawn off by the attack of 4th Panzer Army, but new ones had been brought up to replace them. By 19 January, 90 of the 259 formations reported to be facing Don Army Group were committed round 6th Army. What would have happened if the bulk of these 90 formations had been released through a capitulation of 6th Army on 9th January is plain enough in the light of what has already been said about the Army Group's position and the consequent threat to the southern wing as a whole. The Army was still capable of fighting, even though this was ultimately futile from its own point of view. Yet its ability to hold out was of decisive importance for the situation on the southern wing. Every extra day 6th Army could continue to tie down the enemy forces surrounding it was vital as far as the fate of the entire Eastern Front was concerned. It is idle to point out today that we still lost the war in the end and that its early termination would have spared us infinite misery. That is merely being wise after the event. In those days it was by no means certain that Germany was bound to lose the war in the military sense. A military stalemate which might in turn have led to a similar state of affairs in the political field, would have been entirely within the bounds of possibility if the situation on the southern wing of the German armies could in some way have been restored. This, however, depended first and foremost on Sixth Army's continuing the struggle and holding down the enemy siege forces for as long as it possessed the slightest capacity to resist. It was the cruel necessity of war which compelled the supreme command to demand that one last sacrifice of the brave troops at Stalingrad. The fact that the self-same supreme command was responsible for the army's plight is beside the point in this context. Following 6th Army's refusal to capitulate on 9th January, the Soviet attack, preceded by intensive artillery preparation and supported by a large number of tanks, broke loose on all fronts. The main pressure was directed against the salient which protruded furthest west by Marinovka, and the enemy was able to break in at several points. On 11 January the situation became even more critical, and because of the lack of ammunition and fuel the army could no longer restore it to any appreciable extent. The loss of the positions in the Carp of Gavali and in particular of the inhabited localities that deprived the troops on the western front of what protection they had hitherto enjoyed against the cold. Furthermore, the state of the weather ruled out any hope of an airlift. This aggravation of 6th Army's plight was made clear in a special report of 12th January which the Army Group immediately forwarded to OK despite the troops' heroic resistance. The Army stated. The heavy fighting of the last few days has resulted in deep enemy penetrations which could so far be contained only with difficulty. Reserves are no longer available, nor can any be formed. Heavy weapons now immobilized. Severe losses and inadequate supplies, together with cold, have also considerably reduced troops' powers of resistance. If enemy maintains attacks in present strength, fortress front unlikely to hold more than a few days longer. Resistance will then resolve itself into localized actions. On 12 January, weather again stopped the airlift and also prevented the Luftwaffe from flying any sorties in support of the Army's hard defensive battles. That evening, General Pickett, the man responsible for controlling the Luftwaffe's side of the airlift, came out of the pocket. He painted a shocking picture of the position and set a limit of two to four days on the army's capacity for continued resistance an estimate that was to prove inaccurate by reason of the bravery and self-sacrifice of the troops. In Pickett's opinion not even an improvement of the airlift could make much difference from now on, as the army's resources no longer sufficed to patch up the points where the enemy had broken in. The following information on the tactical situation inside the pocket emerged from a report brought out to us by Pickett from Paulus, who had meanwhile been promoted Colonel General. On the northwestern front, the enemy had attacked with a force of between 10 and 12 divisions. Parts of 3 and 29 motorized infantry divisions had been outflanked from the north and smashed with the result that it no longer seemed possible to rebuild a defense line here. The two gallant divisions had knocked out 100 tanks between them, but the enemy still appeared to have 50 intact. Dot on the southern front of the pocket, in spite of heroic resistance by 297 infantry division, 
the enemy had succeeded in breaking in after two days of intensive artillery bombardment. Here, too, there were no more forces available to close the gap. Of over 100 Soviet tanks taking part in this assault, 40 had been knocked out. The eastern front of the pocket was still holding at present, though here, too, heavy enemy pressure was being exerted. On the northeastern front, the enemy had penetrated deeply in several places. 16 Panzer Division's fighting strength was exhausted. Paulus further stated that the army would stand and fight to the last round. Any reduction in the size of the pocket is now suggested by Hitler to General Hube, at the time when it was vitally necessary to accumulate forces for the breakout Hitler had issued an order expressly forbidding such action. Author, would only serve to hasten the collapse, as no heavy weapons could now be moved. Since the airlift had been inadequate all along, no improvement could help matters now. The length of time the army could continue to resist depended entirely on the intensity of the enemy's attacks. That same day the Pitomnik airfield was lost. Henceforth the only one left to us in the Stalingrad pocket was that at Gumrak. During the night, however, Paulus reported that there might still be some prospect of continuing to defend the city if several battalions of troops were flown in forthwith with their full scale of weapons. He had already asked us repeatedly to fly in several thousand men to make good his losses, but the army group had been unable to comply because it possessed neither the necessary replacements nor, indeed, a single uncommitted battalion. Nor would it in any case have acceded to these requests from 6th Army once 4th Panzer Army's rescue drive had become bogged down, if only because there could be no justification for dispatching any reinforcements or replacements into the pocket from then on. It was already quite bad enough to have to fly unit commanders and general staff officers back into the pocket on their return from leave. But apart from the fact that the army urgently needed them, these officers some of whom bore such old military names as Bismarck and Bullo themselves insisted on returning to their troops, thereby proving that the tradition of self-denial and comradeship could withstand the hardest of tests. On 13th January Colonel General Paulus's senior aide, Captain Bir, an exemplary young officer who had already won the Knight's Cross, flew out to see us, bringing the army's war diary with him. He told us how bravely the troops were still fighting and what fortitude all ranks had shown in coming to terms with the cruelty of their fate. Be carried letters from Paulus and his chief of staff to Schultz and myself, letters reflecting the courage, integrity and decency that govern the German soldiers' way of thinking. They fully recognized that the army group had done everything humanly possible to get 6th Army out. On the other hand, of course, one detected their bitterness at the fact that the promises about air supplies had not been kept. All I can say to this is that neither Colonel General V. Richthofen nor I had ever made such promises. The man responsible for them was Geo Ring. On 16th January, there was again heavy fighting on all the army fronts. For a time, it was impossible for any more aircraft to land following the excessive losses inflicted by the enemy's ground and fighter defenses earlier in the day. In the main it was now only possible to fly supplies in at night or drop them from the air. Inevitably a considerable volume of stores delivered by the latter method went astray. The same day Hitler put Field Marshal Milch in charge of the airlift. On 17 January the army radioed that the Gumrak airfield was usable again, but the Luftwaffe did not agree. The army group, however, insisted that an attempt be made to land the dot on 19th January I had my first talk with Milch, who had been slightly injured the day before when the car in which he had been coming to see me collided with a railway engine. I impressed on him the urgent need for a radical improvement of the airlift notwithstanding the hopelessness of 6th Army's position. Apart from the fact that we owed it to our comrades at Stalingrad to maintain their supplies until the very last hour, I said, the army was performing a vital operational task in continuing to tie down 90 Soviet formations. In view of the critical situation on the rest of the army group's front and its open flank by Army Group B, every extra day we could keep 6th Army in action might well be of decisive value. Milch promised to release all possible resources from the home front, 
including the last reserves of transport aircraft and technical personnel for maintenance and repair work. The latter were particularly important now, as the Morosovsky and Tatsinsky and airfields had by this time fallen into enemy hands and the airlift was having to operate from Novokokarsk and Rostov and bases even further to the rear. From what Milch told me, it was clear that if he had been called in several weeks earlier, he might have been able to ease matters considerably since he had access to many resources back at home which were not available to V. Richthofen. This meant that Goring was all the more to blame for not having ensured that the resources in question were tapped at the right time. On 24 January the following communication reached us from the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Zietzilla the following radio message has been received here, Fortress can be held for only a few days longer. Troops exhausted and weapons immobilized as a result of non arrival of supplies. Imminent loss of last airfield will reduce supplies to a minimum. No basis left on which to carry out mission to hold Stalingrad. Russians already able to pierce individual fronts, whole stretches of which are being lost through men dying. Heroism of officers and men nevertheless unbroken. In order to use this for final blow, shall give orders just before final breakup for all elements to fight through to southwest in organized groups. Some of these will get through and sow confusion behind Russian lines. Failure to move will mean end of everyone, as prisoners will also die of cold and hunger. Suggest flying out a few men, officers and other ranks, as specialists for use in future operations. Appropriate order must be given soon as landing facilities unlikely to exist much longer. Please detail officers by name, obviously excluding myself. Paulus. The following reply has been sent, message received. Identical with recommendation put up by me four days ago. On my resubmission, Führer has directed colon 1. Rebreakout, Führer reserves right of final decision. Please send further signal in case. Two. Re-flying out of personnel, Führer has refused for time being. Please send Zitzwitz here to restate case. I shall take him to see F.U. Diarasis Zitzler. As regards Colonel General Paulus's request to have individual members of his army flown out, I would offer the following comment. Seen purely from the viewpoint of military expediency, it would naturally have been desirable to save the highest possible number of essential specialists always bearing in mind, of course, that they must be selected quite irrespective of rank. From the humanitarian point of view, it goes without saying that one should try to get every single man out. Yet there was also an aspect of soldierly ethics to consider the one which dictated that the very first to be flown out should be the wounded. This, in fact, we did succeed in doing on a quite remarkable scale. The evacuation of specialists, however, could only have been achieved at the expense of leaving wounded men behind. Besides, the majority of specialists to be flown out would inevitably have been officers, for the simple reason that an officer's training renders him more important in war than the private soldier, unless the latter happens to have some very special qualification as a technician or scientist. But in a situation like Sixth Armies, the German military code demands that when lives are at stake, the officers must take second place to the men. It was for this reason that the army group made no move to get the Sixth Army commander's proposal accepted by Hitler. As for any attempt to break through the enemy lines in small groups at the last moment, Hitler's final decision never materialized. Nonetheless, the army group did try to create a basis of survival for successful groups of evaders by dropping food at various points behind the enemy front and sending out reconnaissance aircraft in search of them. But none reached the army group front, nor were any sighted by our pilots. At all events, Paulus's message shows that up to the very last those members of 6th Army who still had any strength left did not lose their will to fight. Indeed, we were aware that some of the younger officers and men, whose resistance was not yet exhausted, were resolved whatever happened to try to fight their way through the enemy's siege ring when the time came. This was why we took the measures described above, 
fruitless though they proved. On 22 January, the Russians reached the Gumrak airfield, with the result that supplies could no longer be delivered by landing aircraft. Having reported that he could no longer seal the gap in the front there and that his ammunition and rations were coming to an end, Paulus now sought Hitler's permission to begin surrender negotiations. In this connection I had a long argument with the latter by telephone. I urged him to authorize a capitulation, my belief being that though every day's reduction of the army's resistance must aggravate the army group's situation as a whole, the time had now come to put an end to this valiant struggle. In bitter fighting the army had expended its last ounce of strength to hold a far stronger enemy thereby decisively contributing to the salvation of the Eastern Front that winter. From now on the army's sufferings would bear no relation to any advantage which could be derived from continuing to tie down the enemy's forces. In a long and violent dispute Hitler rejected the request made by Paulus and myself and ordered the army to fight on to the end. His grounds for doing so were that every day the enemy's Stalingrad divisions were prevented from being committed elsewhere represented a vital saving. Yet the situation was critical enough now that the Russians had also overrun the Hungarian army on the Don and virtually wiped army group B off the map. From Voroshilovgrad on the Don it's up as far as Voronezh on the Don there was a gaping void within which the enemy was advancing in strength and had almost complete freedom of movement. Whether, in this situation, Don Army Group and Army Group A, which was now withdrawing from the Caucasus, could be saved at all seemed more than doubtful. Hitler contended that even if Sixth Army were no longer able to form a coherent front, the fight could still be continued in smaller pockets for some time yet. Finally, he declared that capitulation was futile, as the Russians would never keep any agreements anyway. That the second prediction was correct in essence if not in the strictly literal sense, is shown by the fact that of the 90,000 prisoners who finally fell into Soviet hands, not more than a few thousand can be alive today. It must be emphasized here, moreover, that the Soviets had intact railways running close up to Stalingrad and that, given goodwill, it must have been possible for them to feed and evacuate the prisoners. Inevitable though the higher loss of life from cold and exhaustion may well have been, the death rate in this case still appears quite excessive. When Hitler turned down my request for Sixth Army's capitulation, I was naturally faced with the personal problem of deciding whether to register my disagreement by resigning command of the army group. It was not the first time that I had contemplated doing so. The problem had particularly oppressed me during those Christmas days of 1942 when I had failed to persuade Hitler to let Sixth Army break out. And I was often to encounter it again in the months ahead. It is, I think, understandable that one should have wished to be released from responsibilities rendered almost unbearable by the interminable, nerve wracking battles that had to be fought with one's own supreme command before it would accept the need for any urgent military action. The extent to which this wish preoccupied me at that time is apparent from a remark made by my GSOI, the then Colonel Buss to the chief engineer of 6th Army just after Christmas 1942. According to the latter, Buss's words were, if I had not kept begging him, Manstein, to stay for the troops' sake, he'd have chucked the jaw back at Hitler long ago. This impulsive utterance by the man who was then my closest collaborator is the best indication of my attitude and position. But let me make a few general remarks here on the question of a senior commander's resignation in the field. The first point is that a senior commander is no more able to pack up and go home than any other soldier. Hitler was not compelled to accept a resignation, and would hardly have been likely to do so in this case. The soldier in the field is not in the pleasant position of a politician, who is always at liberty to climb off the bandwagon when things go wrong or the line taken by the government does not suit him. The soldier has to fight where and when he is ordered. There are admittedly cases where a senior commander cannot reconcile it with his responsibilities to carry out an order he has been given. Then, like Seydlitz at the Battle of Zorndorf, he has to say, after the battle the king may dispose of my head as he will but during the battle he will kindly allow me to make use of it. 
no general can vindicate his loss of a battle by claiming that he was compelled against his better judgment to execute an order that led to defeat. In this case the only course open to him is that of disobedience, for which he is answerable with his head. Success will usually decide whether he was right or not. This was my reason on 19th December for giving 6th Army that order immediately to break out to the southwest contrary to an express directive from Hitler. The fact that the order did not achieve anything is due to the failure of 6th Army headquarters to carry it out. It will hardly ever be possible to decide conclusively whether the latter was right to forego this one remaining chance of salvation as no one can tell whether the breakout would have succeeded or not. On later occasions, too, I acted contrary to Hitler's orders whenever it was absolutely necessary to do so. Success proved me right, and Hitler had to tolerate my disobedience. Unauthorized action was not admissible, however, when it would have landed the adjacent army groups in trouble. This question of resignation has another aspect, however, besides the one mentioned above, I refer to the feeling of responsibility which a senior commander must have towards his soldiers. At the time in question, I had not only 6th Army to consider. The fate of my entire army group was at stake, as well as that of Army Group A to throw up my task at this moment, however justifiable the human motives might be in the light of Hitler's attitude over the capitulation of 6th Army, struck me as a betrayal of those brave troops who were also involved in a life and death struggle outside the Stalingrad pocket. The fact that Don Army Group subsequently succeeded in mastering one of the most difficult situations of the war served, in my own opinion, to justify my decision that day not to resign out of sheer disgust. Just how vital 6th Army's bitter resistance had been may be gathered from a short sketch of developments in the areas of Don Army Group and Army Group Su and B in January 1943. On 29th December, OKH had finally given in to the insistence of Don Army Group and ordered the withdrawal of Army Group from the Caucasus initially by taking its left wing 1st Panzer Army back onto the Kimmel line Pyatigusk Praskovaya, 155 miles southeast of Solsk. Because of the time needed to salvage equipment, the move proceeded extraordinarily slowly and no forces became free for the time being. By 9th January, the date of 6th Army's rejection of the surrender call, 1st Panzer Army had still not reached the Kimmel line. 4th Panzer Army whose task was to cover the rear of Army Group south of the Don and simultaneously to keep its communications through Rostov open, had been pushed back to the west through Kotelnikovo after some heavy fighting against a much superior enemy, three armies strong, south of the Don. By 9th January it was fighting hard defensive battles along the Kibble, between the Sal and the Manich, and we could see that the enemy intended to envelop it from both flanks. His three guards tank corps, on the Don around Konstantinovka, was swinging southeast and driving on Proletarskaya in the rear of 4th Panzer Army. Similarly, along the Manich, the Soviet 28th Army, newly arrived from the Karmic Steppes, was trying to execute an outflanking movement to the South. Army Detachment Hollet, after some heavy fighting in the large bend of the Don, had had to retire to the Kogelnik sector. Even here the enemy had already broken into the southern flank of its positions, a small enemy force having crossed the Don northeast of Novokokarsk, the location of Army Group Headquarters, on 7 January. On the northern wing of the Army Detachment 7 Panzer Division was trying to delay the enemy's approach to the Don its crossing at Fortstadt by local shock tactics. The crossing at Caymans could only be covered by emergency units and the few Romanians who had not disappeared from the battlefield. Northwest from this point stretched the enormous gap left by the disintegration of the Italian army. Fighting around Malarovo, for a time almost completely surrounded, was the weak Fretapico battle group belonging to Army Group B. On 24th January, the day 6th Army finally crumbled into three tightly packed groups in and around Stalingrad and could no longer tie down any Soviet forces worth mentioning, the situation on the rest of the front was as follows the northern wing of Army Grouper was still around Belea Glina and, even further south, 
east of Armavir, which meant that it was 100-125 miles from Rostov. The withdrawal of the bulk of 1st Panzer Army through Rostov had now been finally approved by O.K.H. of Don Army Group. 4th Panzer Army was fighting desperately southeast of Rostov to keep the Don crossing clear for 1st Panzer Army, which I envisaged throwing on to the left wing of my army group to hold the Dunits from Voroshilovgrad upwards. Army Detachment Hollett was defending the Dunits from its junction with the Don up to a point above Fort Stat. The Freta Pico Battle Group, consisting of two dilapidated divisions, was guarding the Dunits on both sides of Kamensk. Since 19th January, in consequence of the disintegration of the Italian and Hungarian armies, the latter, too, having meanwhile been overrun on the Don, there had been a gap some 200 miles wide from Voroshilovgrad on the Donitz to Voronez on the Don. On 23 January, the front as far as Starobilsk had been placed under Don Army Group. Practically the only troops left there were those of 19 Panzer Division, which was already pretty battered after giving up Starobilsk in the face of three Soviet Army Corps. When the last resistance of 6th Army ceased on 1 February, the enemy was threatening to cross the Dunitz in the Voroshilovgrad area with a group of three tank, one mechanized and one rifle corps and appeared to have thrown another group of three or four tank corps and one rifle corps against the line of the river from Lysychensk to Slaviansk. There would seem to be little point in discussing how the situation would have developed between 9th January and 1st February, or what might have happened subsequently had not the enemy been tied down so long at Stalingrad by the heroic resistance of 6th Army. Now let us return to the army's final struggle. On 24 January the front broke down into three small pockets, one in the center of Stalingrad and the other two on its northern and southern perimeters. On 31 January the army commander, meanwhile promoted field marshal, was taken prisoner with his staff. On 1 February, the last of the fighting came to an end when what was left of 11 Corps also surrendered in the north of the city. The struggle of 6th Army was over. Soviet captivity was to finish off a process of decline begun by the utter ruthlessness of the fighting, pitiless hunger, and the icy cold of the Russian steppes. The soldiers who suffered it had surrendered only when their arms were powerless to bear weapons in their hands too frozen to operate them when the exhaustion of their ammunition left them defenseless in the face of an overwhelming foe. Thanks to the self-sacrifice of the German air crews, however, it had still been possible to evacuate some 30,000 wounded from the pocket. Anyone seeking to fix the responsibility for the tragedy of Stalingrad already has the answer from Hitler's own lips. On 5th February I was summoned to Supreme Headquarters, all my pleas to Hitler to come and see the situation on our front for himself, or at least to send the Chief of Staff or General Jodl, having failed to move him. Hitler opened the interview with roughly these words, I alone bear the responsibility for Stalingrad. I could perhaps put some of the blame on Goring by saying that he gave me an incorrect picture of the Luftwaffe's potentialities. But he has been appointed by me as my successor, and as such I cannot charge him with the responsibility for Stalingrad. It was certainly to Hitler's credit that he accepted responsibility unreservedly in this instance and made no attempt whatever to find a scapegoat. On the other hand, we are confronted by his regrettable failure to draw any conclusions for the future from a defeat for which his own errors of leadership were to blame. Yet there is one fact which overshadows the question of responsibility and all that the ruthlessness of captivity, brainwashing and justified bitterness may have subsequently done to affect the attitude of many an individual member of the sacrificed army by their incomparable bravery and devotion to duty. The officers and men of the army raised a memorial to German arms which, though not of stone or bronze, will nonetheless survive the ages. It is an invisible memorial, engraved with the words prefacing this account of the greatest of soldiers' tragedies. The following are the headquarters staffs and formations of 6th Army which perished at Stalingrad, HQ 4, 8 and 11 Corps and HQ 14 Panzer Corps, 44. 71, 76, 79, 94, 113, 295, 
297, 305, 371, 376, 384 and 389 infantry divisions, 100 rifle, Jaja, division and 369 Croatian regiment, 14, 16 and 24 panzer divisions, 3, 29 and 60 motorized divisions, as well as numerous army and army group troops, anti-aircraft units and ground units of the Luftwaffe. Finally, there were one Romanian cavalry division and 20 Romanian infantry division. 13. The 1942 Three Winter Campaign in South Russia strategy is a system of stop gaps. Mold while the eyes of all Germany were on Stalingrad at the turn of 1942 3, and anxious hearts prayed for the sons who fought there. The southern wing of the Eastern Front was simultaneously the scene of a struggle even greater than that being waged for the lives and freedom of 6th Army's gallant 200,000. The issue was no longer the fate of a single army but of the entire southern wing of the front and ultimately of all the German armies in the East. This struggle was spared the tragedy of defeat, being ultimately marked for the last time in World War II by a brief glimpse of victory. But it embraced quite apart from its initial association with the trials of Sixth Army, such a wealth of unprecedented tensions and well-nigh fatal crises that the campaign may be regarded as one of the most exciting of the war. On the German side there could no longer be any question of this being one last bid for the palm of final victory. Indeed, thanks to the errors of leadership in the summer and autumn campaigns of 1942, the principal aim at least to begin with could only be, in the words of Schlieffen, to bring defeat underfoot. In the face of an enemy whose manifold superiority offered him every chance of victory, the German command had to improvise again and again, and the fighting troops to perform unparalleled feats. Though its end was marked by neither the fanfares of victory nor the muffled drum beats which accompanied Sixth Army's death march, this battle still deserves recording. As a withdrawal operation it must inevitably be devoid of glory. Yet the fact that, far from ending in defeat, it offered the Supreme Command one more chance of achieving at least a military stalemate was possibly something more than an ordinary victory. Strategic basis of the winter campaign in order to appreciate the significance of this decisive campaign on the southern wing and the magnitude of the dangers it involved. We must briefly consider the operational position at its inception. In the winter of 1941, two Russia's military resources had only sufficed to halt the German attack on Moscow, and with it the German campaign as a whole. Then, in the summer of 1942, the tide had surged eastwards again, finally to ebb on the Volga and in the Caucasus. But now in the winter of 1942-3 the enemy at last felt strong enough to wrest the initiative from us. The question henceforth was whether the Twinter would bring the decisive step towards Germany's defeat in the East. Momentous and distressing though the Stalingrad disaster undoubtedly was, it could not, in terms of World War II, effect such a blow on its own whereas the annihilation of the German army's entire southern wing might well have paved the way to an early victory over Germany. There were two reasons why the Soviet High Command could hope to attain this goal in the south of the Eastern Front. One was the extraordinary numerical superiority of the Russian forces, the second was the favorable position it found itself in operationally as a result of the German errors of leadership associated with the name of Stalingrad. It undoubtedly strove after this goal, even if it did not succeed in reaching it. Let me first give a short account of the strategic situation at the start of this winter campaign in South Russia. The German front in November 1942 formed a wide arc curving far out to the east in the area of the Caucasus and eastern Ukraine. The right wing of this arc touched the Black Sea at Novorossiysk and continued along the front of Army Group A. 17th Army and 1st Panzer Army, through the Northern Caucasus without actually linking up with the Caspian Sea in the east. The deep open flank of this front, which faced southwards, had only 16 motorized division to cover it in the direction of the Lower Volga in the east. 
the division was located in the karmic steps east of Yalista. The continuous front of Army Group B only began at a point south of Stalingrad. From Stalingrad it receded to the Don and then ran along the latter as far as Voronezh. In it were 4th Romanian Army, 4th Panzer Army, 6th Army, 3rd Romanian Army, 1 Italian and 1 Hungarian Army and then 2nd German Army. The bulk of the German forces had for months past been bunched around Stalingrad, while the rest of the front, in particular the line of the Don, was entrusted mainly to allied armies. There were no reserves worth speaking of behind the fronts of either Army Group A or B. The enemy, whose armies formed a Caucasus front, a Southwest front, and a Voronezh front, had not only superior forces in the line but also powerful reserves behind these army groups and the central or Moscow sector of the Eastern Front, as well as in the hinterland. In order to grasp the true danger of this situation and the full extent to which it benefited the enemy, one must try to picture one or two distances of strategic significance. The distance to the Don crossing at Rostov from the Don sector in which 3rd Romanian Army was overrun on 19th November, that is opposite and west of the Russians' Don bridgehead at Kremenskaya, as well as from that occupied by the Italian Army on each side of Kosanskaya, amounted to only a little more than 185 miles. Through Rostov ran the rear communications not only of the whole of Army Group but also of 4th Romanian and 4th Panzer Army. Yet the left wing of Army Group was at least 375 miles from Rostov, while 4th Panzer Army, in its location south of Stalingrad, was some 250 miles away. Further back, the lines of communication of the German Army's southern wing led across the Dnieper crossings of Zaporozhye and Nepropetrovsk. The connection through the Crimea and across the Straits of Kerch was not a very efficient one. These vital Dnieper crossings in the rear of the German southern wing lay some 440 miles from Stalingrad and more than 560 miles from the left wing of the Caucasus front. On the other hand, they were only about 260 miles from the enemy front on the Don measuring either from Kosanskaya to Zaporozhye or from Svoboda to Nepropetrovsk. What this situation could mean in practice I knew only too well from personal experience, having in summer 1941 covered the odd 190 miles from Tilsik to Dvinsk in four days with 56 Panzer Corps. I had done so, moreover, against opposition that was certainly tougher than anything the Italian and Hungarian armies could offer on the Don. At that time the Russians had also had very many more reserves behind their front than were available to us in the winter of 1942. Added to this strategic advantage was the Russians' immense preponderance of numbers. The ratio of forces at the beginning of Don Army Group's struggle has already been shown in the chapter on Stalingrad. How it developed in the course of the winter may be gathered from two figures. In March 1943 the number of divisions at the disposal of Southern, formerly Don, Army Group on the 435 mile front from the Sea of Azov to north of Kharkov was 32. Facing this sector, either in or behind the line, were 341 enemy formations, consisting of rifle divisions, armored or mechanized brigades, and cavalry divisions. Thus, the conditions under which Don Army Group had to fight were constantly governed by two factors. First, an overwhelming superiority of numbers. Even when the Army Group, augmented by the bulk of 1st Panzer Army and new forces supplied by OKH, consisted of three, and later four, German armies, the ratio of German to enemy forces was still one, seven, this allows for the numerical inferiority of certain Russian formations when compared to German divisions. Secondly, there was a strategic danger inherent in the fact that an enemy who was stronger than ourselves, and who for a time enjoyed complete freedom of action following the collapse of the Allied armies, had shorter distances to travel to the lifelines of the German southern wing Rostov and the Dnieper crossings than we had taken in conjunction with one another. These two factors implied a danger that the southern wing, once cut off from its supplies, would be pushed back against the coast of the Sea of Azov or Black Sea and ultimately destroyed, 
as the Soviet Black Sea Fleet was just as capable as ever of imposing a blockade. After the destruction of Don Army Group and Army Group A, however, the fate of the entire Eastern Front would have been sealed sooner or later. Key notes of operational policy be virtue of the initial strategic situation outlined above. The whole battle on the southern wing in the winter of 1942-3 and it was destined to be the battle in the east that winter boiled down to the same question on both sides. Would the Soviets succeed in trapping the German southern wing, thereby accomplishing the decisive step towards their final victory, or would the German command be able to avert such a catastrophe? The operational plan for the Russians to adopt was obvious enough. It had been offered them on a silver platter when the German Supreme Command allowed the front to petrify in the final phase of the summer offensive. Nothing was more natural than that the Soviets should first seize their chance to trap Sixth Army as it lay bunched around Stalingrad. In the further course of operations, the enemy was to be expected to cash in on his knockout successes in the Romanian, Italian, and Hungarian sectors and to try by striking again and again in ever-increasing strength and scope, to outflank the German southern wing to the north and west. His object had to be to amputate this wing from its communications zones and ultimately to box it in on the sea coast. It was a strategic concept which derived every possible encouragement from the situation in which the German southern wing had been left for far too long by the supreme command. On the German side there was the much harder problem of deciding how to escape from the danger in which we had been landed by our own omissions and the enemy's first unexpected successes on both sides of Stalingrad. In view of the overall strategic situation, however, our supreme command should have realized from the first day of the enemy attack how things would develop and, in particular, how dangerously exposed was army group in the Caucasus. Broadly speaking, the German supreme command had to choose between two courses. The first would have been to disengage 6th Army from the Volga immediately after it had begun to be attacked and before it could be tightly surrounded and then to try to restore the situation in the large bend of the Don with the help of strong reinforcements. At the same time it would have been necessary to shore up the Allied-occupied Don sectors with German forces. Obviously, however, the Supreme Command neither had the necessary troops available for this solution nor could it, in view of the low capacity of the few existing railways, have brought them up in time. To take 6th Army away from Stalingrad was something it could not make up its mind to do. Indeed, not many weeks after the start of the Soviet offensive it was clear that the army was to be lost for good and that the best it could do within the framework of the operation as a whole was to tie down the largest possible body of forces for the longest possible period. It was a task which the gallant army fulfilled till the end and for which it ultimately sacrificed itself. Nevertheless, even after events had taken such an ominous turn as a result of the obstinate way in which Hitler clung to Stalingrad, and after all hope of extricating Sixth Army had proved illusory, there was still a second course open to the Supreme Command. At the cost of surrendering the territory won in the summer campaign, which could not be held anyway, a grave crisis could have been turned into victory. To this end it would have been necessary to withdraw the forces of Don Army Group and Army Group from the front's eastward protuberance according to fixed timings, taking them first behind the lower Don or Dunitz and subsequently to the lower Dnieper. In the meantime, any forces that could possibly be made available including those divisions of either Army Group which became disengaged through the shortening of the front would have had to be concentrated, let us say, somewhere around Kharkov. On them would have devolved the task of driving into the flank of the enemy as he pursued the retiring army groups or attempted to cut them off from the Dnieper crossings. In other words, the idea would have been to convert a large scale withdrawal into an envelopment operation with the aim of pushing our pursuer back against the sea and destroying him. The Dot Don Army Group proposed this solution to OKH when there was no longer any prospect of relieving 6th Army, and as soon as it became plain that Army Group A's position in the Caucasus was untenable and that the enemy breakthrough on the Italian front threatened to cut off the entire southern wing. But Hitler was not the man to embark on a course which in 
initially committed him to relinquish the conquests of summer 1942 and would unquestionably have entailed considerable operational hazards. Such a step was entirely out of keeping with the personality I have already analyzed in the chapter on Hitler as a supreme commander. With his lack of experience in operational matters, he may even then have hoped to restore the situation on the southern wing by throwing in the SS Panzer Corps which was moving up to Kharkov. As far as Don Army Group headquarters was concerned, the first of the above mentioned courses had already been ruled out before it arrived on the scene, for by that time 6th Army had been completely surrounded. Neither the battered remnants handed over to us as Don Army Group, nor the thin trickle of reinforcements we were getting, could possibly suffice to fight a battle in the large bend of the Don with any prospect of success, even less so after the reinforcements had been held up in Army Group B's sector following the defeat of the Italian Army. As for the second course, that of turning a large-scale withdrawal operation into a counterblow against the enemy's northern flank as he inevitably exposed this in the course of his pursuit, Don Army Group lacked the absolute authority to take it. To do so we should have required power of command over the whole southern wing of the eastern front and freedom to do what we liked with the OKH reserves. Instead, the army group was committed to deal in turn with the tasks which presented themselves in its allotted sphere of command. It had to devise one stopgap after another to meet a danger which arose from the original strategic situation and grew increasingly acute as time went on the danger that the entire southern wing would be tied off. The first task confronting the army group was the relief of 6th Army. Initially this had to take precedence over all other operational considerations. Once this task had proved insoluble for the reasons already related in the chapter on Stalingrad, the army group had to tackle the problem of preventing the even greater catastrophe of the loss of the whole southern wing. As the forces still available as reserves to OKH were not enough to keep the southern wing's lines of communication over the lower Don and Dnieper open, the only course left to us was to gather in the eastern wing of the army group and throw the forces thus released over to the western wing. Everything depended, then, on our always thinking far enough ahead to switch forces from our eastern to our western wing in time to intercept the enemy's outflanking movements as they gradually extended further and further west. It was a task rendered all the more difficult by the fact that the neighboring formation in the north, Army Group B, was slowly but surely disappearing from sight as a result of the loss of the Allied armies. On the other hand, it was not possible to shift forces to the western wing in sufficient numbers without calling on forces from Army Group A, which was not under Don Army Group's orders. Though conceived on a larger scale and extending over a longer period, it was the same task that had confronted General Paulus at Stalingrad between 19th and 23rd November. This time, too, it was a matter of moving forces promptly and regardless of local repercussions to the places on which the survival of our rear communications depended and simultaneously of maintaining our operational mobility. The only difference was that in General Paulus's case the decision had been compressed into a few days, or perhaps even hours, and that he could count on no reinforcements whatever to begin with. In our own case, However, this idea was to govern our whole approach to operations and involve us in months of conflict with the Supreme Command. In essence, the idea of leapfrogging from east to west to parry the enemy's attempts to tie off the southern wing was an extremely simple one. In war, however, it is so often the simple things which prove hardest to carry out, the real difficulties lying not so much in the taking of a decision as in its unswerving execution. In the present instance any withdrawal of forces from the eastern wing was bound to create a danger there which no one could be sure of surviving. Above all, if these shifts of forces were to have a timely effect, they must be initiated some time if not several weeks before the danger of being cut off had become so acute as to be acknowledged by Hitler. Last but not least, developments in Army Group A's sector, as will be seen later long prevented us from putting the leapfrog plan into practice. And so, simple and self-evident though it was, this basic approach of ours proved difficult to implement consistently in the face of the increasing gravity of the situation.
The same difficulty was experienced in getting it accepted by the Supreme Command at least in time for it to have any useful effect since the latter's views were diametrically opposed to our own. Hitler persisted in the principle of holding rigidly onto his gains, whereas we considered operational mobility at which our operations staffs and fighting troops hid the advantage of the enemy to be the real key to victory. The situation which confronted it at the time of its takeover, combined with the restrictions imposed on it by the Supreme Command and its far-reaching dependence on the actions and attitudes of the neighboring army groups, led Don Army Group to adopt a system of stop gaps without, at the same time, ever sacrificing the basic formula. In the light of the foregoing, Don, later Southern, Army Group's winter campaign of 1942-3 may be broken down into four successive phases, the first was the struggle for the relief of Sixth Army, on which the Army Group staked everything it could possibly afford. The second phase was the Army Group's struggle to keep the rear of Army Group a free while it was being disengaged from the Caucasus Front. The third phase consisted in the actual battle to keep open the lines of communication of the German Army's southern wing and to prevent it from being tied off. This led to the final fourth phase in which the army group succeeded if on a smaller scale than it would have liked in delivering the counter blow culminating in the battle of Kharkov. First phase, the struggle to free 6th army the attempt to relieve 6th army, or rather to enable it to break out of the Stalingrad pocket, has already been recounted. In an all-out effort to make this attempt succeed, Don army group went to the very limits of what could be risked. Right up to the time when the fate of 6th Army was sealed, that is the end of December 1942, it endeavored to manage with a minimum of forces in the center and on the left of the Army Group front, which only amounted to a thin protective screen as it was. Its object was to delay any decisive developments in these sectors until 4th Panzer Army's battle east of the Don had successfully opened up the beleaguered army's way to freedom. Only after all hope of linking up 4th Panzer and 6th Armies had had to be abandoned, and the simultaneous defeat of the Italian army had laid bare Don Army Group's western flank and thrown open the enemy's road to Rostov. Did the army group concede precedence to the problem of maintaining the whole southern wing of the eastern front? All that remains for me to do in this context is to give a brief account of how Don Army Group's situation came to deteriorate as a result, on one hand, of Sixth Army's decision not to attempt the breakout and, on the other, of the way things developed on the right wing of Army Group B, the Italian Army. The difficult position in which 4th Panzer Army had landed on the eastern wing of the army group as the enemy threw in increasingly strong forces from the Stalingrad siege front to meet it has already been indicated. In the battles between the Uxai and Kotlnikovo, as well as in the fighting for the latter as a springboard for 4th Panzer Army's relief offensive. 57 Panzer Corps suffered considerable losses after being left alone on the battlefield by the Romanians. 23 Panzer Division, which had been severely weakened before this, was particularly badly hit. The non-appearance of reinforcements from Army Group made it unlikely that 4th Panzer Army would even hold its own sufficiently to prevent the enemy from swinging strong forces into the rear of 1st Panzer Army. The trend of events on the rest of the Army Group front was not a whit less serious. In what had been the sector of 3rd Romanian Army, the fact that 4th Panzer Army was falling back east of the Don enabled the enemy to cross the ice-covered river around Potemkinskaya and a little later at Tsarmalianskaya, and to threaten the Chur positions in the flank and rear. On this front, General Mayeth had meanwhile assumed command in place of 3rd Romanian Army headquarters. Since the Russians were coming over the Don from the east and south, we had no choice initially but to order the Mayeth group to make a fighting withdrawal behind the Kogelnik. On the left wing of the army group the position looked even more critical. Admittedly Army Detachment Hollett had succeeded, notwithstanding the loss of the Romanian divisions, in bringing its forces back southwards from the Upper Chur. Without any justification, however, a newly arrived, 
recently formed division which was to have taken over the defense of the army detachment's flank on the Bystre and Ilea gave up the crossing point at Milyutinsky. This opened the enemy's way into Holitz flank and also to the important airbase at Morosowski. Far more serious still was the fact that, thanks to the disintegration of the Italian army and the almost complete elimination of the Romanians from the battle, one and two Romanian corps on what had been the left wing of army detachment Holit. The enemy was able to make for the Don crossings of Forchstadt, Kamensk and Voroshilovgrad almost unopposed. Only at Malarovo, where the newly formed Fretapico group on the right wing of Army Group B stood like a solitary island amid the Red Flood, was any resistance being offered. In any case, the enemy was free to wheel east into the rear of Army Detachment Hollet or the Myeth Group, or alternatively to keep heading south to Rostov. Don Army Group's situation was serious enough, therefore, had it been acting quite independently, the only correct way to solve the crisis would have been to put the leapfrog principle into effect forthwith, regardless of any other considerations. Fourth Panzer Army could have been pulled back to Rostov in one single movement and thereafter used to fight off the threat to the army group's left flank and its communications to the west. The forces of the Myeth Group and Army Detachment Hollitz still in action in the large bend of the Don would have had to come back to the Donitz. The objection to this solution lay in the fact that Army Group was still lodged as firmly as ever in its positions in the Caucasus. To expose its rear by shifting Don Army Group's forces over to the western wing was out of the question. On the contrary, it was Don Army Group's duty not only to cover the rear of Army Group A, but also to keep open its lines of communication through Rostov. For the time being, then, the idea of basing the army group's operations on the principle of switching their main effort westwards to balk the enemy's attempts to cut off the whole wing of the German armies could still not take effect. During the first few weeks after the takeover, indeed, the army group had deliberately shelved it in the interest of Sixth Army. Now in the second phase it found itself compelled, in spite of the steadily growing threat to its western flank, to embark on a desperate struggle to keep the rear of Army Group A free. Second phase, the fight to keep Army Group A's rear free the German Supreme Command should really have been aware from the start that Army Group A could not stay in the Caucasus if the battle to free Sixth Army did not immediately succeed in other words, if there were no clear possibility of somehow establishing a reasonably secure situation within the large bend of the Don. But when the enemy tore a gap on the right wing of Army Group B which opened his way to Rostov, it should have been palpably evident to anyone that there could no longer be any question of holding the Caucasus front. Unless, of course, Hitler had been able or willing to bring in large bodies of troops from other theaters. As early as 20th December, the day when the flight of two Italian divisions had exposed the flank of Army Detachment Hollett and cleared the Russians' way to the Donitz crossings, I had pointed out to General Zietzela that by advancing in the direction of Rostov the enemy would now have his chance to strike the decisive blow against the whole of the German southern wing. On 24 December I had again drawn attention to the fact that it was now no longer the fate of Don Army Group alone that was at stake but of Army Group as well. I have already mentioned the rejection of my demand for the release of forces from Army Group to Rostov and 4th Panzer Army. Even if one no longer envisaged renewing the attempt to extend a rescuing hand to 6th Army, it was still in Army Group A's interest that 4th Panzer Army should be reinforced, since its defeat would have given the enemy access to the Army Group's rear. Since Army Group A quite understandably did not want to hand any units over, it was the business of the Supreme Command to order the equalization of forces so urgently needed between the two Army Groups. One possible reason for Army Group A's refusal to let us have the divisions we asked for, see the chapter on Stalingrad, may well have been the quite perplexing degree to which its formations and units had been shuffled around and intermingled with one another. Undoubtedly the disengagement of the larger ones would have been a difficult and at best time-consuming task. This state of affairs was in part the inevitable outcome of a need in the absence of adequate reserves to patch up the gaps caused by enemy penetrations. However, 
it was also due in equal measure to the army groups having for months on end been without a commander of its own to keep things in order. At the best of times, many military commanders are unable to appreciate that units must be left in their normal order of battle if one is to achieve maximum efficiency and preserve maneuverability. When, as in this case, there was no responsible commander whatever for a considerable period, it was hardly surprising if the troops became disorganized. In response to the insistence of Don Army Group, Hitler finally decided on 29 December to order the withdrawal of the eastern and most exposed wing of Army Group A, 1st Panzer Army, to the Kima sector of Pyatigusk Praskovia. Yet he still had no intention of giving up the Caucasus Front as a whole. Evidently he still hoped that by bending back Army Group A's eastern wing to the Kima he would be able to pivot it upon the Manich Flats, thereby stabilizing the situation between the Manich and Don and simultaneously keeping the communications of the southern wing open across the lower Dnieper. Thus the balcony which had been formed in November by pushing the front out into the Caucasus and up to the Volga and which had led to the unfavorable situation we were in at present was not to be eliminated but merely reduced in size. Where, on the other hand, the forces were to be found to compensate for the loss of the Romanian and Italian armies and before very long the Hungarian one as well remained a complete mystery. This, in due course, was what caused the remainder of the Caucasus front to be abandoned. In this second phase of its struggle Don Army Group was confronted with the following tasks instead of acting as the situation really demanded and radically shifting the main point of effort to its western wing to remove the danger of being cut off, the Army Group was compelled, in the face of a mounting crisis, to fight for time. South of the Lower Don, it had to protect Army Group A's rear and at the same time to keep its communications through Rostov open. It was a dual commitment with which the weak forces of 4th Panzer Army were unlikely to cope in view of the wide expanse of territory they had to control between the Caucasus and Don and the strength of the enemy operating the dot in the large bend of the Don and forwards of the Don it's it was the job of Army Detachment Holid to retard the enemy's advance north of the Lower Don to such an extent that he could not cut off 4th Panzer Army, and with it Army Group A, by a swift thrust on Rostov from the east. In addition, it had to prevent the enemy from crossing the Dunitz line Forchstadt came and Skvoroshilovgrad and thereby deny him access to Rostov from the north. Finally, the army group had to find ways and means of keeping open the lines of communication running to the lower Dnieper in the west, either with its own resources or else with the assistance of what meager reserves OKH was able to send us. All this had to be done with troops who had long been subjected to overstrain and were faced by an enemy many times stronger than themselves. Difficult though this task, or series of tasks, was in itself. The paramount danger lay in Army Group A's inability to disengage swiftly from the Caucasus. It was just one more example of the hardening up process which inevitably sets in whenever mobile operations degenerate into static warfare if only for the sake of economizing one's forces, immovable weapons have to be dug in and rations and ammunition accumulated. Various facilities are installed to ease the lot of the troops a particularly important measure when a shortage of reserves prevents them from being taken out to rest. As the horses cannot usually be fed in a static battle zone, they have to be accommodated further back, and this in turn tends to immobilize the fighting units. The state of the roads during a Russian winter, particularly in mountainous country, only added to these difficulties. The upshot is always that troops and formation staffs lose the knack of quickly adapting themselves to the changes of situation which daily occur in the war of movement. Inertia and stagnation gain the upper hand, for every change involves difficult reliefs, movement of forces, inconveniences and often danger. The inevitable process of accumulating weapons, equipment and stores of all kinds ties down assets which one feels unable to do without for the rest of the war. The result is that when the command staff in question is faced with the necessity of a major withdrawal, it begins by asking for a long period of grace in which to prepare for the evacuation. It may even reject the idea of a withdrawal out of hand because of the equipment and stores it has come to regard as indispensable. 
It will be remembered that when the German offensive came to a standstill in 1918, even such a notable commander as Ludendorff could not bring himself, by a boldly conceived withdrawal, to precipitate the war of movement in which Germany's last hope of victory then lay. In the final analysis he felt unable to write off all the materiel committed on and behind the German front, or else could not make up his mind to abandon territory which it had cost such sacrifices to win. The situation on Army Group A's front was a similar one. A talk with the Chief of Staff of 1st Panzer Army revealed that this formation could not begin moving back until 2nd January, but after we had helped out with petrol it was finally able to start on New Year's Day. Even then, Army Group announced a few days later that 1st Panzer Army would have to fall back onto the Kuma line sector by sector in the interest of getting equipment out and evacuating the wounded from the mountain resorts in the Caucasus. For these purposes, it was stated, the Army would require 155 trains, 20 per division, and would not, on account of the low rail capacities be in position along the Kuma line for another 25 days. So although it should have been realized since the end of November that at least the rear of Army Grouper would be endangered sooner or later, it was obvious that nothing had been done to prepare for an evacuation. One reason for the omission was undoubtedly that Hitler had forbidden such preparations or was expected to do so if he learnt of them. But an equally important one, I am sure was the army group's lack of a responsible commander in recent months. O.K.H. had been considering the idea of placing Army Group A, which had now been taken over by Colonel General V. Klest, under my command. Generally speaking, it is not a good thing to put an army group or army under a headquarters of equal status. In the present critical situation, however, this would probably have had its advantages provided, of course, that no strings were attached. Any possibility of interference by Hitler or of Army Group A's invoking his decisions in opposition to my own had to be expressly barred. Hitler, however, was unwilling to accept my conditions, and Army Group A consequently remained autonomous. All that Don Army Group could do was to keep on pressing for a speed up of Army Group A's evacuation measures with a view to effecting the earliest possible release of the forces whose intervention south of the Don and later on the western wing of Don Army Group would be of decisive importance. Everything depended on cutting down this second phase of the winter campaign to the utmost in order to get the position on the German southern wing finally stabilized. The only hope of doing so lay in smashing the enemy forces which were trying to envelop that wing to the west. In the event, it did prove possible to get the deadlines for the Caucasus evacuation considerably curtailed. The hindrances mentioned above were due partly to what appeared to be the inevitable outcome of static warfare conditions and the difficulties encountered in a mountainous theatre, and partly to the Supreme Command's aversion to surrendering anything voluntarily. The fact that they committed Don Army Group to a battle in the Don area lasting from the end of December to early February was bound in view of what was happening to Army Group B to intensify the danger that the whole southern wing would be cut off. It would hardly be possible to find a better illustration of Moltke's definition of strategy than in this battle fought by the two armies of Don Army Group. The reason why we succeeded despite a series of crises, in mastering the tasks already outlined is that the army and army group staffs adhered firmly to two well-established German principles of leadership, I, always conduct operations elastically and resourcefully, to, give every possible scope to the initiative and self-sufficiency of commanders at all levels. Both principles, admittedly, were greatly at variance with Hitler's own way of thinking, while the first will find expression in the account of the battle fought by our two armies, I should like to say a few words on the second one now. It has always been the particular forte of German leadership to grant wide scope to the self dependence of subordinate commanders to allot them tasks which leave the method of execution to the discretion of the individual. From time immemorial, certainly since the Elder Moltke's day, this principle has distinguished Germany's military leadership from that of other armies. The latter, far from giving the same latitude to subordinate commanders on the tactical plane, have always tended to prescribe, by means of long and detailed directives, 
the way orders should actually be carried out or to make tactical action conform to a specific pattern. On the German side this system was considered a bad one. It would, admittedly, appear to reduce the risk of failure in the case of mediocre commander. Yet it only too easily leads to the executants having to act against the exigencies of the local situation. Worst of all, in its preoccupation with security it waves the opportunity that may occur through the independent action of a subordinate commander in boldly exploiting some favorable situation at a decisive moment. The German method is really rooted in the German character, which contrary to all the nonsense talked about blind obedience has a strong streak of individuality and possibly as part of its Germanic heritage finds a certain pleasure in taking risks. The granting of such independence to subordinate commanders does, of course, presuppose that all members of the military hierarchy are imbued with certain tactical or operational axioms. Only the school of the German general staff can, I suppose, be said to have produced such a consistency of outlook. Nevertheless, there are plenty of occasions when the senior commander in the field is faced with the problem of whether or not to take a hand in the operations of the armies or other formations under his command. The more complex the situation and the smaller the forces with which he has to manage, the more often is he tempted to meddle in the business of his subordinates. As far as my own headquarters was concerned, I think I can say that we only intervened in the operations of our armies when it was quite imperative to do so. This was particularly true whenever the army group's operational intentions involved the assumption of responsibilities which it would have been unreasonable to expect the army headquarters in question to accept. On the other hand, we refrained on principle from proffering off their record advice, which kills all initiative and hides responsibility. That Hitler showed little understanding for the old established German principle of leadership and repeatedly sought to meddle in the operations of subordinate headquarters by issuing specific orders of his own has already been mentioned earlier on. Nothing could be done about such orders when they related to the movements of adjacent army groups or the action to be taken with formations which were still OKH reserves. However, in the many cases when they directed that a particular line was to be held to the last man and the last round, the force of circumstances usually proved stronger in the end. Something which has also been discussed already and was even harder to overcome was Hitler's dilatoriness in the taking of urgently needed decisions. We could not, after all, compel him to give an order. In such cases, one had no choice but to report that in default of an OKH directive by such and such a time or such and such a day, we should act at our own discretion. In contrast to the above, I doubt very much whether any of the armies under our command during this or any later campaign ever had reason to complain that we were slow to take decisions. Whenever they put an inquiry or recommendation up to my headquarters, they always received an immediate reply. Only in difficult situations did the army group ever delay a decision for a very limited period at most for a few hours or until the following morning. On the whole apart from Stalingrad. The army group always managed in the end to get the requisite action taken in the face of Hitler's interference or procrastination. Fourth Panzer Army's battles south of the Lower Don. Fifth Panzer Army had two different tasks to fulfill if it was to keep the rear of army group free. It had to prevent the enemy now on its heels from moving in against the rear of First Panzer Army until such time as the latter had wheeled back from the Caucasus onto a front facing east. At the same time, it had to ensure that the enemy did not thrust down the lower reaches of the Don to Rostov and cut off both 4th Panzer Army and Army Grouper from their communications zones. It was clear that the army had not enough forces to deny the enemy the whole area between the lower course of the Don and the northern spurs of the Caucasus. Since the loss of the Romanians all it had up around Kotelnikovo was 57 Panzer Corps consisting only of two seriously weakened divisions, 17 and 23 Panzer. 15 Luftwaffe Field Division was still not ready to go into action, and 16 Motorized Division had still not been relieved at Yalista by forces from Army Group A. All Don Army Group's efforts to get the Army reinforced in good time were unavailing. The provision of three Panzer Corps by Army Group A had already been turned down by OKH. 
and now 7 Panzer Division, which Don Army Group had intended to use with 4th Panzer Army, was retained by Hitler at Rostov to cover this crossing point to the north following the collapse of the Italian Army. In essence this was not a bad idea, except that the infantry division we had requested from Army Group A, that is from 17th Army, would have done just as well. But this, as I have said, Hitler had refused to let us have because he feared that its withdrawal from the Novorossiysk sector would cause the Romanian divisions that to give way. An acute threat materialized in the rear of 1st Panzer Army when strong elements of the enemy which had been following 4th Panzer Army turned south against 1st Panzer Army just as it was swinging backwards. Although 16 motorized division was able to launch a successful attack and bar the way to the enemy from behind the Manich, it was delayed still further from taking part in the struggle of 4th Panzer Army, which it now did not join until the middle of January. A measure which the army group had intended taking in its own area to reinforce 4th Panzer Army was thwarted by the enemy. We had envisaged bringing 11 Panzer Division out of the large bend of the Don to join the army. Just when it was about to come over the lower Don, however, the enemy himself crossed the river at two different places to drive from the south and southeast into the rear of the Mayeth group, which was still holding the lower Cha on the front facing north. To parry this thrust and to enable the Mayeth group to swing back into a front facing east behind the Kogilnik, 11 Panzer Division had to be committed north of the Don and was lost to 4th Panzer Army in consequence. In the end, therefore, the only forces to augment the two above named armored divisions of 57 Panzer Corps were the Viking SS Division, which had already been released earlier by Army Group A, and in mid January 16th Motorized Division. By this time, 4th Panzer Army was under pressure through Kotelnikovo from two Soviet armies. 2nd Guards and 51st, which between them comprised one tank, three mechanized, three rifle and one cavalry corps. Shortly afterwards a 3rd Army, 28th, made its appearance further south from the Karmic steppes. It could safely be assumed that these three armies were bent not merely on tying down 4th Panzer Army from the front, but ultimately on bypassing it to the north and south in order to encircle it completely. If Hitler thought he could order US, in the face of that preponderance of forces and with such an expanse of territory to cover, to make the army hold some line or other, or else to obtain his approval before undertaking any withdrawal, he was seriously mistaken. As an obstacle, a hard and fast line was likely to prove about as effective as a cobweb in 4th Panzer Army's situation. Nonetheless, he still made repeated attempts to restrict our operational freedom by orders of this kind and stuck to his refusal to reinforce 4th Panzer Army. By 5th January, therefore, I felt I must ask to be relieved of command of Don Army Group and sent the Chief of the General Staff a teleprinter message which stated inter alia should these proposals not be approved and this headquarters continue to be tied down to the same extent as hitherto. I cannot see that any useful purpose will be served by my continuing as commander of Don Army Group. In the circumstances it would appear more appropriate to replace me by a sub-directorate of the kind maintained by the Quartermaster General. The Quartermaster General's sub-directorates at Army Groups were headed by older staff officers who ran their formations supply and transport services in accordance with direct instructions from the Central Directorate. As things now stood. 4th Panzer Army's object was not to offer inadequate resistance along an overextended line, but to keep its forces close together. Only thus could it offer strong opposition at vital spots or deal the enemy a surprise blow whenever an opportunity presented itself. At times it would obviously have to denude parts of its area completely and be content to cover others with only a flimsy defense screen. Colonel General Hoth, supported by his admirable Chief of Staff, General Fanger, went about this difficult task with a calm resolution matched only by the versatility of his leadership. He skillfully retarded the progress of the enemy pressing hard on his front without exposing himself to danger by holding any one position too long. Furthermore, by rapidly assembling forces on both his wings, he repeatedly dealt the enemy sharp jabs which foiled every attempt to outflank him. Though unable to let the army have sufficient forces to discharge its difficult task, 
the army group did reserve the right to relieve it of responsibility for at least its most intricate problem by the issue of specific orders. As I have said, 4th Panzer Army actually had to deal with two tasks at once. It had to prevent any of the three enemy armies following it from taking 1st Panzer Army in the rear before the latter had completed its swing back from the Caucasus onto a front facing east and was ready to look after its own defense. At the same time it had to counter any attempt by the enemy to drive on Rostov along the lower arm of the Don. If this was successful, the three armies fighting south of the Lower Don would be cut off. Fourth Panzer Army was only capable of solving one of these tasks at most. Which of them should have priority was a matter that only the army group could decide. Admittedly, the threat to Rostov was the greater danger in the long run. Yet, should the enemy succeed in encircling First Panzer Army as it wheeled back into its new position? There could be no further point even in holding Rostov, and the three German armies south of the Don would be doomed. If, on the other hand, the withdrawal of First Panzer Army was successfully accomplished, ways and means would be found to avert a crisis at Rostov. The enemy did try to exploit the two opportunities indicated above. It has already been mentioned that 16 motorized division had just been in time to intercept the Soviet elements which had turned off to take 1st Panzer Army in the rear. Yet, with the same operational aim in view, the enemy made repeated attempts to envelop 4th Panzer Army to the south and thereby to introduce himself between the latter and 1st Panzer Army. At the same time he endeavored to drive along the lower Don through Konstantinovka in the direction of Rostov. On 7 January a smallish enemy force turned up on the northern bank of the Don some 12 miles from the army group headquarters location at Novokukarsk, after the Cossacks and frontier troops guarding that stretch of river had given way. We had to dislodge this domestic invader with a few tanks fetched out of workshops for the purpose. Subsequently the tank corps of which this enemy force formed part was turned off towards Proletarskaya in the rear of 4th Panzer Army, which meant that we were rid of the threat to Rostov for at least the next few days. 4th Panzer Army, for its own part, was duly able to cope with this threat on its northern flank. By 14th January 1st Panzer Army had completed its withdrawal movement, having been able to speed it up after all in the meantime. It now had its left wing established on a line running from Chikarsk to Petrovsko. This meant that at least a measure of operational cooperation was now possible between 1st and 4th Panzer armies, even if a wide gap still yawned between Petrovsko and Proletarskaya. This, admittedly, was partly covered by the mud flats of the Manich. The first part of 4th Panzer Army's task which had been to keep the rear of army group free in the area south of the Don, was thus fulfilled. There still remained the second part that of holding open this army group's lines of communication through Rostov. In the face of the enemy's many times greater strength, the accomplishment of the second part was complicated by the fact that 1st Panzer Army was initially to remain several days in the line it had reached in order to prepare the further evacuation of its rear areas. Indeed, 4th Panzer Army's task was to come dangerously near to not being fulfilled at all, for even now Hitler could still not make up his mind to abandon the Caucasus entirely. The question of whether 1st Panzer Army was to be pulled back onto the northern bank of the Don or whether the whole of Army Group should remain in the Cuban still hung in the balance. The battles of Army Detachment Holland while 4th Panzer Army was carrying out its task south of the Don during the first half of January. Army Detachment Hollett had a no less difficult job to do in the large bend of river. As was stated in the chapter on Stalingrad, the enemy had spent the past few weeks making repeated attacks in infinitely superior strength on the Army Detachment's front along the Chidot at General Hollett's disposal, on a front extending some 125 miles from the Don and Nizanchurskaya as far as Kamenskshiktinsky, where and this included the Mayeth Group now under command, 4 infantry divisions, 62, 294, 336 and 387, which had already been very badly worn down in the fighting to date. 
Also helping to hold the front were some alarm units and a valuable buttress, these anti-aircraft units commanded by the seasoned General Stahl. As for the army detachments two Luftwaffe field divisions, what little was left of them inevitably had to be incorporated into army formations. The main strength of the army detachment was constituted by 6 and 11 Panzer divisions, augmented by the newly arrived 7 Panzer. The badly battered 22 Panzer division had to be disbanded. With these forces General Hollett had to prevent the enemy in the north from moving down on the lower reaches of the Don, that is into the rear of 4th Panzer Army, and most important of all from breaking through to Rostov for as long as 4th Panzer Army and Army Group were in the area south of the Don. Furthermore, it was the army detachment's job to see that the enemy opposite its left wing did not push through to the Donitz crossings between Fortstadt and Vorosilovgrad, thereby opening the way to Rostov from the northwest. At the same time, however, the army detachment found itself threatened on both flanks in the west as a result of the disappearance from the battlefield of the Italians, in whose place the Freta Pico group was slowly fighting its way back from the Malarova region towards the Dunitz, and in the east because several enemy army corps now had crossed the Don, first at Potemkinskaya and then at Simelianskaya. They could only be stopped, as was noted earlier by throwing in N Panzer Division and bending the Mayeth group back onto a front facing east from behind the Kigelnik dot like 4th Panzer Army, Army Detachment Hollett reflected firm yet versatile leadership in mastering its task amid heavy fighting and incessant crises. Here, too, however, the Army Group assumed ultimate responsibility by ordering it, at great, if not immediate, risk to the spots thus laid bare. To bunch its armor together for short offensive thrusts. The fact that the army detachment succeeded in finally halting the enemy on the Dunitz, and thereby in saving 4th Panzer Army and Army Grouper from being cut off south of the Don, must be ascribed first and foremost while not forgetting the way its staff handled operations to the bravery with which the infantry divisions and all other formations and units helping to hold the line stood their ground against the enemy's recurrent attacks. Yet their defense could never have been maintained had not our armored divisions time and again shown up at danger spots at just the right moment. On one hand they intervened to ward off the impending encirclement of the army detachment's right wing as it wheeled back onto the Kigelnik and later to intercept a threatened breakthrough in that sector. On the other, they surprised the enemy by driving straight into his assembly positions as he was about to attack the army detachment's northern front forward of the Dunitz. While it was the business of the army detachment itself to mount such close counterblows as part of its defensive role, the actual responsibility for risking them usually lay with the army group. The latter had to relieve the army detachment of responsibility for any emergencies which might arise whenever, on army group instructions, it concentrated its armor in one spot and thereby imperiled the remaining sectors of the front. Third phase, the struggle to keep the southern wing's communications open operational position at mid-January 1943 by the middle of January 1943 the operational situation on the southern wing of the eastern front had come to a head. Its seeds had been laid in the late autumn of 1942, when our military command had allowed the front to solidify into a line which was operationally untenable from a long-term point of view. What had clearly been shaping up since Christmas week 1942, when the last opportunity for 6th Army to break out was missed, had now come to pass. Only the desperate struggle waged by the German fighting troops and command staffs had so far staved off an even worse crisis. 6th Army was doomed. The best it could do now, with what little strength it still possessed, was to render its comrades in the Don Bend and the Caucasus the last supreme service of tying down strong enemy forces for just a short while longer. It was clear that after the loss of Sixth Army, the Caucasus region could not even be held on a reduced scale. Now, however, thanks to the doggedness and dexterity with which Fourth Panzer Army had been fighting in the area south of the Don, there was at least a chance that when the Caucasus went, Army Grouper need not be lost with it. Its eastern wing, which had been in the greatest danger of all, was now safely retracted. 
and even though 1st Panzer Army was still 190 miles from the river crossing at Rostov, it was nonetheless out of the mountains and no longer threatened from the rear. If things came to the worst, it could fight its own way back from now on. In the area between the Don and Dunitz, it had so far been possible to deny the enemy access to Rostov and prevent him from closing the trap from the north behind the three armies standing south of the lower arm of the Don. But it was evident that neither Army Detachment Hollett nor the Freta Pico group, now fighting around Milarovo and consisting of HQ. 30 Corps with 3 Mountain and 304 Infantry Divisions under command, could prevent the enemy from crossing the Dunitz upstream from kamensk Shiktinsky once he was strong enough to reach so far round to the west. From then on he would be at liberty to drive on Rostov from the northwest or straight down to the Sea of Azov. Worst of all, about this time the Army Group B sector held by the Hungarian Army on the Middle Don collapsed before a fresh enemy offensive. The connecting front in the north was also caught up in the disaster. Army Group B wanted to take its forces back behind the Adar as far up as Starobilsk, which meant leaving open the Dunitz downstream from Voroshilovgrad. For all practical purposes, however, this wing of the Army Group was to cease to exist within a few days. A wide gap opened up from Voroshilovgrad to the north in which only isolated German battle groups of Army Group B were offering desperate local resistance. The Hungarians like the Italians had disappeared from the battlefield. It seemed certain that OKH could not help to plug this hole with the reserves now on the way. In any case, as far as Don Army Group was concerned, the time had obviously come to leapfrog strong forces from the area south of the Don to the Middle Dunitz if the enemy were to be prevented from tying off Don Army Group and Army Group A. The German Supreme Command still did not agree, however. Either it was unable to foresee what turn events would inevitably take if nothing effective were done to make us strong in the crucial area between the Dunitz and Lower Dnieper or it simply would not see the dangers of the situation. Hitler was still not disposed to give up the Caucasus region. He still thought he could somehow maintain a front south of the Don which would at least safeguard his possession of the Mayikop oil fields. His minimum requirement was the retention of an extensive bridgehead in the Cuban from which he proposed at a later date to renew his grab for the Caucasus oil. And so, in the weeks that followed, our army group was compelled to continue its desperate struggle on both sides of the Don in the interest of a systematic withdrawal of army group. All this time it was having a fierce dispute with the Supreme Command over the idea of leapfrogging forces to the Dunitz area. This concerned not only the acceptability of the principle as such but also the question as to how many of Army Group A's forces should be brought back through Rostov to the decisive battleground. To tie up substantial elements of Army Group in a Cuban bridgehead amounted, in our opinion, to sheer wishful thinking from the point of view of operations as a whole. The battles in the second half of January b 14 January, the day on which 1st Panzer Army reached the line Chikarsk Petrovsko and established a front facing eastwards, another crisis was brewing in the area of Army Detachment Hollett. On that day, an enemy tank corps succeeded in breaking through towards the Dunitz on the right wing of Army Group B in the area of the Freta Pico group south of Milarovo. Although OKH provided the group with a new infantry division, 302, this alone could not possibly suffice to stabilize the situation on the river. When, on 16 January, OKH placed the Freta Pico group under command of Don Army Group, while simultaneously extending the latter's front to the Adar, it was still not even certain whether the group would get back behind the Dunitz at all. It had meanwhile emerged that the enemy intended to throw three or four mechanized corps against the Dunitz on either side of kamensk shiktinsky in the Fretopico group's own area. Fortunately, thanks to a neat success scored a few days previously by Army Detachment Hollett when two of its armored divisions had struck a surprise blow on the Kalitva. An enemy attack had been wiped out there while still in the preparation stage. We therefore ordered the army detachment to execute its planned withdrawal into the Dunitz positions in such a way as to have an armored division available at the earliest possible moment for mobile defense of the Dunitz sector of Fortstadt Kamensk. 
for operations in the newly acquired Kamenskvoroshilovgrad sector of the river, however, there was nothing to hand except for the Italians who had streamed back there as stragglers. In other words, there was a danger that Don Army Group Stunnett's front would shortly be outflanked to the west. At the same time, it became evident that the enemy intended to envelop Army Detachment Hollett from the east as well. In the gap between its right wing, where the Dunnets joined the Don, and 4th Panzer Army, which was still having to cover 1st Panzer Army's northern flank against a far superior enemy forward of Salsk on the Manich, two enemy corps were identified in the angle between the Sal, Don and Manich. These could be expected to attempt to cross the Don for an advance on Rostov or else to thrust into the rear of Army Detachment Hollett stun its positions. Don Army Group accordingly proposed that it now be allowed to shift 4th Panzer Army over to its western wing, while leaving one division temporarily forward of Rostov to keep the crossing open for 1st Panzer Army. This would naturally have necessitated OKHs issuing simultaneous orders for the withdrawal of Army Group with 1st Panzer Army moving back on Rostov and 17th Army into the Cuban. Once again, it was impossible to get a quick decision from Hitler. Neither would he countenance the Army Group's proposal that Army Group A's armored divisions be concentrated in the area of 4th Panzer Army for a short offensive stroke to facilitate 1st Panzer Army's withdrawal and thereby to speed up the release of 4th Panzer Army. Not until 18th January did OKH finally concede 4th Panzer Army freedom of movement to the extent that the latter no longer had to cover the northern flank of 1st Panzer Army on the Manich northeastwards of Solsk. On the other hand, Don Army Group still had to safeguard Army Group A's use of the Rostov Tykeritz railway line until 88 supply trains had passed safely through to stock up the Cuban bridgehead. Where the 1st Panzer Army would now be withdrawn towards Rostov or into the Cuban was still anybody's guess. The time being taken to decide whether to allow forces to be leapfrogged westwards inside the German southern wing could only benefit the enemy, of course. It enabled him to exploit the collapse of the Italian and Hungarian sectors of Army Group B's front and to assemble powerful forces with which to advance over the Middle Dunnets towards the coast of the Sea of Azov or the Dnieper crossings forces to which, for the moment, we had nothing to offer in the way of opposition. The enemy was also given opportunity to concentrate his formations for a direct assault on Rostov and to envelop Army Detachment Hollett's western wing through Voroshilovgrad. On 20 January, the enemy in the area of 4th Panzer Army launched an attack over the lower Manich towards Rostov with four corps he had concentrated for this purpose. His tanks reached the Rostov airfield. Though 16 Panzer Division, which 4th Panzer Army had thrown over to this northern wing, had been delaying the enemy's progress between the Don and Manich by repeated thrusts into his flank from the southern bank of the latter, it had naturally been unable to halt all four corps on its own. By simultaneously attacking the army's 57 Panzer Corps, which was now gradually falling back on Rostov from the middle Manich, the enemy endeavoured to detain 4th Panzer Army's main forces forward of Rostov until he had possession of the Rostov crossing in their rear. Furthermore, the enemy was hitting hard at the front of Army Detachment Hollett. Here, too, he obviously aimed to pin down our forces until he had encircled them by the capture of Rostov and an envelopment movement across the Middle Dunnets. By launching these attacks against General Myeth's corps in the angle between the Don and Dunitz as well as on either side of Kamensk, he was presumably also trying to prevent the release of any forces from this front which could be thrown against him on the middle Dunitz. Once again the army group's problem was which threat to tackle first. Two armoured divisions, 7 and 11 Panzer were standing by in army detachment Hollett's area to be switched to the western wing on the middle Dunitz. But however great the danger there might become in the long run, the army group felt it was even more urgent at this moment to avert the threat to Rostov. Everything possible had to be done to get not only 4th but at least the whole of 1st Panzer Army back through the city. Otherwise there would not be the slightest prospect of ever assembling sufficient forces on the army group's western wing to counteract the danger of the entire southern wings being surrounded on the sea coasts. For this reason Don Army Group resolved that, in order to prevent the capture of Rostov, 
The two above named armored divisions should in the first instance be used to deliver a sharp blow at the enemy attacking over the lower manage in the direction of the city. However, because of petrol shortage, all the supply trains at that time were going to the Cuban bridgehead by way of Rostov, and the impossibility of obtaining air support for our attack under the prevailing weather conditions, this counter blow took longer to effect than was admissible in the existing situation. For time was pressing more and more. Since 6th Army's resistance was now coming to an end, we had to expect to have most of the enemy's Stalingrad forces about our ears within two or three weeks. I had already told General Zietziller on 22nd January that I should not be surprised to see them turn up in the Star Obiles carrier, that is in the broad gap between Don Army Group and Army Group B. The same day Hitler finally decided that apart, at least, a first Panzer army should not be taken into the Cuban bridgehead, but be brought back through Rostov that is, into what was later to be the decisive battleground. This, though only a compromise solution in our own eyes, was nonetheless welcome in the sense of the army group's own conception of operations. It was, however, of the utmost importance that this withdrawal should be performed at maximum speed, so that 4th Panzer Army, in its turn, could be transferred to the army group's western wing at the earliest possible moment. The rapidity of 1st Panzer Army's withdrawal through Rostov depended entirely on the ability of Army Group A's other components to adapt their speed of movement accordingly. Yet it was clear that even now the Army Group was still, unable to increase its speed to the extent the situation demanded. I have never been able to elicit a satisfactory reason for this. At all events 1st Panzer Army maintained after coming under my command that had it not been repeatedly halted on instructions from above, it could in fact have moved much more smartly from the very start. Both Army Group and OKH disputed this. Whatever the answer, the fact remains that Army Group had so timed the move of its left wing, which was still around Belay Glina, 30 miles east of Tykhuritz on 23rd January, that it would not reach Tykhuritz until 1st February. On 23rd January Don Army Group came into another legacy, this time the southern part of Army Group B's front between the Dunitz and Star Obilsk. As usual, the liabilities far outweighed everything else. They consisted of about 40 extra miles of front and at least three enemy corps now on the advance in that sector one of them armored and the other mechanized. The only asset we acquired now that the Italians could no longer be counted upon was 19 Panzer Division, at that moment located around Star Obilsk. The very next day, however, it was forced to yield Star Obilsk to the enemy. It was an exceptional achievement on the part of this valiant division, so outstandingly led by Lieutenant General Postel, that it was ever able to fight a way through to the west at all. The enemy's action in swinging south across the Dunitz was something it could not prevent. On 24 January, Hitler decided that if possible, the whole of 1st Panzer Army should be withdrawn through Rostov from now on. Since its southern wing was still at our Mafia, this naturally meant tying down 4th Panzer Army south of the Don even longer in order to keep Rostov open. Whether the army could still be thrown over to the western wing of the army group in time thus became increasingly doubtful. There were, nonetheless, two gratifying facts to record. Army Group A, which had been understandably reluctant to see one of its armies disappear across the Don, had realized after all that its own fate, too, would be decided on the Dunnets and not in the Cuban. Besides, it was becoming more and more unlikely that a force of any strength in the Cuban could be supplied across the Straits of Kerch. Hence 4th Army Group A, as well, came out in favor of withdrawing the largest possible number of forces through Rostov. The second fact was that on 25th January the above-mentioned attack of two of our armored divisions on the enemy advancing across the Lower Manich finally produced the success we had hoped for. With that, the immediate threat to the Rostov crossings was eliminated for the time being. Instead, the situation on 4th Panzer Army's southern wing took another critical turn. Bringing up fresh forces which appeared to have been drawn from the Soviet armies pressing after Army Group A, 
the enemy attempted to get between 4th Panzer Army and the northern wing of 1st Panzer Army in order to envelop the former from the south and force the latter away from Rostov. Don Army Group accordingly presented Army Group with a final demand that it should join in this battle with an armoured division and also step up 1st Panzer Army's withdrawal on Rostov with every means at its disposal. At last, on 27 January, at least the northern half of 1st Panzer Army came under command of Don Army Group, with the result that the latter was now itself able to order the measures to which I have just referred. At the same time, since 4th Panzer Army still had to keep the Rostov crossing open for the time being, Don Army Group decided that HQ 1st Panzer Army, which could be released sooner south of the Don, should be the first to move over to the Middle Dunnets. It was to be followed by its divisions as they were fed through Rostov, as well as by forces of 4th Panzer Army as they became available. By 31st January, things had reached a point where 1st Panzer Army could be expected to come back through Rostov, though whether it would arrive at the Dunnets in time to stop the enemy breaking across the river to the sea coast was quite another matter. The unfortunate thing was that even now, not all of the army's formations could be got to the decisive battleground. Thanks to Hitler's hesitation in deciding whether to bring the army back towards Rostov or to move it into the Kuban, 50 Division, one of the well-tried formations of the former Crimean army, had not been in time to join in the move to Rostov and had gone over to 17th Army. Furthermore, after days of indecision, Hitler at the last moment reallocated 13 Panzer Division to Army Grouper for use in the Cuban after we had striven to the last to preserve a gap through which to slip it to Rostov. Thus both these divisions were withheld from the crucial battleground while some 400,000 men lay virtually paralyzed in the Cuban. Admittedly the latter served to tie down the powerful enemy forces who were vainly striving to do away with the bridgehead but they never achieved the operational effect which Hitler sought, and ultimately the enemy was left free to decide what size of force he should leave there. Not even Hitler's argument that a large force must be kept in the Cuban in order to deny the enemy the naval port of Novorossiysk held any water. He still had to give it up in the end. On 29 January I headquarters moved from Taganrog, where it had gone on the 12th, to Stalino, as the army group's main point of effort now had to shift from the Don to the Dunnets. During the battles in and south of the large bend of the Don, the aim of which had been to cover the withdrawal of army grouper from the Caucasus, but in which the larger issue was whether the German southern wing could be preserved at all, a fresh problem was already emerging. The question was whether this southern wing would be able to maintain the Dunnets area. This area, which lies between the Sea of Azov the Don Estuary and the Lower and Middle Dunnets and is roughly bounded in the west by the line Maripal Krasno Armis Coisum, had played a fundamental part in Hitler's operational calculations as far back as 1941, for he considered possession of it to be of vital importance to the outcome of the war. On the one hand he contended that we should not get through the war economically without its vast coal deposits, while on the other he considered that the loss of these had dealt a telling blow to the Soviet war effort. Dunnitz coal, he declared, was the only kind the Russians had, at least in European Russia, that was suitable for coking, and sooner or later the lack of it must paralyze their tank and munitions production. While I do not propose to discuss the pros and cons of these assertions, the fact remains that the Russians managed to produce thousands of tanks and millions of shells in the years 1942-3 without recourse to this Dunitz coal. The real question was whether we could remain the military masters of the Dunitz Basin or not. From the point of view of our war economy it was unquestionably desirable that we should retain it with the one qualification that while we extracted substantial quantities of Dunitz coal for our own use, all the bunker coal for the railway supplying this vast territory had to be brought out from Germany because Dunitz coal did not suit our locomotives. As the Reich Spain had to run several coal trains a day to cover its own requirements, the proportion of troop trains fell off accordingly. Be that as it may, Hitler maintained that the German war economy could not possibly do without the Dunitz Basin. 
A year later he said exactly the same thing about the manganese output of Nikopol, and yet our possession of the area was in doubt from the moment the Hungarian front collapsed south of Voronezh, throwing open the enemy's road to the Dunitz and across it to the Dnieper crossings or the Sea of Azov. The first time the question of our fighting to hold the Dunitz basin came up was in a telephone conversation I had with General Zietzler on 19th January. He wanted to hear my views on the subject, having broached it to Hitler albeit without success the day before. This was the day on which the danger appeared of a breach in the whole front from Voroshilovgrad to Voronezh. I told Zietzler that however important this area might be, even from the economic point of view, the question was relatively simple to answer. If it were to be retained in its entirety strong forces must be assembled with a minimum delay and as far east as was feasible forward of Kharkov, if possible. Should we be unable to do this because it was thought that central and northern army groups could not spare any more forces, because the new drafts at home were not ready, because OKW would not release any forces from other fronts or, finally, because such a sudden deployment would be too much for the railways in their present state we should simply have to accept the consequences. The southern wing of the German armies could not close the gap with its own forces if it remained on the lower Don dot nor could it go on fighting there in isolation if the expected reinforcements took a long time to arrive and deployed far to the rear that is out of all relation to the operations of the southern wing. The battle being fought by the southern wing and the deployment of the new forces must be so attuned to one another in a spatial sense as to become operationally coherent. Either the new forces must be made to deploy swiftly and relatively far to the east, in which case it would be possible for the army group to remain on the lower Don in Dunitz, or else they could not, and the army group would have to be pulled back to join them. If one of these two courses were not taken, the enemy would have an opportunity to cut off the whole southern wing before any reinforcements could make their presence felt. General Zietzler agreed with me. It was certain in any case that the SS Panzer Corps due to assemble around Kharkov by the middle of February would not have the necessary strength to close the gap now being torn open from Voroshilovgrad to Voronezh. Nor could it be made operational in time to launch an offensive thrust north of the Dunitz for the purpose of freeing the flank of the southern wing in the event of its remaining on the lower Don and Dunitz. The next few days served to increase the army group's alarm at the trend of events in its deep flank. As early as 20th January, we had noticed two enemy corps trying to outflank the army group's left wing, the Fretopiko group at Kamensk, by a movement in the direction of Voroshilovgrad. At the same time the enemy was feeling his way forward against the Italian remnants behind the Dunitz east of Voroshilovgrad. Otherwise his main forces apparently aimed to drive west on Starobilsk in the first instance, obviously with the object of gaining some initial elbow room. As soon as the enemy had attained these aims, however, it could be assumed that he would not only strive to envelop the Fretopico group, but also, by throwing strong forces further round to the west, to advance over the Dunitz towards the Dnieper crossings or the coast of the Sea of Azov. Only four days later, on 24 January, there were already reports of enemy cavalry south of the Dunitz in the region of Voroshilovgrad, though it was always possible that a false alarm had been sounded by some jumpy town major in a rear area. On 31 January, I sent OKH a teleprinter message restating my views on the problem of holding the Dunitz basin. The prior condition for attaining it, I said, was that a timely attempt be made from the direction of Kharkov to relieve the pressure on us and that the enemy in the area northeast? of the city be beaten before the muddy season set in. If, as unfortunately seemed to be the case, neither of these should prove practicable, there would be no possibility of holding the basin at least not to its full extent in the east. Any attempt to remain on the lower Don and Dunitz would thus be a mistake from the operational point of view. A second factor which must not be overlooked, I went on was that our present forces would not alone suffice to hold the whole Dunitz area if, as seemed certain, the enemy were to bring up further reinforcements from the Caucasus and Stalingrad. It was just not good enough to pin one's hopes on the enemy's becoming exhausted, great though his losses might well have been in attacks on German troops, 
or on his operations being brought to a premature halt by difficulties of supply. These were the arguments which Hitler constantly produced to General Zietzler whenever the latter drew his attention, on the strength of the basically accurate intelligence reports he received from us, to the tremendous numerical superiority of the enemy. Undoubtedly there was some justification for what Hitler said. Yet it had to be borne in mind that the enemy's attacks on Allied armies had cost him very little and that he was far less dependent on supply and transport than we Germans were in enemy territory, the very next few days confirmed the army group's appreciation of the enemy's intentions. It became clear that he was out to crush our front on the Dunitz and simultaneously to outflank us to the west. On 2 February, he crossed the Dunitz east of Voroshilovgrad without encountering any serious opposition from the Italians there. The assault group he had assembled consisted of three tank corps, one mechanized and one rifle corps, obviously part of the forces which had previously overrun the Italians on the Don. The objectives of this grouping could be taken to be Rostov or to Ganrog. After rejecting 19 Panzer Division from Starobilsk, the enemy had swung another strong force of three or four tank corps and a rifle corps southwest against the line slaviansk lysychansk It was plain that he planned a movement to outflank our wing further west. This if one ignored the residue of Italians he could expect to find around or even east of Voroshilovgrad. Except for the measures the army group was able to take in its own sphere of command with the ultimate object of flinging 1st Panzer Army over to the Middle Dunitz, therefore, the period following the end of January was taken up with wrangles between the army group and OKH on how to proceed with the operations as a whole. As has been stated, I had already emphasized to General Zietziller on 19 January that the whole of the Dunitz Basin could only be held on condition that strong forces intervened swiftly and effectively from the Kharkov direction. As no prospect of this existed, I asked for permission to reduce the echoing of our eastern wing at least far enough to release the forces which the army group would need if it were to prevent the amputation of the southern wing with its own resources and the reinforcements it had been promised. We had already dispatched 1st Panzer Army to the Middle Dunitz to counteract the threat of envelopment that had now become acute there. What had to be done now was to get 4th Panzer Army, too out of the balcony on the lower Don and Dunitz. This was the only timely way to meet the danger of an enemy attempt to cut us off from the Dnieper crossings by advancing across the Isum Slaviansk line. Further up the Don, moreover, the enemy must always be expected to bring even more troops over the river towards the lower Dnieper than had already been reported at Slaviansk. Apart from one division of the SS Panzer Corps, which had meanwhile arrived at Kharkiv, there were nothing but battered remnants to oppose him anywhere in the area of army group B. These alone could not prevent him from wheeling into our deep flank. But 4th Panzer Army could only be released if a considerable reduction were made in the length of the army group front. Instead of continuing to hold the extensive arc formed by the Lower Don and the Dunitz from Rostov as far as the region west of Voroshilovgrad, the right wing of the army group must be taken back, as it were onto the string of the bow. This string was the system of defences which the German southern wing had held in 1941 after the first withdrawal from Rostov a line running behind the Meuse and continuing northwards as far as the Middle Dunitz. Taking the front back into this position naturally meant abandoning the eastern part of the Dunitz coalfields. In order to justify this withdrawal, I made an attempt to bring home my conception of the long-term conduct of military operations to the Supreme Command. The following is roughly how I expressed it in a teleprinter message addressed for Hitler's personal attention to hold the Don Dun its salient for any length of time was not possible, even in a purely defensive context, with the forces at the army group's disposal. In the event of the Supreme Command's having to remain on the defensive in 1943 on account of the loss of 6th Army and its 20 divisions, an all-out attempt to defend the entire Dunitz Basin would mean committing all the forces there that could possibly be made available. That, however, would give the enemy a free hand to take the offensive with far superior forces at any point he cared to pick on the remainder of the front. While the present danger was that Don Army Group would be bottled up on the Sea of Azov, and Army Group are consequently lost in the Cuban, 
we could safely assume that even if this could be avoided and the hold on its area held, the enemy's later aim would be to encircle the whole southern wing of the eastern front on the Black Sea. If, on the other hand, the Supreme Command felt able to seek a solution by renewed offensive action in 1943, it could again only do so on the southern wing but on no account from out of the Don done its salient because of the now familiar supply difficulties and the flanking threat to which any attack from this balcony projection would be exposed from the outset. The only means of achieving an offensive solution always assuming that this were in the least feasible, consisted in the first place in drawing the enemy westwards towards the lower Dnieper on our southern wing. Having once achieved this, we had to launch a powerful attack from the Kharkov area and smash the Russian front connecting there in order to turn south and surround the enemy on the Sea of Azov. Hitler, however, was apparently unwilling to entertain any ideas of this kind. He had already been told by Zietzler himself, so the latter informed me that the only question now was whether to abandon the Dunitz area by itself or to lose Don Army Group along with it. Hitler's answer had been that although his chief of staff was probably right from the operational point of view, the surrender of the Dunitz area was impossible for economic reasons, not so much because of any loss of coal to ourselves as because a German withdrawal would put the enemy back in possession of the supplies so vital to his own steel production. As an interim solution, Hitler had directed that the SS Reich Division, the first of the SS Panzer Kahl formations to have reached Kharkov, should launch a thrust from that area into the rear of the enemy forces advancing against our Dunitz front. Quite apart from the fact that this solitary division could never suffice for such a far ranging operation, it would have had to overrun six enemy divisions for a start, and that there would be nothing available to cover its ever lengthening northern flank. Its commitment to battle would have meant splitting up the only striking force the SS Panzer Corps which could be expected to join us in the foreseeable future. If it came to that, the Rye Division was no longer free for such an operation, Army Group B having already had to throw it in to meet the rapid advance of the Soviets towards Kharkov. At that very hour it was tied up in a pretty unpromising defensive action at Volchansk, northeast of the city. During the next couple of days, 4th and 5th February, the situation on Don Army Group's front deteriorated visibly, the enemy bringing sharp pressure to bear on 4th Panzer Army as it covered the flow of 1st Panzer Army through Rostov. Two armies from his former Caucasus front, 44th and 58th, had now joined the three already facing 4th Panzer Army a sure sign that the threat which Army Group A's 17th Army in the Cuban was supposed to constitute in the flank of the Russians had not deterred them from transferring substantial forces to the decisive battleground. Before long Don Army Group would have to expect a massed attack on both Rostov itself and the Don front each side of Novokokosk. In addition, a strong motorized force was found to be moving from Stalingrad towards the Don. On the army group's left wing, too, the situation was becoming increasingly grave. East of Voroshilovgrad, 6 Panzer Division, which army detachment Hollett had rushed up to the middle Dunitz in pursuance of the army group order of 14th January, had not succeeded in flinging the enemy back across the river. All it could do for the time being was to bottle him up in the bridgehead he had gained the dot further west, the enemy had been able to cross the Dunitz on a broad front, there being practically no forces whatever to defend it. He was now outside Slaviansk and had taken a sim dot even now, therefore, it appeared doubtful whether the withdrawal of army detachment Hollett into the Meuse positions would still be at all feasible. The army group had intended to have it on the Novokokosk Caymans line by 5th January, but in fact it had been tied down on the Don and Dunitz through Hitler's refusal to let us take the front back to the Meuse. If the enemy were to push swiftly southeastwards from Slaviansk, he would unhinge the Meuse defenses from the start. Even though HQ 1st Panzer Army and the forces we had allocated to it were by this time on the road from Rostov to the Middle Dunitz. It would inevitably be several days yet before the army could take an effective hand there. What made things worse was that the saturated roads in the coastal area greatly hampered the progress of the armored divisions, whereas the ground further north was still frozen solid and in no way affected the Russians' mobility. In view of these ominous developments, 
the army group not only renewed its call for an immediate withdrawal of its right wing to the Meuse, but also presented OKH with a series of specific demands which were intended to underline the perilousness of the situation. It called for the concentration of 7AA Division, which was engaged on anti-aircraft defense in the communications zone, to provide both air and ground protection for the supple route running through Dnepropetrovsk. It called for the immediate preparation of an airlift in case the enemy were to cut its rear communications. It called for a ruthless increase in the transport capacity of the railway at the expense of supplies to Army Group B, which had hardly any more troops to feed anyway. It demanded that unless the promised attack by the SS Rai Division had achieved complete success, which must mean reaching Kupiansk by 6 February, the SS Panzer Corps should attack south of the Dunitz towards Isam as soon as the increase in troop trains enabled it to assemble around Kharkov. Finally, the Army Group called for the immediate transfer of the combat troops of 13 Panzer Division and two infantry divisions of 17th Army to the Lower Dnieper, where they would be furnished with new weapons and take over the B Echelon transport and supply columns of 6th Army located the dot even if Hitler shut his eyes to our more long term view of operations. These demands would in any case bring the urgency of the position home to him. And sure enough, as a result of this teleprint message, a Condor aircraft touched down on our airstrip on 6 February to fetch me to General Headquarters for an interview with Hitler. His decision to give me a personal hearing may have been partially due to a visit paid to us at the end of January by his senior military assistant, Schmunt, to whom we had expressed our views very forcibly on the present situation and the way in which things were being handled at the top. The conference of 6 February 1943 between Hitler and myself made it possible to forestall the disaster threatening to overtake the German southern wing and to give the Supreme Command one more chance at least to obtain a stalemate in the east. Hitler opened the talks as I have already reported in the chapter on Stalingrad with an unqualified admission of his exclusive responsibility responsibility for the fate of 6th Army, which had met its tragic end a few days previously. At the time I had the impression that he was deeply affected by this tragedy, not just because it amounted to a blatant failure of his own leadership, but also because he was deeply depressed in a purely personal sense by the fate of the soldiers who, out of faith in him, had fought to the last with such courage and devotion to duty. Yet later on I came to doubt whether Hitler had any place whatever in his heart for the soldiers who put such boundless trust in him and remained true to him till the end. By then I wondered if he did not regard all of them from field marshal down to private soldier as mere tools of his war aims. Be that as it may, this gesture of Hitler's in assuming immediate and unqualified responsibility for Stalingrad struck a chivalrous note. Whether deliberately or unconsciously, he had thus shown considerable psychological skill in the way he opened our discussion. He always did have a masterly knack of adapting his manner to his interlocutor. For my own part, I had made up my mind to discuss two questions with him. The first was that of the future conduct of operations in my own area which depended on getting Hitler's consent to the abandonment of the eastern part of the Dunitz Basin. It was essential to elicit this from him that very day. The second question I wished to bring up was that of the supreme command that is the form in which it had been exercised by Hitler ever since the dismissal of Field Marshal V. Braukic. The outcome of this style of leadership Stalingrad gave me adequate reason for raising it. To dispose of the second question first, let me say quite briefly that no satisfactory conclusion was reached. Realizing that a dictator like Hitler would never bring himself to resign as commander in chief, I tried to get him to accept a solution which would not damage his prestige and yet guarantee a salutary military leadership for the future. I asked him to ensure the uniformity of this leadership by appointing one chief of staff whom he must trust implicitly and at the same time vest with the appropriate responsibility and authority. But Hitler was clearly not willing to treat the matter impartially. He kept resorting to the personal aspects of the case, complaining of the disappointments he had suffered with V. Blomberg the war minister and even with V. Braukic. He quite bluntly declared. Moreover, that he could not possibly put anyone in a position that would virtually set him above Goring, 
who would never subordinate himself to the guidance of a chief of staff even if the latter were acting in Hitler's name. Whether Hitler was really reluctant to offend Goring or merely used this as a pretext, I cannot say. This brings us back to the first question, that of the future of operations in the area of Don Army Group. I began by giving Hitler a picture of the Army Group's present situation and went on to list the conclusions to be drawn from it. I pointed out that our forces would on no account suffice to hold the area of the Don and Dunitz. However highly Hitler cared to rate its value to either side, the only real question was whether, in trying to hang on to the whole of the Dunitz Basin, we wanted to lose the latter plus Don Army Group, and in due course Army Group as well, or whether, by abandoning part of it at the right moment, we could avert the catastrophe that threatened to overtake us. Passing on from these manifest aspects of the present situation, I endeavored to make Hitler see what would inevitably happen later if we persisted in remaining in the Don Donitz balcony. The enemy would be free, now that Army Group B was almost completely out of action, to turn the strong forces advancing through the latter's area down towards the lower Dnieper or the coast and thus to cut off the entire southern wing. What happened down on this southern wing, I emphasized, would decide the outcome of the whole war in the east. It was certain that the enemy would continue to draw on his still strong reserves, particularly from around Stalingrad, to ensure that his struggle to slice off the German army's southern wing fully achieved its object. For this reason no counter thrust by the SS Panzer Corps could be considered adequate to intercept the wide outflanking movement which the enemy would make. He would be quite powerful enough to carry out this envelopment and screen it off to the west around Kharkov simultaneously. Even the sum total of possible German reinforcements would still not be enough to stop this enemy thrust. It was absolutely essential, therefore, that 1st Panzer Army, now on its way to the Middle Dunitz, should be immediately followed by 4th Panzer Army to intercept the still not acute, but nonetheless inevitable threat of an enemy envelopment between the Donitz and Dnieper. Only then would it be possible, in cooperation with the approaching reinforcements, to restore the situation on the German southern wing of the Eastern Front that is the entire stretch of front from the coast of the Sea of Azov to the right wing of Central Army Group. Unless 4th Panzer Army were pulled back from the lower Don, this would not be possible. Yet to take it away from there automatically implied withdrawing from the Don Dun its salient into the Meuse positions along its space. There was not a day to lose over this dot indeed, it was already doubtful thanks to the delay in taking a decision whether Army Detachment Hollett, now saddled with the defense of the whole front from the coastline to the Middle Dunitz, would ever get back to the Meuse in time. Consequently I had to receive permission that very day to give up the eastern part of the Dunitz area as far as the Meuse. This statement of mine to which, incidentally, Hitler listened with the utmost composure, was followed by a dispute on the Dunitz Basin issue lasting several hours. Even during the second part of our talks, when I discussed the whole problem of leadership with him in private, Hitler kept coming back to it. As was to be my experience on similar occasions, he avoided any real discussion of what I had to say on operational matters. He did not even try to propound a better plan of his own or to refute the assumptions on which I had based my arguments. Nor did he dispute that the situation would develop in the way I felt bound to anticipate. He treated every statement not bearing directly on the most pressing needs of the moment as sheer hypothesis which might or might not become reality. Now, all considerations of an operational nature are ultimately based especially when one has lost the initiative to the enemy, on appreciations or hypotheses regarding the course of action which the enemy may be expected to take. While no one can prove beforehand that a situation will develop in such and such a way, the only successful military commander is the one who can think ahead. He must be able to see through the veil in which the enemy's future actions are always wrapped, at least to the extent of correctly judging the possibilities open to both the enemy and himself. The greater one's sphere of command, of course, the further ahead one must think. And the greater the distances to be covered and the formations to be moved the longer is the interval that must elapse before the decision one has taken can produce tangible results. 
this long-term thinking was not to Hitler's taste, however at least not in the operational field. Possibly he disliked the prospect of being confronted with conclusions which did not conform to his wishes. Since these could not be refuted, he avoided becoming involved in them wherever possible. And so this time, too, he mainly drew his arguments from other fields. He began by dwelling on his understandable aversion to any voluntary surrender of hard won territory so long as it could not be proved, as he thought that no alternative method existed. It was a viewpoint which every soldier will appreciate. In my own case, particularly, it went right against the grain on this and so many later occasions to have to goad Hitler into giving territory up. I should have much preferred to be able to submit plans for successful offensives instead of for the now inevitable withdrawals. But it is a well-known maxim of war that whoever tries to hold on to everything at once, finishes up by holding nothing at all. Another argument which Hitler kept advancing was that any shortening of the front such as I had proposed for the purpose of making additional forces available would release an equivalent proportion of enemy forces which could then be thrown into the scale at a crucial spot. This, in itself, was also quite a tenable argument. The constantly decisive factor in any such shift of forces, however, is which of the two opponents gains the lead in other words, which of them is offered the opportunity, by his own timely action, to seize the initiative at the crucial spot and thereafter to dictate his own terms to the more slow moving enemy, even when the latter is collectively the stronger. In the case of any attempt to hold the Don Dun its salient, moreover, the excessive length of the front virtually cancelled out the superiority in strength usually enjoyed by a defender over his attacker. In conditions of this kind the attacker has a chance to pierce the overextended front at a spot of his own choosing, using relatively small forces and suffering no great losses. Since the defense lacks reserves, he is able to demolish the whole structure. Hitler also argued that if one fought bitterly for every foot of ground and made the enemy pay dearly for every step he advanced, even the Soviet army's offensive power must one day be exhausted. The enemy had now been attacking for two and a half months without a break. His losses were high and he must soon be at the end of his tether. As he drew further away from his starting lines, moreover, his supplely difficulties would halt any far-flung outflanking movement he might be planning. There was certainly a great deal of truth in all that Hitler said. Undoubtedly the enemy had had very big losses, at least when attacking sectors held by the Germans and these would have made large inroads on his offensive power. Yet he had had correspondingly easy successes in sectors where there was not the stubborn resistance of German troops to contend with. It was also true that the losses of the Soviet troops the infantry first and foremost had greatly lowered their quality, otherwise we could not have held our own against such odds. But however much the enemy division's losses might reduce their combat efficiency, there were always new ones to take their place. As for Soviet supply difficulties, these could indeed be expected to increase the further the enemy's operations took him. But in this age of motor transport the distances from the army's railheads to the sea of Azov or the lower Dnieper were not big enough to frustrate the impending Soviet drive to lop off the German southern wing. During World War I it had still been accepted that no army could normally put more than 95 miles between itself and its railhead. That this figure no longer held good in World War II had been adequately proved by our own operations in both East and West. In addition, the Russians were masters at the rapid reconstruction of railways, which presented relatively few engineering problems on those vast expanses of plain. In any case, it was entirely wrong to base our own measures on the vague help that the enemy would soon reach the limit of his strength or mobility. When all was said and done, our own divisions, long overtaxed and severely bled, were themselves not far from exhaustion. In this respect I must emphasize that Hitler was fully aware of the condition and casualties of our own troops. What he did not care to admit was that the newly established divisions initially had to pay far too high a toll in blood on account of their lack of combat experience. On the other hand, 
he did agree that the Luftwaffe field divisions had proved a fiasco, and even confessed that they had been brought into existence as a concession to Goring's thirst for prestige. All Hitler actually had to say about the operational position was to express the belief that the SS Panzer Corps would be able to remove the acute threat to the middle Dunitz front by a southeasterly thrust from the Kharkov region in the direction of Isum. His one reservation was that by the time the Corps Second Division, the Lubstandarty, arrived, the Reich Division should have dealt with the enemy at Volchansk. A third division could not come until later, his faith in the penetrating power of this newly established SS Panzer Corps was apparently unbounded. Otherwise, however, his statements showed that he still did not, or would not, realize the dangers of the less immediate future especially when the enemy's Stalingrad formations appeared on the new battlefield. But the most decisive argument repeatedly put forward by Hitler was the present impossibility, as he saw it, of giving up the Dunitz area. He feared the repercussions on Turkey. For one thing. Most of all, he stressed the importance of the Dunitz coal to our own war economy and the effect on the enemy of continuing to be deprived of it. Only by regaining this coal, he said, would the Russians be able to maintain their steel production and thereby keep up their output of tanks, guns and ammunition. When reminded that they had turned out plenty of tanks and ammunition to date despite having lost the Dunitz Basin, Hitler replied that they were simply living off their existing stocks of steel. If they did not get the coal fields back, he insisted, they could not keep up their previous production which in turn would prevent them from mounting any more big offensives. Now no one would deny that the enemy must be having production trouble in consequence of the loss of the coking coal and the steel and other plant of the Dunitz Basin. One proof, in my own opinion, was the fact that he had so far not succeeded in replacing the mass of the artillery he had lost in 1941. It was this which had enabled us to defend the patchworkshire front earlier on. That winter he did in fact have enough guns to commit an overwhelming concentration of them on limited sectors of front as, for example, during the three successive breakthroughs on the Don but he obviously still had not enough to equip all his divisions with fully mobile artillery. This discussion on the economic importance of the Dunitz area, by the way, gave Hitler an opportunity to display his quite astonishing knowledge of production figures and weapon potentials. In this conflict of views on the advisability or otherwise of trying to hold on to the Dunitz Basin, I was ultimately left with only one trump card in my hand. Shortly before my flight to Lotzen we had had a visit at my headquarters from Paul Pledger, president of the Reichsvereinigung Kohl, the German coal cartel. When questioned on the real importance of the Dunitz area to the German and Russian war economies, he had assured me that the mines around Shikti that is in that part of the basin which lay east of the Meuse were in no way vital, as the coal there was unsuitable for coking or locomotive combustion. This disposed of Hitler's objections from the standpoint of economic warfare. But anyone who supposes that he would now admit his defeat is underestimating the man's pertinacity. As a means at least of delaying the evacuation of the Don Dunitz salient, he finally resorted to the weather. As luck would have it, an unusually early thaw had set in during the last few days. The road across the ice of Taganrog Bay could no longer be used with complete safety, and although the Don and Dunitz were still frozen over, it was always possible that the ice would soon start breaking up if the milder weather continued. Hitler now used all the eloquence at his command to persuade me that in only a few days' time the broad valley of the Don might well be an impassable obstacle over which the enemy could not possibly attack before summer. Conversely, our own 4th Panzer Army would get bogged down in the mud if it moved west. The least I could do in the circumstances, he said was to wait for a short while longer. When I still would not budge and refused to stake the fate of my army group on the hope of a quite unseasonable change of weather, Hitler finally agreed to the withdrawal of the army group's eastern front to the Meuse. If one included the discussion on the command problem, we had been in conference for four whole hours. The extent of Hitler's perseverance is shown by a small thing which happened just after I had taken leave of him. Having given what amounted to final approval of my operational intentions, he called me back again as I was about to leave his room. 
he said that while he naturally had no wish to alter a decision once it had been agreed upon, he would still urge me to consider just once more whether I could not wait for at least a little longer. A thaw in the Don Basin might even yet enable us to remain in the Don Dun it's salient. I still stood firm, however. All I would promise him was not to issue the withdrawal order until I reached my headquarters at noon next day, provided the situation report sent up that evening did not necessitate immediate action. I have given all this space to my interview with Hitler not only on account of the decisive effect it had on the outcome of the campaign that winter, but also because I find it in many respects typical of his attitude and of the difficulty of getting him to accept anything which did not conform to his own wishes. Development up to the end of February it would be wrong to suppose, just because we had succeeded, after a long tussle, in obtaining Hitler's agreement to the evacuation of the east of the Dunitz Basin which in turn enabled us to throw 4th Panzer Army over to our western wing that the menace to the German southern wing as a whole was already eliminated. The process of leapfrogging 4th Panzer Army from east to west was bound to take about two weeks, in view of the distance involved and the state of the roads. Furthermore, it was by no means certain whether Army Detachment Hollett would reach the Meuse positions safely, considering that the enemy in its deep flank around Voroshilovgrad was already south of the Dunitz. It was still uncertain, moreover, whether First Panzer Army could hold, or restore to any reasonable extent, the front on the middle Dunitz. Above all, the situation in the area of Army Group B that is in the region of Kharkov was shaping so ominously that all sorts of opportunities were opening up to the enemy. Not only could he drive through to the Dnieper crossings at Dnepropetrovsk and Zaporozhye and cut off Don Army Group's communications there, it was even possible for him to cross the river further upstream and block it from the west. Besides shifting 4th Panzer Army over to the western wing of the Army Group, therefore, it would be necessary to form a new grouping of forces to replace Army Group B's allied armies, which had by now gone almost completely to pieces. At noon on 7 February, I arrived back at my headquarters at Stalin. The situation on the Don had been aggravated by the capture of Botesk, a suburb of Rostov on the south bank of the river. Immediately upon my return the army group gave orders to fall back behind the Don and begun moving HQ 4th Panzer Army, together with whatever divisions it could make available, over to the western wing. Army Detachment Hollett received instructions to retire to the line Novokokarsk came and skin the first instance. On 8 February further emergencies arose at Rostov and Voroshilovgrad, where the enemy broke out of the bridgehead he had gained earlier on. The position of 1st Panzer Army, now involved in the fighting on the Middle Dunitz, was just as critical in as much as the success we had hoped it would score against the enemy advancing across the stretch of river between Lysychinsk and Slavyansk had so far not materialized. Around Kharkov, in the area of Army Group B, a new army detachment was just being formed under General Lands. The SS Panzer Corps, which was still in the process of arriving, had been placed under its command. We learned that the SS Rai Division, which was to have smashed the enemy at Volchansk preparatory to thrusting southeast towards Isum, had in fact come nowhere near doing so. On the contrary, it had retired behind the Dunitz. In the circumstances it was certain that nothing would come of the thrust which Hitler had proposed making with the SS Panzer Corps of which the Rai Division was the only formation so far available to relieve the pressure on our western flank. On 9 February the enemy had taken Belgorod and Bosk, in Army Group B's area north of Kharkov. He was also advancing west from the Dunitz Bend around Isum. In the gap between the Dnieper and the right wing of Central Army Group which only began some considerable distance north of Usk, there was practically nothing but army detachment lands, whose assembly at Kharkov was already imperiled, and army group B's badly battered second army west of Usk. In view of the fact that the enemy could now carry out a wide outflanking movement across the Dnieper upstream from Dnepropetrovsk, it was clear that despite the steps taken to shift 4th Panzer Army to the western wing, Don Army Group would in the long run be unable to guarantee the security of its rear communications with its own forces alone. Something radical had to be done. 
I accordingly sent General Zietzler a teleprinter message calling for the deployment within the next fortnight of a new army of at least five or six divisions in the area north of Dnepropetrovsk, as well as of another army behind Second Army's front that is west of Husk, for a thrust to the south. To do this, I said, there must be a basic improvement in the efficiency of transport as the slow trickle of divisions which had been coming through to date could not possibly help matters in the present situation. General Zietzler did hold out the prospect of really effective assistance from now on. He hoped that he could at last release six more divisions from Central and Northern Army groups and get these to us faster than had been the case hitherto. The daily number of trains he envisaged was 37 which meant that we could count on having one of the six promised divisions every other day. In view of the breadth of the gap torn in the German front, of course, even these forces would be no more than a stopgap to tide us over the worst dangers until the muddy season set in, and whether they would arrive in time depended on developments around Kharkov, on which our own army group had no influence. In any case, the German southern wing remained overshadowed by the mortal danger that either before or immediately after the muddy season the enemy would push through to the Sea of Azov or, by striking even further west, to the Black Sea. While the army group's deep flank thus constituted its main source of anxiety, the trend of events on its own fronts was also far from encouraging. First Panzer Army, Commander, General V. Mackensen, Chief of Staff, Colonel Wenk. The task of which was to throw the enemy who had crossed the middle Dunitz back across the river, had to contend with two superior enemy forces. The first, which had come over the Dunitz at Voroshilovgrad, was trying to drive in between Army Detachment Hollet as it fell back on the Meuse and 1st Panzer Army as it moved up to the Dunitz from the south. The other was the force which had crossed the Dunitz along the Lysychinsk Slavyansk line and was now striving to shift its main effort to its western wing on both sides of the Krivoy Torets. First Panzer Army, which was liable to be enveloped from both flanks, had to try to tackle the two groups of enemies successively. The army group's own view was that it should deliver the first punch on its western wing and dispatch the enemy at Slavyansk before turning on the force at Voroshilovgrad. Unfortunately the army had initially been compelled to tie up part of its forces with the latter group, with the result that it was no longer strong enough to beat the enemy at Slavyansk. This, in turn, meant that there could not be enough forces south of Voroshilovgrad to block the enemy's thrust to the southwest. As is so often the case in times of crisis, the large-scale emergencies were intensified by irritations of a localized character. On the basis of a reconnaissance carried out before it dispatched 40 Panzer Corps to destroy the enemy force advancing from Slavyansk, 1st Panzer Army had decided that it was impossible for tanks to outflank the enemy over the ground west of the Krivoy Dorots because the deep fissures crisscrossing this particular stretch of country were buried in snow. Consequently 40 Panzer Corps put in its attack more or less frontally along and eastwards of the river valley. As the intense cold of the Russian winter makes it virtually impossible for troops to remain in the open country at night, most of the fighting inevitably took place around the inhabited localities in the Krivoy Dorots Valley, the first main objective being possession of the big factory town of Kramatorskaya. In a battle of this kind, however, there was no hope of gaining the quick decision we so urgently needed against the enemy force at Slavyansk, and 11 Panzer Division which was leading the attack, progressed only with great difficulty. While the army group's intention of cutting the enemy off from the Dunitz by enveloping him from the west had thus been rendered nugatory, the latter pushed a strong force of armor through the allegedly impassable country west of the Krivoy Dorots on the night of 11 February, penetrating as far as Grishino. Once again it was seen that the western conception of impassibility had only limited validity where the Russians are concerned partly, of course, because the wider tracks of Soviet armored vehicles made it considerably easier for them to negotiate the mud or deep snow which held up our own tanks. At Grishino the enemy was now not only deep in the flank of 1st Panzer Army but also blocking the army group's main railway line from Dnepropetrovsk to Krasno Armisko. Only the railway through Zaporozhye remained open 
and even in this case efficiency was reduced by the fact that the big Dnieper bridge destroyed by the enemy in 1941 was still not open to traffic. As a result all goods had to be reloaded, and tank wagons carrying petrol could not go through to the front. While supplies to the battlefront, especially petrol, were thus endangered and 1st Panzer Army was faced with the threat of being outflanked from the west. The enemy simultaneously tried to turn its flank from the east with the forces which had broken through by way of Voroshilovgrad. In particular, one enemy cavalry corps had managed to penetrate as far as the important rail junction of Dibaltsvo, which lay not only far to the rear of the army's right wing but even behind the position due to be occupied by army detachment Hollett on the Meuse. Although it was possible to surround this corps at Dibaltsvo, its destruction proved a difficult and lengthy business on account of the tough resistance it put up in the villages. As a result 17 Panzer Division, which was urgently required on the army's western wing, remained tied down here for the time being. On the eastern front, Soviet armored forces just back from arrest and refit pressed hard behind army detachment Hollett as it fell back on the Meuse. As a result we were temporarily unable to pull out the armored divisions still with the army detachment. The army detachment did, nonetheless, succeed in reaching the Meuse positions on 17 February and in organizing a defense there. On the western wing it had meanwhile proved possible to halt the enemy armor at Grishino by throwing in the Viking division as it arrived from the Don. The latter was unable to dispose of the enemy with any speed, however. Apart from having been considerably weakened in the recent heavy fighting, it was suffering from an acute shortage of officers. The division was composed of SS volunteers from the Baltic and Nordic countries, and its losses had been so severe that there were no longer enough officers available with a command of the appropriate languages. Naturally enough this had an adverse effect on the fighting efficiency of what was intrinsically a useful body of troops. In the meantime 4th Panzer Army was still moving by road and rail from the lower Don to the western wing, its progress being considerably delayed by the bad state of the roads. Thus, apart from the fact that the enemy was already in 1st Panzer Army's deep flank at Grishino and able to send in fresh forces to reinforce those temporarily held up there. The danger in the yawning gap between the left wing of 1st Panzer Army and the Kharkov region remained as desperate as ever. In this area the enemy had complete freedom of action. These critical developments in the army group's own area were primarily the result of the excessive length of time it had had to leave its forces forward on the Don and Dunitz to cover the withdrawal of Army Group A. Henceforth our headquarters also watched Army Group B's sector with growing alarm. The enemy was capable while ensuring that he was covered in the direction of Kharkov of moving down on Pavlograd with the forces reported to be advancing westwards from Isum. From Pavlograd he could go on to the Dnieper crossings of Dnepropetrovsk and Zaporozhye, thereby severing the army group's communications across the river. He could, moreover, try to overrun army detachment lands, which was still in the process of assembling. If he succeeded, his way across the Dnieper would be open on both sides of Kromenshug, and he would subsequently be able to block the approaches to the Crimea and the Dnieper crossing at Kusen. The result would be the encirclement of the entire German southern wing. Even if the onset of the muddy season, which usually came about the end of March, were to interrupt such a far-reaching operation, the enemy could still be expected to continue pursuing this objective once it was over. In the light of these reflections, I sent OKH a fresh appreciation of the situation on 12 February for submission to Hitler. Basing myself on the operational considerations outlined above, I laid special emphasis on two points first, the ratio of forces. I pointed out that although the enemy had quite obviously been trying for almost three months past to precipitate matters on the Eastern Front by either demolishing or isolating our southern wing, the distribution of forces on our own side still took not the least account of this fact. Even if one allowed for the large number of divisions which had been sent to Don Army Group in recent months, the ratio of German to Soviet forces here and in Army Group B was still at least 1, 8, whereas in the case of Central and Northern Army Groups it stood at 1 to 4. 
Now it was quite understandable that OKH should hesitate to create new crisis spots by taking forces away from these two army groups. Furthermore, OKH had probably been quite right when it pointed out, in reply to previous representations from me on the subject, that almost the whole of the available replacements of troops and weapons were being sent to Don Army Group, as a result of which the fighting potential of Central and Northern Army Groups was lower than our own. To all this, however, we could retort that the divisions of Don Army Group had been involved in incessant and very heavy fighting for months on end, which was not so in the case of the two Army Groups in the North. Besides, our divisions were fighting in open country while Central and Northern Army groups were established in timber dugouts. The crucial factor, in any case, was that the enemy's decisive effort was directed not against the Central or Northern sectors of the German armies but against their Southern wing, and that it was inadmissible that we should continue to be left at such a numerical disadvantage. It could be taken for granted that even if we succeeded in averting the danger of being cut off from the Dnieper crossings, the enemy would still not lose sight of his more far-reaching aim of destroying the southern wing by surrounding it on the sea coast. For this reason there must at all costs be a radical improvement in the ratio of forces on the German southern wing, even if it involved making concessions on other parts of the front or in other theatres of war. In addition to ventilating this fundamental question of the overall distribution of forces, I also stated my views to OKH on the subsequent conduct of operations on the German southern wing. This will be dealt with in the chapter on Operation Citadel. During the night of 12 February the Army Group which had meanwhile been renamed Southern Army Group, moved its headquarters to Zaporozhye with a view to having the best possible control of the battle at what would shortly become the decisive spot. On the night of 13 February a directive was received from OKH which was obviously the sequel to my proposals of 9 February. It ruled, in accordance with these proposals, that a new army should deploy on the line Poltiva Dnepropetrovsk and another behind the southern wing of Second Army. In the event, however, neither army was ever formed. The one which was due to deploy behind Second Army did not arrive at all. While Second Army did receive a few reinforcements, they were given to it at the cost of those promised to ourselves. The army which was to deploy on the line Poltava, Dnepropetrovsk was army detachment lands already committed at Kharkov. It was subsequently placed under command of Southern Army Group, together with a sector of Army Group B inclusive of Belgrade. Second Army went over to Central Army Group, and HQ Army Group B was finally withdrawn from the Eastern Front Order of Battle. Fourth Phase, the German Counterstroke and so. Around the middle of February 1943, the acute crisis in the area of Southern Army Group reached a new climax. With it the danger that the entire southern wing of armies would be encircled by an extensive flanking movement from the neighboring sector in the north threatened to take shape sooner or later. And yet, paradoxically, it was in this very culmination of the crisis that the germs of a counterstroke lay. Initially, however, the picture became gloomier still. It was undoubtedly a hazardous step to withdraw Army Group B at this particular moment from command at the cleft in the front. Although, apart from Second Army, it now had nothing but the battered remains of various units at its disposal, it still constituted an essential link in the chain of command on the Eastern Front. Its removal was bound to cause the front to burst open at the seam between Central and Southern Army groups. In point of fact, moreover, HQ. Southern Army Group could not yet assume command of the Kharkov sector now apportioned to it, that is that held by Army detachment lands, as no signals links had been established. Before we could take over, Kharkov was due to be lost. The fact that the takeover could take place as quickly as it did was due to the consistently high performance of the Army Group Signals Regiment and the purposeful way in which our Chief Signals Officer, General Muller, handled our communications. As usual we got liberal assistance from my friend General Felgebel, the Chief of the Corps of Signals. But although the removal of HQ Army Group B complicated the handling of operations at the most delicate spot on the Eastern Front, 
it still served one useful purpose. By bringing army detachment lands under Southern Army Group, it enabled a headquarters to exercise exclusive command at the decisive place and the decisive time. In effect this contributed substantially to the final success of the winter campaign of 1942-3. Meanwhile the Kharkov area was to become a fresh source of anxiety or the army group, even if army group B or rather Hitler, by dint of his personal interventions, remained in command for a few days yet. Army detachment lands had been ordered by Hitler to hold Kharkov at all costs which now threatened to become a prestige issue like Stalingrad before it. With the object of relieving the pressure on Southern Army Group's left flank, moreover, the Army Detachment was to thrust in the direction of Losovaya with the SS Panzer Corps as its nucleus. Of the latter's three armoured divisions, there were still only two to hand. Clearly the Army Detachment could fulfil only one of these two tasks with the forces at its command. It could either fight around Kharkov or else lend a hand on the left wing of Southern Army Group. I therefore suggested to Hitler that Army detachment lands should forego Kharkov for the time being and try instead to beat the enemy south of the city. By this means the danger of the Army Group's being enveloped across the Dnieper on both sides of Kreminchug would be temporarily eliminated. On the other hand, it was reasonable to suppose that by throwing in 4th Panzer Army, we could cope on our own with the enemy making for the Dnieper crossings at Zaporozhye and Nepropetrovsk. Once Lands had dealt with the enemy south of Kharkov he could turn his attention to recapturing the city. This solution, however, did not suit Hitler, for whom Kharkov, as the fourth biggest city in the Soviet Union, had already become a symbol of prestige, and on 13 February he again passed a strict order to Army Detachment Lands, through Army Group B, to hold Kharkov at all costs. Stopped thereupon, I demanded to be informed by OKH whether this order would remain in force after Lands had come under my own command and whether we should adhere to it even if the SS Panzer Corps were threatened with encirclement in Kharkov. I also requested an answer to the general appreciation which I had sent to Lotson the previous day. In reply, General Zietzela told me that Hitler had described it as much too far reaching. To this I retorted that I considered it only right for an army group to think for two eight weeks ahead unlike the Supreme Command, which never seemed to look any further than the next three days. As for the situation at Kharkov, circumstances proved stronger than Hitler's will. The SS Panzer Corps, which really was in danger of being surrounded there, evacuated the city on 15 February incidentally against the orders of General Lands. This accomplished fact was reported to us by Army Group B, which finally relinquished its command about this time. Had the evacuation of Kharkov been ordered by a general of the army, Hitler would undoubtedly have had him court-martialed. But because this action had quite rightly been taken by the SS Panzer Corps, nothing of the sort occurred. All the same, the commander of Army Detachment Lands was replaced a few days later by General Kempf on the grounds that Lands was a mountaineer, while Kempf was a tank specialist. While the situation around Kharkov was manifestly deteriorating during the period in which Army Group B handed over the area to Southern Army Group, the possibility of the latter's being cut off from its communications across the Dnieper also became acute. It was reported on 10 February that the enemy, as we had been expecting him to do for some time past, was advancing in strength towards Pavlograd and Nepropetrovsk from the area west of Isum. If he succeeded in reaching Losovaya Junction or Pavlograd, or alternatively the station of Sinsinikovo hard to the southwest of Pavlograd, the railway link through Poltiva would be severed. At the same time the speed of arrival of the reinforcements promised by OKH slackened off again. Instead of the scheduled 37 troop trains per day, only six had come through on 14 February. Furthermore, Central Army Group announced that at present it lacked the necessary forces to make any serious attempt to cooperate with Southern Army Group along the line of cleavage between us. Apparently it would be more than happy if it succeeded in halting Second Army, which was falling back into a concavity which already extended far west of Busk. The situation had become so critical that Hitler decided to visit me at my headquarters. Presumably my various comments had set him thinking. 
much as I welcomed the prospect of putting my views to him personally and of letting him see the seriousness of our position for himself, it was naturally difficult to guarantee his safety in a sizable factory town like Zaporozhye, on which the enemy was advancing, particularly as he had expressed the intention of staying for some days. He and his suite, which included the chief of the general staff and General Jodl, and, as usual, his private cook, were accommodated in our office building, the whole vicinity of which had to be hermetically sealed off. Even then the situation was not very reassuring, for Hitler's arrival had not passed unnoticed. As he drove into Zaporozhye from the airfield he was recognized by soldiers and party officials in the streets. Practically the only troops we had available were our own defense company and a few anti-aircraft units, and before long enemy tanks were to get so close to the town that they could have fired at the airfield lying east of the Dnieper. Hitler arrived at my headquarters at noon on 17 February. I began by giving him the following review of the situation Army Detachment Hollett had reached the Meuse positions that same day closely pursued by the enemy. First Panzer Army had halted the enemy at Grishino, but not yet finished him off. In the Kramatorskayan area, likewise, the battle against the enemy forces which had come over the Lysychinsk Slavyansk line was still undecided. Army detachment lands, having evacuated Kharkov, had withdrawn southwest towards the Mosh sector. I then went on to inform Hitler of my intention to take the SS Panzer Corite out of Kharkov, leaving only the balance of army detachment lands in occupation. The SS Panzer Corps was to thrust southeastwards from the Krasnograd area in the general direction of Pavlograd, thereby coming into concert with 4th Panzer Army as it moved up the the job of these forces would be to smash the enemy advancing through the broad gap between 1st Panzer Army and Army Detachment lands. As soon as this had been achieved and there was no further danger that Army Detachment Hollett and 1st Panzer Army would be cut off, we should proceed to attack in the Kharkov area. Hitler at first refused to discuss the sequence of the operations I was proposing. He would not admit that there really were powerful forces advancing through the area between 1st Panzer Army and Army Detachment lands. He also feared that the operations I envisaged between the Dnieper and the Dunitz would become bogged down in the mud. As the winter was already quite far advanced, this was naturally a possibility to be reckoned with. But the main reason for Hitler's negative reaction was most probably the wish to recapture Kharkov at the earliest possible date which he hoped would be when the SS Panzer Corps had assembled its full complement of divisions. In fact the situation was such that a prior condition for any stroke in the direction of Kharkov was the removal of the threat to the Dnieper crossings. Unless the communications across this river were kept open, neither 1st Panzer Army nor Army Detachment Hollett could remain alive. For the stroke at Kharkov, moreover, the cooperation of at least a part of 4th Panzer Army would be needed. Since it was certain that when the Thor finally put an end to operations, it would do so in the region between the Dunitz and Dnieper before it affected the country around and north of Kharkov, one could reasonably hope that we should still have time to attack at Kharkov after we had beaten the enemy now advancing between 1st Panzer Army and Army Detachment lands. On the other hand, it was more than doubtful whether the two operations could be carried out the other way round. Because of the obstinacy with which Hitler invariably clung to his point of view, another interminable discussion ensued. I finally put an end to it by pointing out that as the SS Panzer Corps must in any case first assemble on the Kharkov Krasnograd road, which it could not do before 19 February at the earliest, the final decision on whether to go north or south need not be taken till then. This dilatory approach of mine was made possible by the reflection that 4th Panzer Army could not be available before 19 February either. I also felt justified in assuming that Hitler would be brought to reason by the course of events which he was now experiencing at first hand. On 18 February I saw Hitler again. The enemy had attacked in strength on the Meuse and penetrated at several places into the as yet unconsolidated front of Army Detachment Hollett. Furthermore, it had still not been possible to destroy the enemy cavalry corps encircled behind this front at Dibultsvo. I submitted to Hitler that in spite of this it was still urgently necessary to withdraw motorized units from here to the western wing, 
even if it were not possible at that particular moment. The enemy mechanized corps in the deep flank of 1st Panzer Army at Grishino was not yet defeated either, so that the forces committed there were still tied up, on the other hand, there was now incontestable evidence that the enemy in the gap between 1st Panzer Army and Army Detachment lands was indeed advancing in force against the Dnieper crossings. His 267 rifle division had been identified south of Krasnograd, and he had taken Pavlograd with 35 guards division, which included a tank battalion. An Italian division located there, one left over from the former Italian army had hurriedly pulled out on the approach of the enemy. Army detachment lands had reported that the wheeled vehicle units of the Death's Head SS Panzer Division were completely bogged down between Kiev and Poltava. This washed out the northward stroke to retake Kharkov which had been Hitler's primary concern. If the SS Panzer Corps had not even been able to hold the city without the Death's Head Division, it was less likely than ever to recapture it when the latter's availability date could not be anticipated for the time being. The only thing we could do, therefore, was to strike southeastwards and destroy the enemy advancing through the gap between Army Detachment Lands and 1st Panzer Army. Since the thaw must be expected in that area, too, in the very near future, there was no time to lose. In the circumstances Hitler agreed to my idea of immediately committing the Reich Division, as the first available formation of the SS Panzer Corps, in the direction of Pavlograd. The Obstandarty Division was to provide 4th Panzer Army's operation with cover against the enemy pushing hard southwards from Kharkov. At all events it was now to be hoped that 4th Panzer Army, reinforced by the Reich Division, would be successful. Following this decision, I put my view to Hitler on the situation generally. I pointed out that even if we managed, and it was far from certain that we should to avoid any unfavorable developments until the muddy season set in, I still had to think ahead. The mud would not give us a break of more than a few weeks. After that the army group would have a front of 470 miles to hold, for which, inclusive of the forces of army detachment lands, there were 32 divisions available. On the other hand, it could be taken for granted that once the muddy season was over, the enemy would again direct his main effort against the German southern wing and go all out to encircle it on the Black Sea. A front of 470 miles defended by only about 30 divisions, I told Hitler, could be pierced by a stronger enemy at any point he liked. Above all, no one could prevent him from steadily outflanking the army group to the north until he reached the Sea of Azov or the Black Sea. Once the muddy season finished, therefore, the army group must not remain stationary until the enemy broke through somewhere or outflanked it in the north. It could only afford to stay where it was if OKH were able to launch a well timed offensive stroke to relieve the pressure on the front, which still projected a long way eastwards. My purpose in putting forward these ideas was to persuade Hitler to consider operations on a long term basis for once. It was obvious, however, that he had no intention whatever of committing himself. While admitting that the army group's forces would be too weak to defend that front in the coming year, he would not accept the ratio of strengths I had given him. He did not dispute the presence opposite us of the 341 enemy formations we had identified, but contended that they were no longer of any value. When I objected that our own divisions were also at the end of their tether, he replied that they would be brought fully up to strength and issued with new weapons during the muddy season, which in point of fact they were. He would not recognize, however, that during that same period the enemy would bring his 1926 class of one and a half million men to the front. Neither would he admit that with the number of tanks the enemy could produce in two months, that is the approximate duration of the muddy season, he could refit about 60 armored brigades. Instead, Hitler was at pains to emphasize the decisive importance which the Dunitz area would have for Soviet tank production if it were once to fall back into enemy hands. As for Germany's own conduct of operations in the East in 1943, he could not take the forces for a large offensive from any of the other theaters, nor could he find them from newly drafted units. On the other hand, he did think that it would be possible to take limited and localized action with the help of new weapons. 
This brought Hitler right back to the subject of weapons and weapon production, and it proved impossible to pin him down on his intentions regarding the coming summer campaign. We lived, it seemed, in two entirely different worlds. On 19 February, a further conference took place, and this time Field Marshal V. Clist had been asked to attend. Apparently Hitler's stay at my headquarters had quite impressed him after all as to the dangers on the German southern wing, for he announced that Army Gruppe was henceforth to transfer whatever forces it could possibly spare to Southern Army Group. In his own words, Army Gruppe would henceforth be regarded as an adjacent reservoir of forces for the Southern Army Group front, which presumably meant that his plan for bringing the Cuban bridgehead back into the operational picture at some later date was now on the shelf. The future was to show, unfortunately, that this reservoir was not to be exploited on anything like the scale which the transport facilities over the Crimea would have allowed. The Cuban bridgehead was to go on living its isolated existence. Experience has long taught that nothing is more difficult than to get forces released from a place once they have been wrongly tied up the dot that day tension mounted even higher when the enemy, apparently in considerable strength, reached the railway station of Sinsenakovo. As a result of this he not only temporarily blocked the main supply line to the center and right wing of the army group but was also less than 35, 40 miles away from the headquarters in which the Führer of the Reich was staying. As there were no troops whatever on the intervening ground, I was most relieved when Hitler flew home the same afternoon. It was quite conceivable that by the following day the enemy tanks could have denied us the use of our airfield lying east of the Dnieper. The last point I had made to Hitler was that I should need almost all the armored divisions for the blows I intended delivering on the western wing, which meant they would have to be taken away from the Meuse positions. If it had been possible to hold the latter until now, the only reason was that the main body of the enemy forces advancing on them had to pass through the Rostov bottleneck and had not yet arrived. The possibility that the Dunitz area would be taken from the east, therefore, was one which could not be ignored. Nothing could be done to prevent it until we had first removed the danger of the army groups being cut off from its rear communications. This Hitler seemed to grasp. In any case, I had the impression that Hitler's visit to my headquarters had helped to bring home to him the danger of encirclement which immediately threatened the southern wing of the eastern front and would continue to do so for some time to come. In spite of this, a story was soon afterwards circulated by OKW or General Schmunt that the real purpose of Hitler's trip had been to put some backbone into the army group. I am not aware that my headquarters was ever in need of this. Even if we were not prepared to do what Hitler demanded and fight stolidly for every foot of ground regardless of the consequences of holding on at all costs, I do not think it would be easy to find another headquarters which, in the teeth of so many crises, clung more stubbornly than our own to its will for victory. In this respect there was never the slightest divergence between my staff and myself. The battle between Dunitz and Nper on 19 February the army group ordered 4th Panzer Army to deploy for its counter-attack against the enemy who had come over the line Pereshki Pino Pavlograd Grishina to cut off the army group from the Dnieper. On 20 February the picture of the enemy's operational intentions became completely clear and proved to be exactly as we had anticipated. On our eastern front the enemy attacked attacked army detachment haul its positions on the Meuse, breaking through at three main points. To cut our communications over the Nipah he appeared to have committed in addition to the forces held up by us at Grishino and Kramatorskaya, an army with a strength of three rifle divisions, two tank corps and some cavalry. Simultaneously he was trying to break through the weak front of army detachment Kempf, General Lanz having now been relieved by General Kempf to the west and southwest of Kharkov. Furthermore, he was making a bid to envelop this army detachment on its northwestern wing and, by reaching further north, to outflank it completely. In the face of these developments the army group had two different things to accomplish. 
it must try to hold the eastern front on the Meuse to the best of its ability though whether it could do so with such limited forces and without any reserves was an open question. Secondly, it must use 4th Panzer Army to bring about the quick defeat of the enemy in between 1st Panzer Army and Army Detachment Kempf in order to prevent its own isolation from the Dnieper crossings. If it failed in this, most of the army group's forces would shortly be immobilized through a lack of motor fuel. Once it had been possible to beat the enemy force between the Dunnets and Dnieper, it would depend on how the situation had developed in the meantime whether we could immediately thrust northwards with all our mobile forces in order to restore the position of Army Detachment Kempf. On the other hand, it might first be necessary for 4th Panzer Army to fight another action in the area of 1st Panzer Army if the latter had still not succeeded in dealing on its own with the enemy at Grishino and Kramatorskaya. In any case we must hold off on our northern wing, that is in Army Detachment Kempf's area, for the time being. All that the latter could be given to do at present was to bar the way to the Dnieper be it through Krasnograd to Dnepropetrovsk or through Poltovitikram and Shug, by putting up the toughest possible resistance. Should the enemy by any chance be aspiring to reach Kiev, and the many signs that he was were making Hitler increasingly apprehensive, we could only wish him a pleasant trip. Such a far-flung outflanking movement was hardly likely to achieve any positive results before the muddy season set in. 21 St. February brought us the first hints of relief on what at present were the army group's most vital stretches of front. The eastern front on the Meuse had held. The remnants of the enemy cavalry corps long surrounded behind it at Dibbeltsvo were finally compelled to surrender. An enemy tank corps which had been encircled after breaking through the Meuse front at Matvey of Kurgan was also doomed to destruction. On the right wing of 1st Panzer Army, the enemy was maintaining his pressure on the Freta Pico group, obviously with the object of next unhinging the Meuse position or outflanking the northern front of 1st Panzer Army. Opposite the latter, everything remained quiet. Monitored wireless messages made it clear that the Soviet force engaged on the western front of 1st Panzer Army at Grishino and in the Kramatorskayan area, that is the Popov group, was faring badly. Evidently its supplies had broken down. 4th Panzer Army had taken Pavlograd, and there was reason to hope that its last formations would have closed up with the main body before the roads softened. The fact that a not very powerful enemy tank force had thrust close up to Zaporozhye did not now imply any great danger. It ran out of petrol some 12 miles from the town and was duly destroyed piecemeal. Unfortunately a new division destined for Pavlograd, 332, was diverted to the right wing of Central Army Group by OKH while already on its way up to us. Though Second Army's position was probably not at all rosy, Southern Army Group had a prior claim now that we were finally on the way to regaining the initiative. Whether the enemy made any progress towards Kiev in the meantime was comparatively unimportant. That the enemy did harbor such intentions was shown by the fact that Soviet forces were advancing in considerable strength from the Belgorod direction towards Uktaka, clearly with a view to getting round the northern flank of Army Detachment Kempf. In the next few days, 4th Panzer Army's counterstroke achieved the success for which we had been hoping. With that the initiative in this campaign at last passed back to the German side. For a start, the army smashed the forces advancing towards the Dnieper crossings that is those in the area around and south of Pavlograd. What Hitler had refused to accept was now substantiated, in that there did prove to be two tank, one rifle and one cavalry corps involved. Immediately afterwards it was possible, in cooperation with 1st Panzer Army, to defeat the four enemy tank and mechanized corps opposite its western front. By 1st March, it was clear that by reason of his defeats between the Dunnitz and Dnieper, the enemy was also beginning to soften up opposite the northern front of 1st Panzer Army and that the latter would regain the Dunnitz line in this sector. One felt a strong temptation to chase the enemy across the still frozen river and take him in the rear in and west of Kharkov. To have our hands free to advance across the middle Dunnitz, however, it was first necessary to knock out the southern wing of the enemy's Kharkov group, which was present in force on the Berestovaya, southwest of the city. Whether this could still be done in view of the imminent thaw was more than doubtful. 
Consequently the army group had to content itself initially with seeking out and defeating the Kharkov enemy west of the Donitz dot in the southern strip of the army group's operational area, near to the coast, it had already started to thaw. At the end of February the enemy on the Meuse front had given up his attempt to break through with armored and other mobile formations and sent in rifle divisions instead. Evidently he wanted to have at least some bridgeheads west of the river before the mud came. After even this broad assault had failed, his offensive finally degenerated into fruitless local attacks. By 2nd March, the army group was able to survey the results of its first counterblow, delivered by 4th Panzer Army and the left wing of 1st Panzer Army against the enemy between the Dunnets and Dnieper. In the course of this attack and army detachment, Hollitz's successful defensive on the Meuse. The armies of the enemy's southwest front had received such a beating that they were temporarily incapable of further offensive action. Particularly heavy punishment had been meted out to the forces which had driven forward against the left wing of 1st Panzer Army and into the gap between the latter and Army Detachment Kempf, the Soviet 6th Army, the Popov Group which had fought at Grishino, and 1st Guards Army. The enemy's 25 tank corps and three rifle divisions could be written off completely, while three and ten tank corps and four guards tank corps, one independent armored brigade, one mechanized brigade, one rifle division and one ski brigade were known to have had a severe battering. In addition, heavy losses had been suffered by one guards tank corps and 18 tank corps as well as by six rifle divisions and two ski brigades. According to reports received from our own troops, the enemy had left some 23,000 dead on the Dunnett Sniper battlefield, and the booty included 615 tanks, 354 field pieces, 69 anti-aircraft guns and large numbers of machine guns and mortars. The figure of 9,000 prisoners appeared small in comparison. The reason for it was that our own forces, most of which were armored, had not been able to form an unbroken ring round the enemy. Because of the cold particularly at night the troops tended to bunch together in and around the villages, with the result that individual Soviet soldiers and units which abandoned their vehicles were left with plenty of room to slip away over the intervening countryside. It had not been possible to block the Dunnets in the enemy's rear as it was still icebound and entirely passable to lightly armed troops moving on foot. Apart from the enemy losses already mentioned, four guards mechanized corps, which had been encircled behind the Mies front, and seven guards cavalry corps were also wiped out. The Battle of Kharkov after thus regaining the initiative by the victory between the Dunnets and Dnieper, Southern Army Group proceeded to deliver the stroke against the Voronezh front that is the enemy forces located in the Kharkov area, in accordance with an order already issued on 28 February. The intention was to attack these forces in their southern flank with the aim either of turning the latter or, if at all possible, of later driving into the enemy rear from the east. Our object was not the possession of Kharkov but the defeat, and if possible the destruction of the enemy units located there. Hence the first priority was to smash the enemy's southern wing which consisted of 3rd Soviet tank army on the Berestovaya southwest of the city. This was achieved by 4th Panzer Army by 5th March. Of 3rd tank army, 12 and 4 tank corps, a cavalry corps and 3 rifle divisions were partly cut to pieces and partly captured in a small pocket at Krasnograd. While there were once again relatively few prisoners, our own troops put the number of enemy dead at 12,000 and reported the capture of 61 tanks, 225 guns and 600 motor vehicles. A turn in the weather prevented the army group from now moving against the rear of the enemy harassing army detachment camp for Tiktika and Poltava in order to make him fight a battle with reversed front. This would have necessitated 4th Panzer armies crossing the Dunnets downstream from Kharkiv but the ice was liable to break up at any time and no pontoon bridges would have held against the drift ice. Even to launch a smaller scale flanking movement by crossing the Mosh and taking the city through which the enemy's rear communications ran, from behind hardly seemed feasible now that the ground was thawing out. 
thus an attempt had to be made to roll up the enemy from the flank and to force him away from Kharkov in the process. With this aim in view, 4th Panzer Army, including the SS Panzer Corps, the last formation of which, the Death's Head Division, had meanwhile arrived complete, attacked in a northward direction from the Krasnograd area on 7th March. Army Detachment Kempf joined in as soon as the enemy began to relax his pressure on its own front. The attack made good progress in the days that followed. By this time, however, the enemy had recognized the threat to his Voronezh front. Our radio monitors ascertained that he was moving what appeared to be several tank and mechanized corps from the Voroshilovgrad area to Isum, presumably for use against the flank of 4th Panzer Army as it drove north of Kharkov. These, however, no longer achieved any notable impression, either because they had expended their offensive capacity in the preceding battles around Voroshilovgrad or on the Meuse, or else because the thawing of the Dunits hindered their intervention. All the enemy could do was to win a minor bridgehead northwest of Isam on the south bank of the river. He also fetched two guards tank corps up to Kharkov from the east and pulled certain of his forces which had been harassing Army Detachment Kempf's northern wing and 2nd Army back to Bogodjukov. As 2nd Army was too weak to go over to the offensive itself, it seemed doubtful whether we should succeed in preventing the forces which had pushed a long way west towards and north of Aktika from escaping eastwards. Whatever happened, though, we wanted to try to force the enemy facing army detachment camp further south away from Kharkov or alternatively to cut him off from the Dunitz crossings east of the river. If this came off, Kharkov could be taken by a coup de main. At all costs the army group wished to avoid Kharkov's becoming a second Stalingrad in which our assault forces might become irretrievably committed. It was inevitable, however that the name of Kharkov should act as a magic stimulus on the fighting troops and less senior command staffs. The SS Panzer Corps, wishing to lay the recaptured city at its Führer's feet as a symbol of victory, was eager to take the shortest route there, so that the army group had to intervene vigorously on more than one occasion to ensure that the corps did not launch a frontal assault on Kharkov and become tied down the while enemy elements still fighting to the west of the city were able to make good their escape. In the end it was possible to bring the SS Panzer Corps round to the east. The city fell without difficulty, and we succeeded in cutting off the retreat of considerable numbers of the enemy across the Dunitz. As has been seen, the enemy had been compelled by developments in the area around and south of Kharkov to thin out his forces opposite Army Detachment Kempf when they were already near to Poltava and in possession of Aktika further north. Subsequently he had to move them back towards Kharkov and Belgrade, with Army Detachment Kempf in close pursuit. On 10th March Hitler paid a headquarters a further visit. In addition to briefing him on the current situation, I dealt in particular with our view of how operations should be conducted at the end of the muddy season, which was now setting in. This will be covered in the next chapter. On 14th March, Kharkov fell to the SS Panzer Corps. At the same time, on the northern wing of Army Detachment Kempf, the Gross Deutschland Division moved swiftly on Belgrade. The enemy once again threw in strong armored forces to oppose it. But these were wiped out at Gvron. The capture of Kharkov and Belgorod marked the conclusion of Army Group's second counterblow, as the increasing muddiness of the ground did not permit any further operations. As a matter of fact, the Army Group would have liked to wind up by clearing out, with the help of Central Army Group, the enemy salient extending some distance westwards of Busk in order to shorten the German front. The scheme had to be abandoned, however as Central Army Group declared itself unable to cooperate. As a result the salient continued to constitute a troublesome dent in our front which left certain openings to the enemy and at the same time cramped our own operations. Nevertheless, the Army Group was now securely in possession of the entire Dunitz front from Belgorod down to where the Meuse positions branched off from it. These Dunitz and Meuse fronts together formed the very same line as had been held by German troops in the winter of 1941-2. Retrospective, 
In conclusion, we cast a final glance at the full course and outcome of the 1942 3 winter campaign in South Russia. We must begin by acknowledging the successes attained on the Soviet side, the magnitude of which was incontestable. The Russians had contrived to encircle and destroy the German Sixth Army, the strongest we had in the field. They had, moreover, swept four Allied armies clean off the map. Many brave members of the latter had fallen in battle, and considerable numbers had gone into captivity. What Allied troops remained had disintegrated and had sooner or later to be withdrawn for good from the zone of operations. Even though it was possible to reconstitute the majority of Sixth Army's divisions from residual units and replacements and for Army Detachment Hollett to assume the designation of Sixth Army in March 1943, the loss of the bulk of the fighting troops of 20 divisions, besides a considerable proportion of the Army artillery and engineers, was quite irreparable. And limited though the fighting efficiency of the Allied armies might be, their loss was still a considerable one, depriving us as it did of a substitute for German forces on quiet sectors of the front. Yet despite the disappearance of five whole armies from the German order of battle, no one can say that this alone need have decisively influenced the outcome of the war. It was accompanied by the loss of the whole of the immense territories we had won in the 1942 summer offensive, together with their natural resources. The grab for the Caucasian oil fields, one of the fundamental aims of that offensive, had failed to come off, and here we may note that this economic goal, on which Goring had been so insistent, decisively contributed to the offensive's split. In their pursuit of this economic objective people had forgotten that its attainment and retention always depended on defeating the main body of the enemy forces. All the same, it had still been possible to hold the part of the Dunwich Basin that was essential to the conduct of the war. But great though their gains undoubtedly were, the Russians had still not succeeded in winning their decisive victory over the German southern wing, the destruction of which could probably never have been made good by our side. By the end of the winter campaign the initiative was back in German hands, and the Russians had suffered two defeats. Though not decisive in character, these did lead to a stabilization of the front and offered the German commander prospect of fighting the war in the east to a draw. Nevertheless, we could clearly bury any hope of changing the course of the war by an offensive in the summer of 1943. Our loss of fighting power had already been far too great for anything of that order. The obvious inference for the Supreme Command to draw was that it must strive with every means at its disposal to come to terms with at least one of Germany's opponents. Similarly, it must realize the need to base its subsequent conduct of the war in the East on a policy of sparing its own forces, particularly by avoiding the loss of entire armies, as at Stalingrad while seeking to wear down the offensive capacity of the enemies. To that end, resolutely ignoring all secondary aspirations, it must switch the main effort to the Eastern theatre for as long as Germany's Western adversaries were unable to land in France or to deliver a critical blow from the Mediterranean area. If we now return to the 1942-3 winter offensive and its outcome, the next question to ask is why the Soviet command despite its big successes in this campaign, did not achieve the decisive success of annihilating the whole of the German southern wing? After all, with that overwhelming number of formations and the operational advantages it possessed at the outset, it had the highest possible trumps to play. It must be emphasized for a start that the Soviet command showed no lack of aggressive spirit and engaged its troops without the least regard for casualties in order to attain its objectives. The troops themselves, as was almost invariably true of the Russians, fought with great bravery and at times made unbelievable sacrifices. Nonetheless, there was an unmistakable fall off in the quality of the infantry, and the losses of artillery in 1941 too had still not been made good. Since the beginning of the war the Soviet leaders had unquestionably learnt a great number of lessons, especially regarding the organization and use of large armored formations. Although the enemy had possessed large numbers of tanks as early as 1941, he had not known then how to use them as individual members of a united whole. 
by now he had them properly organized in his tank and mechanized corps and had also taken over the German technique of penetration in depth. In spite of this we almost always succeeded, except in the situation of November 1942, in ultimately beating or destroying these tank and mechanized formations, even when they had already driven deep into the German forward areas. After the encirclement of Sixth Army, on the other hand, they were never again able to drive through to vital spots with such speed and in such strength as to fulfill the aim of cutting off the German southern wing, whether on the Don, the coast of the Sea of Azov or the Lower Dnieper. Except for Stalingrad, where Hitler gave it the opportunity, the Soviet command was never able to bring about a battle of encirclement as we had done on various occasions in 1941, taking several thousand prisoners in the process. This held good in spite of the Russians' enormous preponderance of forces in the winter of 1942-3 and the fact that the opening situation and the collapse of the Allied armies afforded them a free passage into the rear of the German front. We, on the other hand, had had to fight a mainly frontal battle in 1941. So let us take a look at the Soviet leadership at the top. In view of the operational situation that existed at the end of the German summer offensive, the strategic aim of encircling the German southern wing was so palpably evident that it could not possibly be overlooked. The idea of breaking through the fronts of the Allied armies was also a very obvious move. In other words, not very much genius was required on the Soviet side to draft an operations plan in the late autumn of 1942. The first stroke, the encirclement of Sixth Army, was undoubtedly correct. If it succeeded and the German Supreme Command did everything to see that it did the strongest striking force the Germans had would be eliminated. It would have been better if this first blow had been coordinated with the offensive against the fronts of the Italian and Hungarian armies, in order that every effort should be made from the start to cut off the German forces at Rostov or on the Sea of Azov in one unified and large-scale assault operation. Clearly the available artillery was not equal to the task, and for this reason, presumably, the breakthrough operations had to be staggered. It is also conceivable that the transport situation did not allow the sum total of assault forces to be assembled and supplied simultaneously. However, the unexpectedly swift and complete collapse of the Allied armies on our own side compensated the Soviets to a great extent for the inconveniences which this staggering of the three breakthrough offensives entailed. When the Soviet command failed to accomplish its mission of tying off the German southern wing on the lower Don, the Sea of Azov 4, in the last instance, the Dnieper, the reason was certainly not that its offensive was necessarily bound to get bogged down in that extensive zone of operations. When considered by the standards of modern warfare, the distances to be covered by the Soviet assault groups to their various objectives were by no means excessive. Nor were the German reserves which were thrown in to meet them so strong that the Soviet offensive need have come to a standstill short of its decisive objectives and have ultimately ended in a serious reverse. On the contrary, one must say that, with the exception of Stalingrad, the Soviet command never managed to coordinate strength and speed when hitting a decisive spot. In the first phase of the winter campaign, it undoubtedly tied down unnecessarily large forces against Sixth Army in order to make doubly sure of its prize. In doing so, it let slip the chance to cut off the German southern wing's supply lines on the lower Don. The forces that attacked the Chur front were certainly strong but they did not act in concert. After the breakthrough on the Italian front the Soviet command similarly failed to stake everything on quickly crossing the Dunitz and reaching Rostov. With such far-reaching objectives involved, there was admittedly a danger that the Russians would later be attacked in the flank themselves, but they should have expected to derive the necessary protection here from the offensive due to be launched on the Hungarian front immediately afterwards. Risky, I agree. But anyone who is not prepared to take such risks will never achieve decisive and as was essential in this case speedy results. Even after the successful breakthrough against the Hungarian army, which tore open the German front from the Donets to Voronezh, the Soviet command still failed to press on with sufficient speed and strength in the decisive direction towards the Dnieper crossings. 
instead of putting all its eggs in one basket and simply leaving a strong, concentrated shock group to provide offensive protection to the West. It squandered its forces in a series of far-ranging uncoordinated thrusts at Aktika and Poltava by way of Kursk, against the Dnieper and across the Dunitz line Slaviansk Lysikonsk Voroshilovgrad. In this way it enabled their German command to be stronger at the decisive spots when the time came. Schlieffen once said that both sides in a battle or campaign, the loser just as much as the winner, contribute to the outcome by the various actions they take. The German Supreme Command's share of responsibility for the loss of Sixth Army and indeed for the whole crisis which arose on the southern wing of the Eastern Front in the winter of 1942-3 has already been plainly stated. It is thus only fair to mention what contribution the German side made to the Russians' ultimate failure to encircle the German southern wing. In this respect only one thing need be said but for the almost superhuman achievements of the German troops and their commanders in facing up to an enemy many times their superior in numbers, the army group could never have succeeded in bringing its defeat underfoot. This winter campaign could never have been fought had not our brave infantry divisions, unlike the troops of our allies, and often without adequate anti-tank defenses stood firm before the assaults of the enemy's armoured formations and, by closing the front behind his tanks whenever they broke through, ensured their ultimate destruction. A similar debt was owed to our panzer divisions, which fought with unparalleled versatility and more than doubled their effectiveness by the way they dodged from one place to the next. The German fighting troops, convinced of their superiority as soldiers, stood their ground in the most desperate situations and their courage and self-sacrifice did much to compensate for the enemy's numerical preponderance. One thing must not be forgotten. It was the valiant Sixth Army which, by loyally fighting on to the last, snatched the palm of an annihilating victory against the German southern wing from the enemy's hand. Had it, instead of resisting till early February, given up the struggle as soon as its position became hopeless, the Russians could have thrown in such an extra weight of forces at the crucial spots that their aim to encircle the whole southern wing of the German front would most probably have been achieved. Such was Sixth Army's vital contribution to our success in once more stabilizing the situation on the Eastern Front in March 1943. Though the self-sacrifice of the men of Sixth Army may have been in vain so far as the final outcome of the war was concerned, this can never annul its moral worth. That is why, now that we have come to the end of the chapter, the name of Sixth Army is to shine forth for one last time. This army fulfilled the highest demand that can ever be made on a soldier to fight on to the last in a hopeless situation for the sake of his comrades. 14. Operation Citadel The preceding chapter has shown that the winter campaign of 1942-3, which had started with the Russian breakthrough on the Don and Volga on both sides of Stalingrad, did not ultimately bring the Soviet command the decisive operational success for which it might have hoped. The question now was how the German side should continue the struggle the following summer. Obviously, after so many major formations had been lost, there would no longer be the forces available to mount another crucial offensive on the scale of 1941 and 1942. What did still seem possible given proper leadership on the German side, was that the Soviet Union could be worn down to such an extent that it would tire of its already excessive sacrifices and be ready to accept a stalemate. At the time in question this was far from being wishful thinking. On the other hand, such a name could not be realized by going over to purely defensive, static warfare. For one thing, there were not enough German divisions to defend the far-flung front from the Baltic to the Black Sea decisively. For another, it was unlikely that the Soviets would take any action until the Western Allies landed in Europe the danger of which had become all the more acute in the light of recent events in North Africa. The German command thus had very little time left in which to force a draw in the East. It could only do so if it succeeded, within the framework of a now inevitable strategic defensive, in dealing the enemy powerful blows of a localized character which would sap his strength to a decisive degree first and foremost through losses in prisoners. 
This presupposed an operational elasticity on our part which would give maximum effect to the still superior quality of the German command staffs and fighting troops. We naturally had to consider what action the Soviet command would take once the muddy season was over. Would Stalin wait until his allies had met his repeated demands for a landing on the European mainland? Though it seemed very natural that he should do so, there were still many arguments against it. Soviet self-confidence had undoubtedly increased since the big successes late in the previous autumn. Could the Soviet leaders possibly afford, from a psychological point of view, to call a halt to their loudly advertised liberation of the holy soil of Russia? Must the Kremlin not be anxious to beat its allies to the Balkans, the traditional target of Russian expansionism? Assuming that the enemy resumed the offensive as soon as he had made good his losses, therefore, it seemed certain that he would continue to direct the main pressure of his attacks against the southern wing of the German front, that is against southern army group. The bulge in the German front, which ran down the Dunitz and Meuse from a point below Kharkov, embracing the valuable coal mining and industrial region south of that city, was just begging to be sliced off. Should the enemy succeed in breaking through around Kharkov or even across the middle Dunitz, he could still achieve his aim of the previous winter and destroy the German southern wing on the Black Sea coast. At this time Army Grouper was still in the Cuban bridgehead, by the same stroke he would regain possession of the precious Dunitz area and the granaries of the Ukraine, in addition to opening the way to the Balkans and Romanian oil fields with all the political consequences this would have entailed in regard to Turkey. In no other sector of the Eastern Front was the Soviet Union offered such immense opportunities in the military, economic or political fields. The decisive thrust, then, would be delivered against Southern Army Group of Act which, in view of the Russians' numerical superiority, naturally did not exclude the possibility of smaller scale offensives in other parts of the front. Southern Army Group had on a number of occasions brought these considerations to the notice of OKH and Hitler. What the latter ultimately had to decide was whether the overall situation allowed us to wait for the Russians to start an offensive and then to hit them hard on the backhand at the first good opportunity, or whether we should attack as early as possible ourselves and, still within the framework of a strategic defensive, strike a limited blow on the forehand. The army group preferred the former solution as one offering better prospects operationally, and had already submitted a tentative plan to Hitler in February. It envisaged that if the Russians did as we anticipated and launched a pincer attack on the Dunitz area from the north and south an operation which could sooner or later be supplemented by an offensive around Kharkov Iraq of front along the Dunitz and Meuse should be given up in accordance with an agreed timetable in order to draw the enemy westwards towards the lower Dnieper. Simultaneously all the reserves that could possibly be released, in particular the bulk of the armor, were to assemble in the area west of Kharkov first to smash the enemy assault forces which we expected to find there and then to drive into the flank of those advancing in the direction of the lower Dnieper. In this way the enemy would be doomed to suffer the same fate on the coast of the Sea of Azov as he had in store for us on the Black Sea. The plan did not meet with Hitler's approval, however. He was still preoccupied with the economic aspects of the Dunitz Basin and apprehensive about the possible repercussions of an even temporary evacuation on the attitudes of Turkey and Romania. But what probably did most to prejudice him was his belief that we must fight for every foot of the ground he had won from Stalin in the winter of 1941 and which had in his view saved the German army from a Napoleonic retreat. Besides this, However, he undoubtedly shrank from the risks which the proposed operation would assuredly entail. Inwardly, perhaps, he did not trust himself to cope with them, for in spite of having a certain eye for tactics, he still lacked the ability of a great captain. Consequently our minds now turned to the idea of a forehand stroke. An attempt must be made to strike the enemy a blow of limited scope before he could recover from his losses in the winter campaign and resuscitate his beaten forces. A suitable target was presented by the Soviet salient which protruded far into our own front line around the city of Husk. The Russians facing the boundary between central and southern army groups had been able to retain this when the muddy season set in, 
and it now formed a jumping off position for any attacks they might be contemplating against the flanks of the two German army groups. The appreciable Soviet forces inside the salient would be cut off if our attack were successful, and provided that we launched it early enough we could hope to catch them in a state of unpreparedness. In particular, the enemy would have to commit the armored units which had been so severely battered towards the end of the winter campaign, thereby giving us a chance to punish them wholesale. And so we come to Operation Citadel, the last major offensive operation undertaken by the Germans in the east. For this attack against the Gorsk Bulge, Southern Army Group provided two armies, 4th Panzer and Detachment Kempf, comprising 11 armored or Panzer Grenadier divisions and 5 infantry. In order to do so, of course, it had to thin out the Dunitz and Meuse fronts considerably. For the attack from the north, Central Army Group provided 9th Army, consisting of 6 armored or Panzer Grenadier divisions and 5 infantry. The principal danger here lay in the armies having to assemble in the salient jutting out to the east around Orel, where the enemy might attack it in the rear from the east and north. Operation Citadel was timed to start in the first half of May when the ground could be expected to have dried out sufficiently and the enemy would still not have finished refitting especially his armor. At the beginning of May, however, Hitler decided against the advice of the two army group commanders to postpone Citadel till June, by which time, he hoped, our armored divisions would be stronger still after being fitted out with new tanks. He stuck to his decision even after it had been pointed out to him that the unfavorable developments in Tunisia could mean that if Citadel were put off any longer, there would be a danger of its coinciding with an enemy landing on the continent. Nor would he recognize that the longer one waited, the more armor the Russians would have particularly as their tank output undoubtedly exceeded that of Germany. As a result of delays in the delivery of our own new tanks. The army group was not ultimately able to move off on Citadel until the beginning of July, by which time the essential advantage of the forehand blow was lost. The whole idea had been to attack before the enemy had replenished his forces and got over the reverses of the winter. At the same time it was certain that the longer we took to launch the operation, the greater must be the threat to those of southern army groups armies in the Dunitz Muse salient which had had to hand over all their available forces and, most of all, to the OL bulge as the jumping off base of Central Army Group's 9th Army. On 5th July, the German armies were finally able to attack. Though every deception and camouflage measure had been taken, we could no longer expect to catch the enemy unawares after a delay of that length. On the assault front of Central Army Group, 9th Army succeeded in penetrating the enemy fortifications to a depth of about 9 miles in the first two days. After heavy fighting in which it had to beat off counter-attacks by enemy reserves, it managed to deepen this penetration by a few more miles up till 9th July, but then it came to a halt before a built-in system of positions on a dominant height to the rear of the front. Its intention of resuming the attack in a few days' time was frustrated by the enemy, who attacked the OL bulge in strength from the north and northeast on NTH July. To support 2nd Panzer Army in holding this front, the Army Group found itself compelled to throw strong mobile forces from 9th Army into the OL battle. The offensive in Southern Army Group's area developed more favorably. Here, too, the attack through the enemy's deeply echelon defenses proved difficult enough and made only slow progress. However, by NTH July it had been possible to break through the last position into the area of Prokhorovka and Doboyan. During this time hasty counter-attacks by the enemy's mobile reserves were beaten off, in the course of which 10 tank or mechanized corps were either smashed or severely battered. By 13th July the enemy facing Southern Army Group had lost 24,000 men as prisoners, 1,800 tanks. 267 field pieces and 1,080 anti-tank guns. On 13th July, when the battle was at its climax and the issue apparently at hand, the commanders of the two army groups concerned were summoned to Hitler. He opened the conference by announcing that the Western Allies had landed in Sicily that day and that the situation there had taken an extremely serious turn. The Italians were not even attempting to fight, and the island was likely to be lost. 
Since the next step might well be a landing in the Balkans all over Italy, it was necessary to form new armies in Italy and the Western Balkans. These forces must be found from the Eastern Front, so Citadel would have to be discontinued. Thus the very thing had come to pass of which I had warned Hitler in May. The commander of Central Army Group, Field Marshal V. Kludge, reported that 9th Army was making no further headway and that he was having to deprive it of all its mobile forces to check the enemy's deep incursions into the OL salient. There could be no question of continuing with Citadel or of resuming the operation at a later date. Speaking for my own army group, I pointed out that the battle was now at its culminating point, and that to break it off at this moment would be tantamount to throwing a victory away. On no account should we let go of the enemy until the mobile reserves he had committed were completely beaten. Nonetheless, Hitler ruled that Citadel was to be called off on account of the situation in the Mediterranean and the state of affairs in Central Army Group. The only concession he would make was that Southern Army Group should continue the attack until it had achieved its aim of smashing the enemy's armored reserves. As a matter of fact not even this could be accomplished, for only a few days later the Army Group was ordered to hand over several armored divisions to Central Army Group. The assault groups of both formations had to be withdrawn to their original start lines. And so the last German offensive in the east ended in a fiasco, even though the enemy opposite the two attacking armies of Southern Army Group had suffered four times their losses in prisoners, dead and wounded. 15. The defensive battles of 1943 for when Citadel was called off. The initiative and the eastern theater of war finally passed to the Russians. Now that we had failed to encircle strong forces of the enemy in the Kursk salient and had even had to cut short the action against his mobile reserves before anything decisive could be achieved, his preponderance of numbers was bound to make itself felt. Indeed, his attack on the Orel bulge was only the prelude to a grand offensive. Henceforth, Southern Army Group found itself waging a defensive struggle which could not be anything more than a system of improvisations and stop gaps. Being too weak, on that widely extended front, for purely passive defense against an enemy so many times stronger than itself, it had to concentrate its efforts, even at the risk of repercussions in sectors temporarily less threatened on punctually assembling forces wherever there was a Soviet breakthrough to intercept or a chance of inflicting a blow on the enemy. What had to be avoided at all costs was that any elements of the army group should become cut off through deep enemy breakthroughs and suffer the same fate as 6th Army at Stalingrad. To maintain ourselves in the field, and in doing so to wear down the enemy's offensive capacity to the utmost, became the whole essence of this struggle. First battle of the Dunces had been expected, the enemy's first blow was directed against the front embracing the Dunitz area. On 17 July a powerful offensive was launched against 6th Army on the Meuse and 1st Panzer Army on the Middle Dunitz. While achieving considerable penetration, however, the enemy was unable to force a breakthrough. Sixth Army, by committing both the mechanized formations left as reserves in the Dunitz area, was able to halt the attack after the enemy had won a bridgehead 12 miles wide and 10 miles deep on the west bank of the Meuse north of Kuibyshev. In the case of 1st Panzer Army, the enemy succeeded in crossing the Dunitz southeast of Isam on roughly a 20 mile front but by throwing in both the divisions of 24 Panzer Corps moving up from Kharkov, it was possible to prevent him from gaining any further ground south of the river. Even though we were able to halt these Soviet attacks by the end of July, however, the situation in the Donitz area was still hardly tenable from a long-term point of view. And so, having itself had to call off the Citadel operation for good on 17 July on orders from Hitler, Southern Army Group decided to withdraw a substantial weight of armor from that wing for the time being in order to iron things out in the Dunitz area. We hoped to have given the enemy so much punishment in the course of Citadel that we could now count on the breathing space in this part of the front. Without a doubt this decision was a disastrous one in regard to subsequent events on the Army Group's northern wing, as the enemy took the offensive there earlier than we had expected. But mistaken though the move proved to be, the fact remains that it was conditioned by Hitler's insistence on holding the Dunitz area. In practice, moreover, 
the temporary weakening of the northern wing was limited to the withdrawal of HQ 3 Panzer Corps and 3 Panzer Division, since Hitler again put the SS Panzer Corps, now marked for Italy, at the army group's disposal for this one counterstroke in the Dunitz. Area. In view of the fact that the two corps headquarters and four armored divisions destined for the Dunitz area could only arrive one after the other, the army group proposed that the two leading divisions of the SS Corps should first deliver a short, sharp punch to straighten out 1st Panzer Army's position south of the Dunitz. Thereupon the whole of our armor would be used to wipe out the big enemy bridgehead in 6th Army's sector and to restore the Meuse front. Hitler, however, promptly banned any action in 1st Panzer Army's area, although there was not the least reason why this need have protracted the stay of the SS Corps. Since there had already been a case of interference in the Army Group's handling of operations during Citadel, that is when Hitler had stopped 24 Panzer Kahl from being used with Army Detachment Kempf, I felt compelled to protest to OKH this is what I wrote to General Zietzler if my misgivings about coming developments are disregarded, and if my intentions as a commander, which aim merely at removing difficulties for which I am not responsible continue to be frustrated, I shall have no choice but to assume that the Führer has not the necessary confidence in this headquarters. I am far from believing myself infallible. Everyone makes mistakes even great captains like Frederick and Napoleon. At the same time I would point out that 11th Army won the Crimean campaign under very difficult conditions and that when faced with an almost hopeless situation at the end of last year. Southern Army Group still mastered it. If the Fuhrer thinks he can find any Army Group commander or headquarters staff with better nerves than we had during the past winter, with more initiative than we showed in the Crimea, on the Dunitz or at Kharkov, with greater powers of improvisation than were displayed by us in the Crimean or Winter Campaign, on with the ability to foresee the inevitable more clearly than we have done, I am fully prepared to hand over to them. As long as I remain at this post, However, I must have the chance to use my own head. July 30 saw the start of the counter attack launched in 6th Army's area by the armor brought over from the northern wing of the army group. It resulted in the complete restoration of the situation on the Meuse front. The ratio of forces involved in this battle was indicative not only of the situation obtaining at the time but also of the superior quality of the German troops. In his bridgehead the enemy had no less than 16 rifle divisions, two mechanized corps, one armored brigade and two anti-tank brigades. The German counter-attack was performed by four armored, one panzer grenadier and two infantry divisions. In the course of this counter-attack and the Soviet attacks preceding it, the enemy lost some 18,000 men as prisoners, 700 tanks. 200 field guns and 400 anti-tank guns. The battle west of Belgorod and the fight for Kharkov having thus succeeded in restoring the situation in 6th Army's sector, we were still left with the festering wound on 1st Panzer Army's done its front. It could no longer be cauterized because of the storm now brewing over the Army Group's northern wing. From the moment when Army Detachment Kempf and 4th Panzer Army were withdrawn to their pre-Citadel positions, the enemy had been putting them under steady pressure. Around the turn of the month our radio monitoring and air reconnaissance showed him to be assembling a strong concentration of armor in the Orsk salient, obviously by bringing fresh forces over from the center of the Eastern Front. Other offensive preparations were also noticed in the Donetsk Ben southeast of Kharkov. On 2nd August, we informed OKH that we were expecting an immediate offensive against the Army Group's northern front west of Belgrade. This, we thought, would probably be supplemented by an attack southeast of Kharkov with the aim of taking our forces round the town in a pincer movement and opening the enemy's way to the Dnieper. We asked for the return of the two armored divisions which had been handed over to Central Army Group and for permission to retain the SS Panzer Corps for use on our northern wing. Apart from this, we directed that three Panzer Corps and three Panzer Division be lifted back from the Dunitz area to Kharkov. On 3rd August the first enemy attack broke loose against 4th Panzer Army and Army Detachment Kempf's front west of Belgrade. The enemy managed to effect a breakthrough on the inter-army boundary, 
and in the next few days he extended it considerably in breadth and depth. Fourth Panzer Army was pushed back to the west and army detachment Kempf in a southerly direction towards Kharkov. Even by 8 August there was a gaping hole 35 miles wide between the two armies in the area northwest of the town. The enemy seemed free to drive through to Poltava and onwards to the Dnieper. The army group had ordered three Panzer Corps, consisting of the two SS armored divisions which Hitler had finally allowed us to retain, plus three Panzer Division. Author, over to Kharkov in order that army detachment Kempf should fling it into the eastern flank of the enemy's breakthrough spearhead. Simultaneously 4th Panzer Army was to thrust into the spearhead's western flank with the two armored divisions returned from Central Army Group and another Panzer Grenadier Division. It was clear, however, that no action by these forces, nor indeed by those of the Army Group as a whole, could provide any long-term answer to the problem. Our divisional casualties were already alarmingly high, and two divisions had broken down completely as a result of continuous overstrain. During the rapid advance of the enemy, moreover, a large number of our tanks had been lost while in workshops. In contrast to all this, the enemy had apparently made up the losses incurred during Citadel more quickly than we had expected. Above all, he had drawn strong new forces from other fronts. As one might have anticipated, it emerged beyond any possible shadow of doubt that the enemy was now resolved to force an issue against the German southern wing. Not only was he constantly bringing up fresh forces to the breakthrough front, but an attack was also imminent on our front east and southeast of Kharkov. At the same time there were signs that a fresh offensive was planned on the Dunitz Muse front. When the chief of the general staff came to see us on 8 August I told him quite plainly that from now on we could no longer confine ourselves to such isolated problems as whether such and such a division could be spared for Southern Army Group or whether the Cuban bridgehead should be evacuated or not. The vital thing was that we should do everything in our power to frustrate what was obviously an enemy bid to destroy the German southern wing. There were two possible ways of doing this. One was to evacuate the Dunitz area forthwith in order to release forces for the army group's northern wing and at least to hold the Dnieper in the south. The other was that OKH should swiftly transfer at least 10 divisions from other fronts to those of 4th Panzer Army and Central Army Group's 2nd Army adjoining it in the north, and set a further 10 in motion towards the Dnieper. But this time, too, despite the Army Group's repeated demands, no effective action was taken. Meanwhile the position was growing steadily worse. While the enemy pushed 4th Panzer Army further west, it became clear that he simultaneously intended to outflank Army Detachment Kempf through the gap he had torn and to encircle it at Kharkov. On 12 August he also attacked our front east and southeast of the town. The divisions there, being far too widely extended, gave way, and the danger that the Army Detachment would be enveloped around the city became imminent. Dot as usual but this time for political reasons first and foremost Hitler demanded that the town be held at all costs, pointing out that its fall could have an unfavorable effect on the attitudes of Turkey and Bulgaria. However true that might be, the army group had no intention of sacrificing an army for Kharkov. On 22 August Kharkov was abandoned to obtain forces for the two threatened wings of army detachment Kempf and prevent its encirclement. In the meantime it had been redesignated 8th Army and taken over by my erstwhile chief of staff, General Waller. Although I had got on well with General Kempf, I did not oppose the change the proposal for which came from Hitler as well as cautiousness and sangfreud, which had stood up to such severe tests in the Crimea, would be of particular value in the present situation. Otherwise 22nd August was very much a day of crisis. In the Dunitz area the enemy had attacked again. Though able to halt a threatened breakthrough, 6th Army's forces had not sufficed to restore the situation. First Panzer Army had brought another major attack to a standstill, but it, too, was coming to the end of its strength. While 8th Army was able to get out of Kharkov unscathed, 4th Panzer Army had to face heavy fighting, although it did succeed in winning one defensive action on its southern wing. Nevertheless, by 23rd August it was possible, 
by throwing in the armor that had come back from the Dunitz area and Central Army Group, to stop the enemy breakthrough towards Poltava for the time being. A front, however thin and incomplete, had been re established in the sectors of 4th Panzer and 8th Armies from a point harder south of Kharkov to southwest of Aktaka. While 4th Panzer Army had been able to maintain contact with the right wing of Central Army Group, there was still a wide gap in the army's front southwest of Aktaka. This was closed at the end of the month in the course of an attack to straighten out the front. The intelligence picture of 23rd August shows with what odds the two armies had to contend. Against 4th Panzer Army alone, the enemy had committed his Voronezh front, with three armies, two rifle and one tank, assaulting and a fourth one apparently following up. Opposite 8th Army was the Steppes Front, consisting of no less than six armies, of which one was armored. An even clearer idea of the army group's position as a whole may be gathered from a breakdown of comparative strengths, including the breadths of front involved which we submitted to OKH on 20th-21 SD August when estimating the fighting power of the enemy's forces, we had assumed that in the case of most of the rifle and armored formations it lay somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. In the case of a small number of still fresh divisions and individual tank or mechanized corps it was conceivably still between 70 and 80 percent. Undoubtedly, then, the enemy, too, had had very heavy losses since the depreciation of his fighting power was more or less the same as our own. What we could do nothing to offset was the higher number of the Soviet formations, particularly as the enemy was to bring up fresh forces from the OL front in the next few days. The above comparisons also show the extent to which the enemy had concentrated his forces armor first and foremost against the army group's northern wing. The way he was massing forces in front of 8th Army and the right wing of 4th Panzer Army clearly revealed his intention of forcing a breakthrough in the direction of the Dnieper. Subsequently, by bringing up even more reinforcements, he extended this to an attempt to outflank 4th Panzer Army in the north and push it away from Kiev. What also emerges from our breakdown of strengths is that in contrast to the enemy's own build-up since the beginning of Citadel, 55 rifle divisions, two tank or mechanized corps and numerous armored brigades etc., Southern Army Group's increment of formations had been quite insignificant, nine infantry and one armored division up to the end of August. Of these, four infantry divisions fell to 7 Corps, which had come over to 4th Panzer Army from the right wing of Central Army Group. Since this army's front was thus prolonged by 75 miles, the four divisions in question constituted no real increase. Nonetheless, we did have five extra infantry divisions and one armored. Had we received them prior to Citadel, they could at least have speeded up the army group's first offensive success and influenced the course of the battle very much in our favor. There can be no doubt that they could have been released more easily before Citadel than after it, for since then the situation had become more strained all round. The conflagration spread silo re establishment of a fairly continuous front from Kharkov to Sumy had by 27 August brought about a relaxation, however brief, in the tension on the army group's northern wing. The position in the Donitz area became more perilous than ever. Consequently, the army group submitted a categorical demand that its southern wing either be provided with further forces without change of assignment or else be given freedom of movement to halt the enemy on a shorter line further back. As a result, Hitler finally made up his mind to come out to South Russia for a short conference. It took place in Vinitsa where his own headquarters had formerly been. During the talks my army commanders and I, as well as a corps and a divisional commander, gave Hitler a very clear picture of the situation, with special reference to the condition of the troops, who had long been suffering from overstrain. I drew particular attention to the fact that for a casualty total of 133,000 men there had been only 33,000 replacements. Even though the enemy's fighting power might be considerably weakened, I said, the large number of formations he possessed would still allow him to keep on throwing in divisions capable of offensive action. Apart from this, 
he would continue to bring in forces from other sectors of the Eastern Front. Summing up the present situation, I insisted that while the Dunitz area could not be held with the forces now available, the far greater danger for the German southern wing as a whole lay on the northern wing of our army group. Eighth and Fourth Panzer armies would be unable in the long run to prevent the enemy from breaking through to the Dnieper. I presented Hitler with the clear alternative either of quickly providing the army group with new forces, in any case not less than twelve divisions and exchanging our tired divisions with others from quiet stretches of front semicolon or of abandoning the Dunitz area to release forces within the army group. Hitler, who remained entirely objective throughout this discussion, though he persisted in trying to ramble off into all sorts of technical details, agreed that the army group must be afforded vigorous support, and promised to provide whatever formations could possibly be spared from the sectors of northern and central army groups. The possibility of exchanging worn-out divisions with others from quieter sectors, he said, would be clarified in a day or two. The very next day showed that nothing would come of these promises. The Russians had attacked the left wing of Central Army Group, Second Army. Achieving a local breakthrough which compelled the army in question to fall back to the west. Another local crisis in the same army group had been caused by a successful Soviet attack in the sector of 4th Army. Following a visit by Field Marshal V. Kludge to General Headquarters on 28 August, nothing further was heard of any release of forces from his sector. Northern Army Group 2 now claimed that it could not spare a single division. As far as the other theaters of operations were concerned, Hitler first wanted to await developments and see whether the British would now land in Apulia or the Balkans or tie their forces down in Sardinia a contingency which was just as improbable as it was unimportant. Unfortunately the Russians paid not the slightest heed to this desire of Hitler's to put off his decision. They went on attacking, and the situation became increasingly critical. Sixth Army was penetrated, and the corps it had fighting on the coast threatened to be encircled by the enemy. Since the divisions which OKH had brought into the Dunitz area against the wishes of the army group, which had wanted them for the northern wing, did not suffice to restore the situation, orders were issued to 6th Army on 31st August to fall back on a prepared position in the rear known as a test shadow. This meant that the first step in the evacuation of the Dunitz area was already taken. The same evening Hitler finally gave the army group freedom gradually to withdraw 6th Army and the right wing of 1st Panzer Army, provided, he said, that the situation absolutely demands it and there is no other possible alternative. At the same time instructions were given to destroy all installations of military importance in the Dunitz area. If only it had been given this freedom of movement a few weeks earlier, the army group would have been in a position to fight the battle on its southern wing more economically. It could have freed, formations for the vital northern wing and still halted the enemy advance on a shortened front, possibly even forward of the Dnieper. Now, however, freedom of movement served only to preserve the southern wing from defeat. Even so it remained doubtful whether a proper front could still be established forward of the river. While first Panzer army except for that part of its right wing which had to be pulled back in conjunction with 6th Army's withdrawal to new positions, was able to hold on the middle Dunitz, the situation on the northern wing of the army group was again deteriorating. Eighth Army, now being attacked from the north and east in the area south of Kharkov, was able to forestall an enemy breakthrough only by pulling back fortunately no great distance and shortening its front. Fourth Panzer Army had been compelled by the withdrawal of its northern neighbor, Central Army Group's Second Army, to bend back its left wing. This had the effect of extending its front, which was already much too thinly held, farther than ever. The further fact that ineptitude in the leadership of Second Army's Sunmost Corps, 13, caused it to retire into the Panzer Army's area saddled the latter not only with four fairly battered divisions, but also with another 56 miles of front, this time facing north. One could foresee that once the enemy, whose assault power had temporarily slackened, resumed the offensive, the army was unlikely to hold him. 
this danger was rendered greater still by the new threat to the army's northern flank. The increasing gravity of the situation, and even more the absence of any decision from Hitler regarding reinforcements, caused me to fly to general headquarters in East Prussia on 3rd September. I asked Field Marshal V. Kludge to accompany me, as I wished to act conjointly with him in getting our forces distributed in a way which would take account of what the enemy so obviously had in mind. At the same time we wished to broach the need for rationalizing the overall leadership that is for getting rid of o.k.w.o.k.h. Duplication in the Eastern Theater of War the previous day I had written General Zietzler a letter demanding that something finally be done to effect a real concentration of effort at the decisive point on the Eastern Front. In view of developments on the adjacent wings of Southern and Central Army groups, I had said, it was essential that we take the precaution of assembling a strong army forward of Kiev. If the arrival of reinforcements from other theaters were delayed until our Western opponents committed themselves by a landing on the continent, we should be too late in the East. In any case, it should not be too difficult to guess the Western powers' general intentions from the disposition of their naval forces and shipping space. Zietzler told me that when he showed the letter to Hitler, the latter had fumed with rage and averred that all I was interested in doing was conducting ingenious operations and justifying myself in the war diary. A pretty naive contention, I felt. I am sorry to say that the talk v. Kludge and I had with Hitler proved quite profitless. Hitler declared that no forces could be spared either from other theaters or from Northern Army Group. His reaction to the idea of creating a unified command by transferring responsibility for all theaters of war to the chief of the general staff was equally negative, his contention being that even the latter's influence could make no difference or improvement to the overall conduct of the war. Hitler, of course, was fully aware that the ultimate object of proposing a chief of staff who would be responsible for all theaters of operations was that he, Hitler, while continuing to have the final say, should relinquish the conduct of operations as such. He was just as much opposed to this as he was to renouncing the command in the East by appointing an actual commander in chief for that theater. As OKH still took no measures in the next few days to accommodate itself to the situation in Southern Army Group, I sent off a further teleprinter message on 7th September in which I again reviewed the position on the Army Group front. I pointed out that the enemy had already committed 55 divisions, two tank corps etc. against us, and that these came not only from his reserves but largely from other sectors of the Eastern Front. Furthermore, others were on the way. Once again I insisted that decisive action must be urgently taken if the army group were to remain in control of the situation. The upshot of this was that Hitler appeared at our headquarters in Zaporozhye the very next day having also summoned Field Marshal V. Klest, Commander of Army Group A, and General Ewer, whose 17th Army was still in the Cuban, to meet him the dot all I could do at this conference was once again to stress the seriousness of the Army Group's situation, the state of its troops, and the consequences which would result not only for ourselves but also for Army Group if our northern wing were defeated. I emphasized that the position on the Army Group's right wing could not be restored forward of the Dnieper. On the northern wing of 6th Army the enemy had succeeded in tearing a 28-mile gap in our front in which only the remains of two divisions were still fighting. With the small amount of armor at our disposal, the counterattack we had already launched could not hope to close it. Whether we liked it or not, therefore, we should be compelled to retire behind the Dnieper, particularly in view of the possible repercussions of the exceptionally tense situation on the Army Group's northern wing. In order to find the necessary forces to sustain this northern wing, I proposed that Central Army Group should be withdrawn to the Dnieper line forthwith. This would cut its front by one third and result in such a saving of forces that it would at last be possible to acquire sufficient strength at the vital spot on the Eastern Front. Hitler now accepted in principle the need to take the right wing of the army group back onto the Melitopol Dnieper line, though he still hoped to avoid doing so by bringing up new SP assault gun battalions. As usual, 
he thought the use of technical resources was sufficient to halt a development which in fact could only have been averted by throwing in several divisions. As for acquiring forces from Central Army Group by taking it back to the Upper Dnieper, however, Hitler maintained that it was impossible to withdraw that distance at such short notice. The muddy season would be upon us before a movement of those dimensions could be completed, and, as had already happened in the evacuation of the Orel salient, too much equipment would be lost in the process. The best one could hope for was to withdraw to some intermediate line. This, of course, would not have achieved the manpower economy we were after. It was all a question of operational flexibility, and this was something on which our own views based as they were on the experiences of the Crimea and the 1942 Three Winter Campaign, differed fundamentally from those of OKH and even of the other army groups. During the campaigns in question we had always had to operate with speed and mobility and never had time for long-winded planning and preparation. Hitler and the other army groups, on the other hand, did not think it permissible to initiate and execute extensive troop movements so swiftly. Admittedly the rapid evacuation of fronts which had long been static was complicated by an order of Hitler's that all armies should accumulate a three-month stock of rations and ammunition so as to stand firm whenever their supplies were temporarily interrupted. But though he could not bring himself to approve anything so radical as my proposal for shortening Central Army Group's front, Hitler did recognize the necessity of decisively strengthening Southern Army Group. At the suggestion of the Chief of the General Staff, he directed Central Army Group immediately to assemble a corps of two armored and two infantry divisions on its boundary with 4th Panzer Army. The purpose of this was to forestall the envelopment of our northern wing. In addition, he promised to meet my demand for more divisions to safeguard the Dnieper crossings. Last of all, in order to make more forces available, he decided to evacuate the Cuban bridgehead, which had long since ceased to be of any operational value. According to Field Marshal V. Klest, this operation could be completed by 12th October. Unfortunately, we were not able to get the appropriate orders issued straight away, that is, direct from my headquarters. But when I saw Hitler off at the airstrip, he repeated his promise of reinforcements before getting into his machine. On the afternoon of the same day, we issued orders to 6th and 1st Panzer armies to go over to a mobile defensive conducting it in such a way that the stability of the troops was maintained and as much time as possible gained for the withdrawal. As far as the fronts of 4th Panzer and 8th Armies were concerned, the army group hoped that once Hitler had fulfilled his promise, the situation on 4th Panzer's northern wing could be restored through a counter-attack by the Corps which Central Army Group was due to hand over to us. We should be able to buttress the front with the divisions now moving to the Dnieper. It would then still be possible to halt the enemy forward of the river somewhere up around Poltava. Unfortunately the next day brought us a fresh disappointment. The order for the movement of four divisions into the Dnieper line, which Hitler had firmly promised to issue when he left me, did not go out. Furthermore, the assembly of a corps on our right wing by Central Army Group was delayed. There was still some doubt as to whether when and in what strength it would really be available. I asked the chief of the general staff to tell Hitler that in these circumstances we must accept the possibility of the enemies breaking through to the Dnieper crossings, including the one at Kiev. In view of the fact that the Supreme Command had repeatedly put off taking decisions and failed to keep promises on which the army group had already had to base measures of its own, I considered it necessary to insert a paragraph which could only be conveyed to Hitler in writing on account of its bluntness. I quoted here verbatim because it clearly reveals the divergence of views between the Supreme Command and Southern Army Group. The Army Group has been reporting ever since the end of the winter battles that it would not be able to defend its front with the forces at its disposal and has repeatedly called, without success, for a radical adjustment of forces within the Eastern Front or between the latter and other theaters of war. In view of the importance of the territory being defended by Southern Army Group and the clearly foreseeable fact that the Russians would direct the main effort of their offensive against the latter, this adjustment was absolutely imperative. Instead, 
the army group was divested of forces after Citadel and never provided with adequate or timely reinforcements when a crisis occurred. My motive in making these statements is not to fix ex post facto responsibility for developments in the East but to ensure that in future the necessary action is taken in good time. Yet Hitler could evidently not bring himself to accept what we now regarded as the inevitable and to withdraw Central Army Group to the Dnieper line of his own free will thereby disengaging sufficient forces to retain control of the situation on the German southern wing. Neither the appeals of his chief of staff nor a fresh memorandum from Southern Army Group could do anything to move him. In this latest memorandum we expressed the view that the Soviet offensive which Hitler feared was about to be launched against Central Army Group would only amount to holding attacks aimed at preventing any radical concentration of forces on our own northern wing. Neither the operations nor the war economy, we added, would be seriously prejudiced by a withdrawal of Central Army Group to the Dnieper Line. When still no action was taken to ensure that Central Army Group finally set about grouping the forces which we had been promised on our northern wing, against which the enemy was steadily bringing up new formations, the danger arose that 4th Panzer Army would be enveloped from the north and pushed away from Kiev to the south. Such a development would not only preclude the establishment of a new front behind the Dnieper, but also put the army group in imminent danger of encirclement. In a report outlining this situation to OKH, the army group announced on 14 September that it would be compelled the following day to order even its northern wing to retire behind the river on both sides of Kiev. Eighth Army had already been given instructions to go over to mobile tactics. The idea of possibly halting the enemy forward of the Dnieper on a shorter front somewhere around Poltava had been rendered futile by Hitler's dilatoriness. In reply we received a message instructing us not to issue the order until Hitler had had another talk with me on 15 September. My answer to this was that any such meeting would be pointless unless I could speak to him privately with only the chief of staff in attendance. On this occasion I again told Hitler how things had deteriorated on our front since his last visit and emphasized that the crisis which had come about on the northern wing of my army group might well prove fatal not only to ourselves but eventually to the eastern front as a whole. This crisis, I added was the consequence of Central Army Group's failure to hand over forces to us. In view of the fact that Southern Army Group had always loyally obeyed any OKH orders of this kind, we did not see why other army groups should not do the same particularly as the forces in question could not help Central Army Group to hold its own front if 4th Panzer Army collapsed. To me, I said, it seemed quite intolerable that a transfer of forces which the Supreme Command itself had acknowledged to be urgently necessary could not be enforced. What was to become of us if Army Group commanders did not do what they were told? I, at any rate, was confident that I could get my own orders carried out. The reason why Hitler had not got his way with Central Army Group in this case was, of course, that he had failed to give timely consideration to the need to shorten the front there and had not demanded prompt execution in spite of all the objections raised. I closed my remarks by saying that it was very doubtful at the moment whether 4th Panzer Army would get back over the Dnieper. While the army group would naturally do everything in its power to ensure that this operation ran smoothly, we had to insist that all four available railways should simultaneously be used to bring over one division each from Central Army Group to our own northern wing for as long as was necessary to restore the situation there. That this would inevitably necessitate withdrawing Central Army Group onto the Dnieper line was self-evident, the fate of the whole Eastern Front was at stake here, I said and the only possible solution was to bring strong forces up into the key area forthwith. Although Hitler accepted my implicit criticism of his leadership calmly enough, he doubtless derived small satisfaction from the interview. Nevertheless, this meeting did result in the immediate issue of an order to Central Army Group to move four divisions off at top speed to Southern Army Group, starting on 17 September and using all four railway lines at once. We were also promised infantry units and replacements from the west to bring our divisions up to strength in all, 
32 battalions. On my return to Army Group Headquarters, an order was issued to all our armies on the evening of 15th September to retire on to a line running from Malitopol along the Dnieper to a point above Kiev and thence along the Disna. The reader may have gained the impression that throughout the weeks the Army Group was fighting forward of the Dnieper, the activities of its headquarters staff were largely devoted to disputes with Hitler. Indeed, our constant attempts to persuade the Supreme Command to take necessary measures in good rhyme, and unavoidable ones before it was too late, did cost us a great deal of effort and nervous energy. Mine was a staff accustomed to taking quick decisions, and I personally was hardly one to enjoy continually repeating the obvious. In the last analysis this struggle to get operational needs recognized in time was the decisive feature of the 1943-4 campaign on the German side. The withdrawal behind the Dnieper the Army Group order issued on 15th September after my return from General Headquarters laid down that the Army's rate of withdrawal to the Dnieper line should be entirely subjected to the need to maintain the fighting strength of the troops. It expressly stated that all orders and decisions must give priority to the principle that as long as units remain intact they will overcome every difficulty, whereas no withdrawal can be carried out with troops who have lost their fighting strength or stability. Wherever possible the armies were to let the enemy expend his energies in the assault in order to gain time for the withdrawal. Sixth Army had to pull back its two southern corps into the prepared positions between Malitopol and the Dnieper bend south of Zaporozhye. Its northern corps was to retire into the Zaporozhye bridgehead. While this corps sector now came under the orders of 1st Panzer Army, the rest of 6th Army went over to Army Group A whose 17th Army was being brought back from the Cuban to the Crimea. First Panzer Army had to cross the Dnieper at Zaporozhye and Dnepropetrovsk in order to take over the front from Zaporozhye to a point 20 miles east of Kremenchug. Once the east-west crossings had been completed the Dnepropetrovsk bridgehead was to be abandoned, whereas that of Zaporozhye had to be held on the express orders of Hitler. The right wing of 8th Army which was likewise to be withdrawn on to Dnepropetrovsk, came under command of 1st Panzer Army. The army was also instructed to take immediate steps to assemble 40 Panzer Corps, with a strength of two armored divisions, one Panzer Grenadier Division and the SS Cavalry Division, south of the Dnieper for transfer to the army group's left wing. This measure was, however, thwarted by Hitler's order to hold the Zaporozhye bridgehead. The consequences will be discussed later. Eighth Army was to change banks in the sector flanked by the bridgeheads of Kremenchug and Chikasi, attaining the latter crossing by dint of concentrating strong armored forces on its left wing. Since the army had to hold a front behind the Dnieper reaching to a point 20 miles south of Kiev, it was to take over 4th Panzer Army's 24 Panzer Corps as soon as the latter crossed the river. 4th Panzer Army's task was to get the last named corps over the Dnieper at Kanev and the main bulk of the army at Kiev, as well as to ensure that behind the river contact was re established to the north with the right wing of Central Army Group. The withdrawal into the Malitopol Dnieper positions, which was set in motion by this order and executed in the face of unremitting pressure from a far superior opponent, probably represents the most difficult operation performed by the Army Group throughout the 1943 4 campaign. On the right wing, in 6th Army's area, the maneuver proceeded with relative ease, as the army was able to pull its forces back frontally into the consolidated positions north of Melitopol and the bridgehead of Zaporozhye. The main danger in this sector lay in the superior strength of the pursuer particularly of his armor, which was able to thrust into the midst of our forces while they were actually on the move. On the other hand, exceptional difficulty was experienced in getting the other three armies back behind the river. From a front 440 miles in length they had to converge on a maximum of five Dnieper crossings. Having once crossed the Dnieper, however, they had to form another defensive front as wide as their previous one and be fully deployed again before the enemy could gain a foothold on the southern bank. It was this very process of concentrating the entire forces of each army onto one or at most two crossing points that gave the enemy his big chance. Apart from anything else, he could exploit the period in which the Germans were having to be fed back through the Dnepropetrovsk, 
Cromanch Hug, Chikasi, KNF and KF crossing points in order to take the river in his stride in between. What made the withdrawal even more complex was that neither of the army group's central elements, 8th Army and the left wing of 1st Panzer Army, could withdraw along an axis perpendicular to the Dnieper. Instead they had to move north of, and very nearly parallel to the river to reach the crossings through which they must pass. Eighth Army actually had to fight its way back to its own crossing place, Chikasi, while on the left wing of the army group there was a danger that 4th Panzer Army would be pushed right away from Kiev as a result of developments on the southern wing of Central Army Group. The fact that this extraordinarily difficult withdrawal succeeded in spite of numerous local crises was due to the versatile leadership of the army commanders and the magnificent attitude of the troops. Only commanders and formation staffs who felt superior to their counterparts on the other side, only troops who had no feeling of being beaten even when they were pulling away from the enemy, could have brought off this feat. The enemy did not manage to hinder the movement of the armies towards the few crossings available to them. Neither was he able, despite his strength, to take advantage of their convergence on these crossing points to push strong forces across the river at any other spot and in this way to unhinge its defense from the outset. The fact that he did succeed in getting on to the western bank of the Dnieper in one or two places was inevitable in the absence of any German forces to safeguard the river in advance. I shall come back to this in due course. Scorched earth the extremely difficult conditions under which these movements had to be carried out made it imperative that we should take every possible measure likely to impede the enemy. It was essential to ensure that when he reached the Dnieper he could not immediately continue his offensive while still enjoying the advantages of pursuit. Consequently it was now necessary for the Germans, too, to resort to the scorched earth policy which the Soviets had adopted during their retreats in previous years. In a 15 mile zone forward of the Dnieper everything which might enable the enemy to go straight over the river on a broad front was destroyed or evacuated. This included anything affording cover or accommodation for Soviet troops in an assembly area opposite our Dnieper defenses and anything which might ease their supplely problem, particularly in the way of food. At the same time, in pursuance of instructions specially promulgated by Goring's economic staff, their zone was to be emptied of all provisions, economic goods and machinery which could assist Soviet war production. In the case of my own army group, this measure was confined to essential machinery, horses and cattle. Naturally there was no question of our pillaging the area. That was something which the German army unlike certain others, did not tolerate. Strict checkpoints were set up to ensure that no vehicle carried misappropriated goods. As are for the effects and stocks of factories, warehouses and sovkhuses. These were in any case the property of the state and not of private individuals. Since it was Soviet policy, whenever any territory was recaptured, immediately to embody all able bodied males under 60 into the armed forces and to conscript the whole of the remaining population for work of military importance, often in the battle zone itself, the Supreme Command had directed that the civil population would also be evacuated. In practice, this coercive measure was applied only to men of military age, who would have immediately been re-enlisted. On the other hand, a considerable proportion of the Russian population joined our withdrawal quite voluntarily in order to escape the dreaded Soviets, forming big trek columns like those we ourselves were to see later in eastern Germany. Far from being forcibly abducted. These people received every possible help from the German armies and were conducted into areas west of the Dnieper in which the German authorities had arranged to feed and accommodate them. They were allowed to take along everything, including horses and cattle, which could possibly accompany them, and wherever we could manage to do so we put our own vehicles at their disposal. Although the war caused these people a great deal of misfortune and hardship. The latter bore no comparison to the terror bombing suffered by the civil population in Germany or what happened later on in Germany's eastern territories. In any case, all the measures taken on the German side were conditioned by military necessity. One or two figures may serve to show what an immense technical achievement this withdrawal operation was. To begin with, there were 200,000 wounded to evacuate. 
about 2,500 trains were needed to shift German equipment and stores and requisition Soviet property. And the Russian civilians who had attached themselves to us alone numbered many hundreds of thousands. Despite the extra difficulties involved in having only a few crossing points at our disposal, the withdrawal was completed in a relatively short space of time, thereby proving contrary to what others might think that even operations of this kind can be executed quickly. By 30th September, every army in the group was back on the Molitopol Nipa line. The fight for the Nipa line by crossing the Nipa, the army group had undoubtedly put a strong natural obstacle between itself and the enemy at least as long as the summer was with us. Yet it could not expect the decrease in tension to last for long. We were convinced that the enemy would continue to seek a showdown in this sector of the Eastern Front and nowhere else, for operationally, economically, and politically, it was here that the most tempting prizes lay. Consequently, he could be expected to exploit the supplely potential of his southern wing to the utmost in order to keep throwing fresh forces either from his reserves or from other sectors of the front into the struggle against Southern Army Group. Obviously he would not be debarred from launching holding attacks or limited offensives in other parts of the front, but even if they produced local successes, these would not be of decisive importance when compared with the events on the Southern Wing. What prospects did Southern Army Group have of holding its ground? Was there a chance that the enemy might finally bleed himself white in attacks on the Dnieper line? These questions could have been answered much more confidently in the autumn of 1943 if the Dnieper line had been a strongly prepared system of fortifications. This, unfortunately, was far from being the case. It is true that as early as the winter of 1942-3 the army group had called on OKH to fortify the Dnieper line with the least possible delay. It was unable to do so itself because at that time the river was still outside its zone of operations. However, Hitler had turned down the request partly because he was opposed to rear area defenses on principle as an encouragement to retreat, and partly also because he wished to put all his labor and materials into the Atlantic Wall. As the fighting drew nearer to the Dnieper in the early months of 1943, However, the army group had on its own initiative taken steps to convert Zaporoz I, Dnepropetrovsk, Kremenchug and Kiev into bridgehead so that the enemy would in any event be prevented from cutting the communications to the rear at these vital crossing points. With the final transition to defensive warfare after the end of Citadel we had set about enlarging and extending the Dnieper fortifications with the help of requisitioned civilian labor. Even then only light field works could be built, as the army group was dependent on OKH for construction machinery, concrete, steel, barbed wire and mines and on the Reich Commissariat in the Ukraine for timber, while Hitler was still giving priority to the Atlantic Wall. So although the Dnieper could be considered a formidable obstacle so long as it did not freeze over, it would be effective only if its defenses were occupied in sufficient strength to compensate for their lightness of structure. But this was just where our weakness lay. German formation strengths had fallen off to a frightening degree in the incessant fighting of the past two and a half months, and the replacements of personnel and weapons especially tanks came nowhere near filling the gaps. To a very large extent this was due as I said earlier to Hitler's persistence in setting up new divisions back at home. Even before completing the withdrawal, the army group gave OKH a plain statement of the strength position, from which it appeared doubtful whether the Dnieper line could be held for any length of time. We pointed out that the defense of the river itself must be carried out by the infantry divisions the armor being retained as a mobile reserve ready to intervene wherever the enemy attempted to cross in force. In the same connection we had to report that for the immediate defense of a 440-mile Dnieper front, the three armies left to the army group had a total of 37 infantry divisions at their disposal. This figure included three which were at present on their way out to us. Five divisions whose fighting power was completely spent had been absorbed into other formations, in other words, every division would be responsible for some 12 miles of front. As against this, 
the average number of soldiers fit for frontline combat duties per division was now only about 1,000 a figure which would not rise above 2,000 even after the promised replacements had arrived. Obviously no decisive defense could function on this basis, even from behind the Dnieper doctors for the 17 armored or panzer grenadier divisions now available to the army group, we said, hardly one of them had any real punch left and the number of tanks had dropped just as sharply as the manpower of the Panzer Grenadier regiments. The army group accordingly demanded that more infantry divisions should follow the three at present moving up to join it. This was additionally justified, we felt, by the fact that Central Army Group's front was being reduced by one third as a result of its withdrawal to the Dnieper. Furthermore, Central Army Group, or its southern wing, at any rate, was unlikely to be the target of any decisive offensive, as the enemy would merely land himself in the Pinsk marshes in the process. In equal measures, we emphasized the importance of giving priority to the formations of Southern Army Group in the replacement of troops and equipment, since it was they who would continue to bear the brunt of the fighting on the Eastern Front, just as they had done to date. Nor must there be another ammunition shortage like the one which had already occurred during the withdrawal. It would quite definitely depend on the fulfillment of these demands, we said, whether the enemy offensive in the struggle for the Dnieper line could be frustrated or not. Ultimately, therefore, the question was whether the German Supreme Command still had the forces and means available to win the struggle in the part of the Eastern Front where the enemy was intent on bringing matters to a head in 1943. At the time one could not possibly say that this would be hopeless from the start in view of the overall superiority of the Soviet forces. Even if the enemy were willing to stake everything this year on gaining a decisive victory on the southern wing. The supplely problem still imposed certain limitations on the number of forces he could commit in this part of the front. It was thus of paramount importance that the German Supreme Command should anticipate the enemy onslaught which seemed likely to be launched here by massing its own forces in good time and adequate strength in the same area. Obviously it could do so only if it made up its mind to accept considerable risks in other sectors of the Eastern Front and other theaters of operations. Provided that such action were taken, an abortive Soviet offensive against Southern Army Group would probably wear down the enemy's attacking power to a conclusive degree of success which might decisively influence the further course of the war. This question of timely and adequate support for the southern wing of the German armies continued to be the bone of contention between Southern Army Group and the German Supreme Command. As I would rather not retail the innumerable arguments it caused. I will merely point out that the chiefs of the general staff and the operations branch entirely agreed with us. On 3rd October, for example, General Husinger told me that he had proposed an evacuation of the Crimea and the withdrawal of Northern Army Group onto a shortened line in order to release forces for Southern Army Group within the framework of the Eastern Front. Likewise he had suggested the construction of a proper Ostwall 26, somewhere well to the rear. Hitler had recently been using the term Ostwald to describe the Dnieper fortifications originally built against his wishes. The Führer had turned down both proposals. Though the possibility of bringing in formations from other theaters was under consideration, said Husinger, this would produce only a few divisions at the most. Now let us return to the position on the Dnieper. By the end of September, it had become clear how the enemy intended to prosecute his offensive over and beyond the river. Powerful forces had followed 6th Army, under command of Army Group, since the middle of the month, as it moved back into the Molitopol Dnieper positions. Three enemy armies, two up and one in reserve, comprising 20 rifle divisions and two tank or mechanized corps were pursuing 1st Panzer Army towards the Zaporozhye bridgehead. Two armies of 15 divisions, followed by a tank army of three corps, were advancing on the Dnieper between Nepropetrovsk and Kremenchug. Two armies of about 12 rifle divisions, two tank and one mechanized corps, followed by a tank army of three more corps, were moving towards the Dnieper between Chikasi and Rzyshkev. On the other hand, the only Soviet forces initially identified as moving on Kiev and the sector of river north of the city were three rifle and one mechanized corps. 
Obviously the enemy wanted to direct the main effort of his operations against the Dnieper bend in the first instance. In point of fact, the sector of river north and south of Kiev was just where he could move forces most speedily from the central front. Although the army group succeeded, under the difficult conditions already outlined, in getting its forces back across the Dnieper by 30th September, it still could not prevent the enemy from gaining a footing on the southern bank at two places. Halfway between Dnepropetrovsk and Kremenchug, by making use of the islands there, he managed to cross the river on both sides of the boundary of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies. The far bank was too weakly held to stop him. Unfortunately, 40 Panzer Corps, which the army group had previously ordered to assemble south of the Dnieper as a mobile reserve, was not on hand to throw the enemy back across the river in an immediate counterattack. It was still in the Zaporozhye bridgehead. As has already been noted, Hitler had given orders during the withdrawal that the bridgeheads of Zaporozhye, Dnepropetrovsk, Kremenchug and Kiev were to be held. It was a measure to which there could have been no possible objection if only the army group had had enough forces to hold them. As this was not the case, it had provided for their evacuation on completion of the east to west crossing an arrangement which Hitler tacitly accepted as far as the last three were concerned. On the other hand, despite all representations to the contrary, he had expressly ordered the retention of the bridgehead of Zaporoz I, which was to be even further enlarged. Apart from referring to the need to keep control of the Big Dnieper Dam and its power station, he had pointed out that the enemy would hardly dare to attack 6th Army's Melitopol front as long as we held the bridgehead. Operationally speaking, the latter viewpoint was quite a sound one except that Hitler was again pursuing too many aims at once. The upshot of the order to hold Zaporozhye was that 1st Panzer Army could not release 40 Panzer Corps in time. This disposed of any possibility of counterattacking to destroy the enemy between Nepropetrovsk and Kromenchug before he had got across the river in sufficient strength to establish a wide bridgehead. The enemy had also effected a crossing at the end of September by exploiting the narrow loop in the Dnieper south of Pariaslavl, west of the Kanef Bridge. Evidently, he was planning a major crossing at this spot since he brought no less than four tank and one mechanized corps up to the river on both sides of it. Having dropped several parachute brigades south of the Dnieper, he soon had a trifle divisions and a tank corps inside the loop. A further emergency arose on the extreme north wing of the army group. Up here, on the boundary between 4th Panzer Army and Central Army Group, the enemy had been able to cross the Disna, which was meant to be held in the first instance. According to orders issued earlier by OKH, 2nd Army should have had forces assembled to meet this very contingency, but no such assembly had taken place. In mid September, the Army Group had moved its headquarters from Zaporozhye to Kirovograd, a town of some importance forming the center of the industrial area in the Dnieper Bend. From there, I had visited the crisis spots developing on the Dnieper front held by 1st Panzer and 8th Armies and also the front at Kiev. The impression I formed at the time was that while 4th Panzer Army's front would probably hold, it was no longer likely that the trouble on the boundary between the two other armies could be completely eradicated. At the beginning of October the army group then moved into what had formerly been general headquarters in Vinitsa, which was more favorably placed for conducting operations on the army group front as a whole. It was situated in a wood where immense trouble had originally been taken to provide it with its own water, light and power supplies for the benefit of Hitler and the OKW staff. The offices and living quarters were in wooden huts, simply built but tastefully furnished. One astonishing feature of the place was a network of underground sentry posts running through the entire wood. Apparently Hitler had wanted to be guarded, but preferred those who guarded him to remain invisible. We, fortunately, had no occasion to take such safety precautions. Vinitsa was a large health resort lying amid picturesque scenery on the bug. All its hotels and other establishments were now being used as military hospitals, which I visited as soon as my work permitted. October 1943 found Southern Army Group already involved in the decisive struggle for the Dnieper Line. 
while the late autumn usually plunged the northern sectors of the Eastern Front into a period of rain and mud which made it difficult even for the Soviets to undertake any major offensive operations, this was not so in the south, where the fighting continued unabated. In accordance with the enemy order of battle which we had already identified at the end of September, four main targets of enemy pressure emerged in the army group area, I, the Zaporozhye bridgehead the removal of which the enemy apparently regarded as a prior necessity for continuing his offensive against the adjacent 6th Army in the south, 2 and 3, the two Dnieper sectors in which the enemy had already succeeded in gaining a footing on the southern bank, 4, the northern wing of 4th Panzer Army north of Kiev. Although the Zaporozhye bridgehead was able to beat off strong Soviet attacks at the beginning of October, which meant, of course, that 40 Panzer Corps did not become free in time to eliminate the enemy bridgehead between Dnepropetrovsk and Kremenchug, the enemy paused only to bring up reinforcements before renewing his assault. By laying down a barrage of shell fire bigger than anything we had seen to date, it was here that entire divisions of artillery appeared for the first time, and throwing in no fewer than 10 divisions strongly supported by armor, he succeeded in breaking into the bridgehead after heavy fighting. The latter had to be abandoned. Although we still managed to get the defending troops back over the river and to blow up both the dam road and the railway bridge which we had finished repairing only a few months before, the divisions which had been fighting in the bridgehead were severely weakened, and it was doubtful whether they would still be fit to defend the river itself. In any case, we had been made to pay far too dearly for Hitler's insistence on holding the bridgehead. While it had been possible to bring the enemy to a temporary halt at his point of penetration halfway between Dnepropetrovsk and Kromenchug by calling on the mobile reserves of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies, he could not be made to release his hold on the southern bank of the river and was steadily building up his forces there to extend the bridgehead in both breadth and depth. More will be said later on developments in this quarter which were to have a decisive effect on future operations in the Dnieper bend. At the same time the enemy was making every possible effort to enlarge the bridgehead he had gained on the left wing of 8th Army in the Dnieper loop at Pereyaslavl. However, mobile forces from 4th Panzer and 8th Armies succeeded in repulsing his attempts to cross the river on a broad front and in destroying what forces had already been put over. The same fate overtook the Soviet parachute brigades dropped here and southwest of Chikasi. Thus the enemy in this narrow bridgehead south of Pryaslavl, which was extremely difficult to break out of, remained to a large extent under our control. In 4th Panzer Army's area the enemy succeeded in the course of October in establishing a foothold on the western bank of the Dnieper immediately north of Kiev. He was also able to cross on a broad front opposite the northernmost core of the army after scoring a success against the right wing of the neighboring second army. At this point a danger emerged which invariably lurks on the boundaries of two different spheres of command. Just as before, the measures whereby the army group had intended to iron out the situation on the boundary with its northern neighbor could not be accomplished because second army had failed to carry out OKH's orders to assemble and hand over forces for this purpose. Even after I had lodged a sharply worded protest with OKH, it was still unable to get its orders obeyed. Nevertheless, 4th Panzer Army did manage to hold the ridge some miles west of the Dnieper in the area of the two corps in action north of Kiev. For all that, the situation remained a dangerous one, as we had to expect the enemy to wheel round on Kiev from the north as soon as he had acquired reinforcements. The most alarming feature of all was that this initial fighting had already led us to commit all the army group's mobile formations. Their fighting power was being whittled down just as fast as that of the infantry divisions in the line. This made it increasingly difficult to form fresh mobile reserves and placed us in even more urgent need of reinforcements. Battle of the Dnieper Bend Army Group had to continue to regard its northern wing as the more decisive of the two, for if the enemy were to succeed in finally smashing it, he would be at liberty to execute an extensive outflanking movement against both Southern Army Group and Army Group A. In fact, however, he devoted his main efforts in October to attaining a success in the Dnieper Bend itself. This, 
coupled with the fact that Hitler insisted on holding the Crimea for economic and political reasons, compelled the army group to accept a decisive battle. The dot throughout October the Steppes Front, whose headquarters seemed to be by far the most active on the enemy side, brought more and more forces into the bridgehead south of the Dnieper on the boundary of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies. By the end of the month it had more than five armies, one of which was entirely armoured, in there in all, 61 rifle divisions and 7 tank or mechanised corps with an estimated strength of over 900 armoured fighting vehicles. Neither of the German army wings could hold its ground against these odds, and each was compelled to wheel back to the east or west as the case might be. A wide gap opened up between the two armies, leaving the enemy free to drive deep into the Dnieper bend towards Krivoy Rog and Nikopol, the retention of which Hitler considered essential to the German war effort. Worst of all, any further advance on the enemy's part was bound to lead to the isolation of 1st Panzer Army in the eastern part of the Dnieper bend. This last danger was the paramount one in the eyes of the army group, which was on no account prepared to let the army become encircled. Meanwhile, our persistent calls for reinforcements had at least impelled OKH to provide us with two refitted armoured divisions, 14 and 24, and one infantry division. Three more armoured divisions, one Panzer and Obstandarty, both back from arrest and refit, plus the new 25 Panzer, were also promised to us, though their final allocation and date of arrival were still unsettled. How different things might have been if these five armoured formations had been at the army group's disposal four weeks earlier, when it reached the Dnieper. Even if this could not have been managed for reasons of refitment, what very different chances the army group would have had operationally if it could have counted on these forces well in advance and also enjoyed freedom of movement on its southern wing. With things as they were, however, we could not even wait until all five armoured divisions had arrived, for by that time the fate of 1st Panzer Army might already be sealed. Hence we had to resign ourselves to delivering a counter blow with the forces immediately available two panzer and one infantry division. Moving forward under command of 40 panzer corps from the area into which 8th Army's wing had fallen back, these forces were to drive from the west into the flank and rear of the enemy advancing in the direction of Krivoyrog. 1st Panzer Army, for its own part, had to throw in all its available infantry and armor in order to keep its vital communications through Krivoyrog open. To enable it to do so, the army group had ordered it to leave only safety screens out along the Dnieper in the area where 30 Corps was holding the river on both sides of Dnepropetrovsk. The main bulk of the Cal forces were to be taken back onto a shortened front running from the north of Zaporozhye to north of Krivoy Rog in order to release formations for action at the decisive spot. Hitler had to put up with this surrender of part of the Dnieper bank whether he liked it or not. Thanks to the exemplary manner in which the two armies cooperated, 40 Panzer Corps went over to 1st Panzer Army in the course of the operation. The counter blow delivered at the end of October north of Krivoy Rog, which already had the enemy at its skates, ended in a neat success. The enemy, instead of cutting off 1st Panzer Army in the eastern part of the Dnieper bend, as he had intended, suffered a severe setback. According to reports received from the armies, some 10,000 enemy were killed, apart from which 350 tanks, more than the same number of guns and 5,000 prisoners fell into our hands. These figures, when compared with earlier records of captured booty and personnel, showed the extraordinary increase in the material equipment of the Red Army in relation to its manpower. At all events, it could be presumed that two or three tank or mechanized corps and a trifle divisions had received a severe beating and that several more were badly mauled. Furthermore, it had been possible to re-establish a continuous front between 1st Panzer and 8th Army. With the odds still as much against us as ever, however, our forces had not been sufficient to throw the enemy back onto the northern bank of the Dnieper. This was something which would have to wait until the arrival of the three armoured divisions which we had been promised always assuming that no fresh emergencies arose elsewhere in the meantime. But that was exactly what did happen, 
almost at once. While the immediate threat to First Panzer Army was now removed, a new and perhaps even more dangerous one emerged in the rear of it. On 28 October, a far superior enemy force had attacked Sixth Army, which was holding the front between the Dnieper and the coast of the Sea of Azov in the area of Army Group. A the depth of penetration was considerable and 6th Army with an alacrity which surprised us was thereupon withdrawn westwards. In the process its northern wing, 4 and 29 Corps, wheeled back into an extended bridgehead south of the Dnieper, which meant that the rear of 1st Panzer Army and also the Nikopol area were at least covered for the time being. The rest of the army withdrew further to the west in the direction of the Dnieper crossing of Birislav and the lower reaches of the river though in fact the Nogaysk steppes offered no basis whatever for quickly forming a new front. This development in 6th Army's area constituted a serious threat to 1st Panzer Army in the eastern part of the Dnieper bend, for although it had temporarily been possible to stabilize the latter's position by 40 Panzer Corps counterblow against the Soviet forces thrusting at Krivoyrog. The enemy had by no means suffered a decisive defeat. The main blow planned by the army group could not be delivered here before mid-November, as that was the earliest we could expect the three extra armoured divisions to arrive. By that time 6th Army's southern wing would probably have been flung behind the lower Dnieper, 17th Army would be cut off in the Crimea, and the enemy would be able to move against the rear of 1st Panzer Army from the south coming over the Dnieper on either side of Nikopol. The position of 1st Panzer Army, which was even now confined to a narrow, hose-shaped area reaching as far east as Zaporozhye with its front facing north and east, would then become more than precarious. If this development could not be prevented, there would be nothing for it but to pull 1st Panzer Army out to the west from the eastern part of the Dnieper bend. This would have meant more or less abandoning the latter area, in any case losing Nikopol with its stocks of manganese ore and leaving the Crimea to its fate. Dot to forestall any such development, and in particular to obviate any threat to the rear of 1st Panzer Army, I suggested the following operational expedient to O.K.H. Colon immediately on disengaging from the battle north of Krivoyrog. 40 Panzer Corps should launch a surprise attack with two if possible three armoured divisions from the bridgehead still held by 6th Army south of Nikopol, driving into the flank of the enemy forces which were pursuing 6th Army through the Nogaysk steppes towards the lower Dnieper. The purpose of this thrust would be to enable 6th Army to form a front forward of the Dnieper and to maintain contact with 17th Army in the Crimea. At the same time the threat to 1st Panzer Army's rear would be eliminated. By 12th November at the latest the Corps should again be available north of the Dnieper to take part in the projected stroke in the area of 1st Panzer Army, together with the three extra armoured divisions now due to arrive. Should this meet with the decisive success for which we hoped, it might even be possible to effect a further intervention in 6th Army's area with a view to recapturing the Molitopol Dnieper front. This proposal naturally received enthusiastic approval from Hitler, presenting him as it did with the prospect of keeping Nikopol and the Crimea. Nonetheless, it never came to fruition, as 6th Army's withdrawal behind the lower Dnieper proceeded so fast that a sally by 40 Panzer Corps from the Nikopol bridgehead had no further hope of success. After that, events on the northern wing of the army group ruled out any possibility of using the three armoured divisions still on their way to us in the Dnieper bend. It would have been pointless to mention this plan here at all had it not contained one all important lesson that even when forced to resort to operational expedients, one should never for a moment disregard the fundamental idea on which one's own conduct of operations is based. The army group had continually emphasized the decisive significance of its northern wing, where the enemy could be expected to launch another major attack in the near future. It would thus have been in line with our general conception of things to take steps to prevent any enemy success at this spot. To that end we should have had to take 40 Panzer Corps out of the Dnieper bend after its successful stroke at Krivoyrog and put it behind the northern wing of the army group, where arrangements would also have had to be made to commit the three extra armoured divisions still moving up. In view of the trend in 6th Army's area, however, 
This would inevitably have meant withdrawing 1st Panzer Army out of the eastern part of the Dnieper Bend, which would in turn have necessitated the abandonment of Nikopol and the evacuation of the Crimea. It is quite certain that Hitler, who had let the army group have all five armored divisions for the express purpose of restoring the situation in the Dnieper Bend, would never have agreed to such a scheme of operations. He would have continued to insist that an attempt be made to hold the Dnieper Bend in the Crimea. This does not alter the fact that the army group still ought to have acted in the way indicated above. The proposal made by me, though justified in regard to the threat to 1st Panzer Army, was nevertheless a mistake as far as the army group's operations as a whole were concerned. As a result, 40 Panzer Corps was left pinned down in the Dnieper Bend. There were two reasons why I thus acted against my own basic conception of the way the operations should be conducted. One was the hope that while in possession of the Dnieper line on each side of Nikopol we could deal the enemy surprise blows in quick succession on both banks of the river and, if successful, restore the position on the southern wing. The other reason was that if we did not venture this operation, we should have no choice but to give up the Crimea a particularly painful prospect for those of us who had once conducted 11th Army's bitter struggle for the peninsula. It would still have been more correct, however, not to disregard the principle that the army group's northern wing was operationally the more important. The battle for Kiev at the beginning of November the enemy again attacked the northern wing of the army group, 4th Panzer Army's Dnieper front, with strong forces. It was not clear whether this was an offensive with far-eaching aims or whether the enemy first intended to win the necessary assembly space west of the river. It soon became evident that the formations of 4th Panzer Army would be unable to hold the Dnieper against the far stronger Russians, and by 5th November it could be seen that Kiev would be lost. The army group concluded from this that it would now be necessary to fling all the forces that could be made available in its area, especially the three armored divisions still on their way up, onto its northern wing. Since Hitler had released these divisions expressly for use in the lower Dnieper area, the agreement of OKH had to be obtained. If the latter could not supply 4th Panzer Army with further strong forces, there would be no alternative but to give up the Dnieper Bend. As no decision was forthcoming on this fundamental question, I flew to General Headquarters on 7th November. At the meeting, Hitler declared that he was not prepared to let slip this first unique opportunity offered by the Army Group's proposal to take a hand in 6th Army's area for the sake of preserving the Crimea. No success we might score at Kiev, he said, could be so effective that the armor up there would become free in time to help the southern wing. Neither the Crimea nor the defenses on the lower Dnieper would hold out as long as the dot to this I replied that by adhering to the plan for operations in the Dnieper Bend and 6th Army's area we should be running far too great a risk on our northern wing, which would in turn affect the entire position of Southern Army Group and Army Group A much as I disliked foregoing the stroke south of the lower Dnieper. It was now absolutely essential that we intervene at Kiev with all three of the armored divisions now arriving. Hitler retorted that there were both military and political reasons why we must achieve the success now offered to us in the area of the Lower Dnieper. For one thing, the army must be made conscious that it was still capable of striking successful blows. For another, it was vitally necessary to our war economy that we retain the manganese deposits of Nikopol. Furthermore, the enemy must not be allowed to regain the Crimea as a basis for aerial warfare against the Romanian oil fields. While thoroughly appreciating Hitler's motives, I insisted that the risk on our northern wing was now becoming too great. If things went wrong with 4th Panzer Army, the fate of Southern Army Group and Army Grouper would be sealed sooner or later. Hitler admitted the magnitude of the risk but declared that it was one which must be accepted in our present situation and that he was prepared to shoulder the responsibility. I did succeed, nevertheless, in getting him to agree to send our northern wing the so often promised four Panzer Division of Second Army, incidentally, it did not come this time either, the Nordland SS Brigade and at a later date two Parachute Division. In due course, moreover, he even reconciled himself to seeing not merely one of the three new armored divisions, 25 Panzer, used with 4th Panzer Army instead of in the Dnieper Bend, but the two others as well, one Panzer and Albstandarty.
On the other hand, the two armored divisions of 40 Panzer Corps, 14 and 24, had to remain with 1st Panzer Army, where the door was still to be left open for a blow in 6th Army's area later on. In any case, they could not have been taken away as long as Hitler was not ready to withdraw 1st Panzer Army to the west from its perilous position in the Dnieper Bend, thereby renouncing Nikopol and the Crimea. In the next few days the situation of 4th Panzer Army took a rapid turn for the worse. Its 11 infantry divisions, almost all of which were now down to regimental strength, were no longer a match for an opponent who had committed between 17 and 20 fully manned rifle divisions three or four tank corps and one cavalry corps in the very first wave of his offensive. Even the two armored divisions at the army's disposal as a mobile reserve were too weak to stop the enemy's breakthroughs. After heavy fighting, Kiev had to be evacuated in order that seven corps should not be surrounded in the city. The latter was thrown back to the south, and could only halt the enemy advance some thirty miles away. On the western wing of seven corps, Almost 40 miles southwest of Kiev, the railway junction of Fastov, so essential for detraining reinforcements and supplying 8th Army, fell to the Russians. Both corps on the Dnieper north of Kiev were thrown back to the west, 13 quarters at Tumor and 49 corps to Karosin. Each of these junctions, both of which were important for communication with Central Army Group and supplies to 4th Panzer Army was reached by the enemy. Fourth Panzer Army was now torn into three widely separated groups. The only ray of help in this gloomy situation consisted in the fact that the enemy's assault was also split in two different directions one south and the other west. The Soviet elements advancing westwards would be of no direct consequence as long as they were unable to swing south and perform a large-scale outflanking movement round the army group. To prevent them from doing so until the reinforcements brought up by the army group could intervene was the job of the two corps which had been pushed back to the west. Yet we were to pass through some critical days before the army group's countermeasures could take effect from mid November onwards. These were to consist in a counterblow by the three fresh armored divisions, 25, 1 and the Obstandarty under command of 48 Panzer Corps which had been specially released for this purpose by the army group, against enemy armor advancing in a southwesterly direction from Kiev. At the moment this was the most menacing enemy force in operation. Afterwards the Panzer Corps was to wheel west and smash the enemy pursuing 13 corps towards Zitomodot after a success in this quarter it might yet be possible to drive into the rear of the enemy attacking southwards along the Dnieper. In order to reinforce 4th Panzer Army still further, the army group moved over to extra armored divisions, 3 and 10, 2 Panzer Grenadier divisions, 20 and the SS Rai division, and 198 infantry division from 8th Army. Admittedly this unduly weakened 8th Army's front, but the army group had no choice but to thin out temporarily less important stretches of front in favor of the decisive spot of the moment. Unfortunately, as 48 Panzer Corps could not be assembled before mid November and the situation southwest of Kiev was becoming progressively more grave, the army group unexpectedly had to release the first available armored division, 25 Panzer, for a limited attack at fast of aimed at keeping the Panzer Corps assembly area free. Once again we saw what price a newly drafted division had to pay for its initiation into war conditions in the east. In addition, the divisional commander, who had hastened on in front with his reconnaissance battalion, was put out of action the moment it made contact with the enemy. Instead of leading to the recapture of the fast of junction, therefore, this undertaking caused a psychological setback to troops who were fighting their first action in the east. Nonetheless, by actually making the attack and committing the forces brought over from 8th Army, it was possible to halt the enemy on the front south of Kiev and to prevent the Dnieper front from being outflanked any further. On 15th of November, 48 Panzer Corps was able to deliver the projected counter blow. The first aim was reached with the defeat of the enemy tank corps advancing southwestwards from Kiev. Thereupon, the pressure on 13 Corps was relieved by a swing to the west, and Zitima was duly retaken. 
However, the Panzer Corps ultimate thrust eastwards along the Big Zitima Kiev Road into the rear of the Soviet front south of Kiev came to grief in the mud. But even though this meant that the enemy could not be cleared from the western bank of the Dnieper, it had still been possible initially to overcome 4th Panzer Army's crisis by the beginning of December. The army now held a front running northwards from a point 25 miles south of Kiev to the area north of Zitima. 49 Corps, still in its isolated position around Karosin, had been able to recapture the town and thereby to clear the railway link with Central Army Group. According to 4th Panzer Army, the enemy's losses in dead amounted to some 20,000 men. The fact that only 5,000 prisoners had been taken, as against the 600 tanks, 300 field guns and over 1,200 anti-tank guns reported to have been either captured or destroyed, once again showed the steady rise in the Red Army's scale of equipment. 27 of all the Soviet forces encountered on the Kiev front, two-thirds of the infantry divisions, as well as four tank, one mechanized and one cavalry corps, could be regarded as seriously weakened. Unfortunately, the initially rapid retirement of 4th Panzer Army's corps to the south and west had given Hitler the idea that the command of the army must be placed in other hands. Although I insisted that the loss of the Dnieper front had been due to the superior strength of the enemy and the rundown state of our own divisions rather than to errors in the leadership of the army, Hitler took the view that Colonel General Hoth needed a rest after the excessive strain of the last few years and he was accordingly transferred to the reserve of officers. I deeply regretted his removal, but at least obtained an assurance that he would be given an army in the West after he had had some leave. Hoth was succeeded by a former Austrian officer, General Rouse, who had made his name in the army group as commander of 6 Panzer Division and later of 11 Corps. The second battle of the Dnieper bend while the fighting was still in progress on 4th Panzer Army's front. The enemy had already recovered in mid-November from his setback at Krivoy Rog. With the help of fresh forces, he had launched another major attack in the Dnieper bend against the northern front of 1st Panzer Army and the adjacent right wing, on a front facing east, of 8th Army. On 1st Panzer Army's eastern front he also tried to cross the river south of Zaporozhye and attacked 8th Army's Dnieper front on both sides of Chikasi. Later he extended his offensive still further by an attack from the south on the bridgehead of Nikopol. The corps of 6th Army in here had been placed under command of 1st Panzer Army, the enemy's obvious intention now was finally to encircle 1st Panzer Army in the east of the Dnieper bend and to destroy it. The dot this turn of events in the second half of November impelled the army group to approach OKH regarding the further conduct of operations. A memorandum we submitted on 10th November was based on the premise that in spite of his present mass engagement of troops on the army group front, the enemy still had powerful strategic reserves at his disposal. According to available intelligence, we pointed out, 44 rifle divisions and a large number of armored brigades set up by the Soviets in 1943 had still not been committed to battle. In addition, it could be assumed that 33 rifle divisions and 11 tank or mechanized corps were now being rested and refitted behind the enemy front. Hence the enemy must be expected to go on with his offensive against the southern wing of the eastern front throughout the winter exerting his main pressure on the northern wing of Southern Army Group. Even if our current counterstroke in 4th Panzer Army's sector should turn out favorably, the enemy would still be able to maintain an adequate assembly area west of the Dnieper from which to resume his offensive later on. For this reason there could be no question of releasing forces from the Army Group's operationally decisive northern wing for a supporting action in the Dnieper bend. Should it nevertheless be possible, we said, to ward off the enemy offensive now in full swing in the latter area and simultaneously to stabilize the situation in 4th Panzer Army's sector, things would still develop on the following lines. The army group would have to get through the winter holding a front which far exceeded the resources of its almost completely exhausted divisions. It would not have enough reserves to take effective action against any major enemy attacks particularly if called upon to do so at several places at once. Operationally, therefore, the army group would remain completely at the enemy's mercy.
a particularly dangerous state of affairs in view of the reduced fighting power of its own formations. No battle fought on this basis would have the effect of decisively diminishing the enemy's offensive capacity. The fact that the Soviets would continuously be in a position to dictate our actions to us, while we ourselves were unable to form reserves in time to ward off or anticipate his blows, would cause us excessive losses not only of ground but also of weapons and manpower. The prior condition for successfully prosecuting this struggle, we insisted, was a sufficiency of hard hitting reserves. If these could not be transferred from other theatres, they must be created by radically shortening the front on the German southern wing, including a seaborne withdrawal of 17th Army from the Crimea. The army group could not last the winter if it had to fight without reserves. Up to the end of November, the situation on the southern wing of the Eastern Front developed as follows. South of the Lower Dnieper, Army Group A, 6th Army's right wing had vanished behind the lower arm of the river, leaving only a narrow bridgehead at Kusum. 17th Army was cut off in the Crimea and barring the approaches to the peninsula. On the other hand, it had proved possible to maintain the bridgehead forward of Nikopol in its entire breadth, despite the fact that 4th Ukrainian Front, the responsible Soviet formation in the south, had committed its main forces 18 divisions and strong armor to the attack here. For the time being, the enemy had called a halt in front of the lower arm of the Dnieper and the Crimean approaches. In the Dnieper bend, he had been able to cross the river on a narrow front south of Zaporozhye and to form a small bridgehead. Otherwise, 1st Panzer Army's defensive tactics had been entirely successful, for although it had been pushed back slightly in some places as a result of the enemy's unremitting attacks, the latter had nowhere forced a breakthrough. Nonetheless, the fighting had compelled the army to commit its last reserves. At the end of November it was holding a continuous front which ran from north of Zaporozhye to northwest of Krivoyrog, where it bent round to the north to join up with 8th Army. 8th Army's own position had become very ticklish, partly, of course, because of the loss of the 1 infantry and 4 mobile divisions which it had had to hand over to 4th Panzer Army to cope with the situation at Kiev at the beginning of November. The enemy had been able to extend his firm base south of the Dnieper in the Krumenchug sector so far upstream that he now had control of the Krumenchug crossing point. Southwest of the town, moreover, he had punched a hole however narrow it might be at the moment in the army front facing east. On 8th Army's northern front on the Dnieper the enemy had made a successful crossing on both sides of Chikasi. Not having any reserves left, the army had been forced to abandon some 60 miles of river bank and to set up a new though extremely thin defensive front behind a marshy water course which ran parallel to the Dnieper about 30 miles south of it. Although the army group had let 8th Army have two mobile formations from both 1st and 4th Panzer armies as soon as their positions permitted it to do so, it was doubtful whether 8th Army could close the gap in its eastern front and regain control of the situation at Chikasi. This gives some idea of the extent to which the army group had to rush its armoured formations to and fro. Each attempt to restore the situation at one point by the use of mobile divisions inevitably provoked a crisis in the army area from which they had come. By the end of November, at all events, the line of the Dnieper from north of Zaporozhye to west of Chikasi, and also from south of Kiev right up into Central Army Group's sector, was in enemy hands. On Southern Army Group's northern wing, in the area of 4th Panzer Army, the tension had temporarily relaxed after 48th Panzer Corps' successful counterstroke. Yet there could be no doubt whatever that the enemy was going to assemble fresh forces here and then deliver the decisive thrust into the deep flank of the Army Group. Despite this, the urgent need to continue the struggle for the Dnieper bend had made it imperative to return the two aforementioned mobile formations to 8th Army. At the beginning of December, 4th Panzer Army still had its right wing on the Dnieper, where its 24 Panzer Corps was in contact with the left wing of 8th Army upstream from the Kanef crossing. 28 some 30 miles south of Kiev the front swung sharply away from the river to the west and described a continuous line. 48 and 7 Panzer Corps and 13 Corps, as far as the region north of Zatima. Some distance away, with a front facing east, 
was 59 core around Karos and dot a battle all along the Lin Soviet attempts to force an issue in the Dnieper bend continued throughout December. Except for occasional pauses to substitute fresh formations for those which had grown battle weary or to throw additional forces into the struggle, the enemy subjected this eastern bastion of ours to an unending succession of assaults which unquestionably caused him extremely heavy casualties. In the actual bend of the river, three Ukrainian front repeatedly attacked the northern front of 1st Panzer Army, 30 Corps and 57 Panzer Corps but in spite of its immense preponderance of numbers it did not achieve any success worth mentioning. Simultaneously two Ukrainian front, hitherto known as the Steppes Front, put in no fewer than six rifle armies and one tank army in order to overrun the left wing of 1st Panzer Army and the 8th Army Front facing east. The enemy clearly intended, by employing a massive concentration of armor, to break through to the southwest in the area northwest of Krivoyrog on the boundary between the two German armies. Having once achieved this, he would be able to encircle 1st Panzer Army in the east of the Dnieper bend by driving on towards the lower arm of the river. A second area on which this offensive appeared to be focused was the northern part of 8th Army's eastern front south of the Dnieper. The enemy's aim here was presumably to bring about the encirclement of 8th Army in conjunction with a sudden push from the bridgehead he had won at Chikasi. At the same time three armies of four Ukrainian front attacked the Nikopol bridgehead which automatically included the rear of 1st Panzer Army from the south. While these attacks were beaten off, the overwhelming superiority of two Ukrainian fronts attack on the left wing of 1st Panzer Army inevitably brought the enemy certain successes against 8th Army. On two occasions he succeeded in breaking through in considerable depth at the two main points of effort mentioned above. As a result, our front had to fall back gradually between Krivoyrog, which could still be held, and the Dnieper. In both cases the army group was able though only by seriously weakening sectors which were temporarily less threatened to assemble a panzer corps of several divisions at the spot in question and, by counter-attacking the enemy breakthrough, to prevent it from affecting the operations as a whole. Yet it was unavoidable in this heavy fighting that the German formations should show increasing signs of battle fatigue. The infantry divisions were no longer getting a moment's respite and the armoured forces had to be rushed like firefighters from one sector of the front to the next. While the enemy's own losses in killed and wounded were undoubtedly many times greater than our own, he was still able to replace them. On the other hand, none of the army group's attempts to convince the Supreme Command that it was operationally incorrect to use our forces in the Dnieper bend produced any real results. OKH could not find the necessary replacements of personnel and materiel to compensate for the loss of fighting power, and Hitler refused to agree to a timely surrender of this bastion for the purpose of extracting forces to use on the operationally far more important northern wing. All our warnings that the present successes in defending the Dnieper Bend could not remove the danger of 1st Panzer Army's ultimate encirclement, as long as the enemy continued to bring up reinforcements, fell on deaf ears. So did our attempts to point out the urgency of forming reserves in the south by shortening the front. On the contrary, we had ultimately had no choice as I have already mentioned but to throw two divisions into the Dnieper bend from the army group's northern wing, where they would have been far more usefully placed. It needed a desperate crisis on this northern wing before Hitler would face up and even then most reluctantly to these operational necessities. The reason which he continued to give for hanging on to the Dnieper bend was the importance of Nikopol and the Crimea to our war effort. Even now he had not relinquished the hope that once the enemy attacks in the Dnieper bend had been beaten off it would be possible to strike another blow southwards to free the Crimea. What also influenced him here was doubtless the belief that the enemy would finally bleed to death so long as he, Hitler, insisted on holding every foot of ground just as he had done outside Moscow in 1941. Every time a shortening of the front was advocated, moreover, he repeatedly fell back on the quite irrefutable argument that this would release enemy formations as well. What Hitler chose to overlook was that although an attacker may bleed to death before an adequately defended front, 
Any attempt to hold one which can at best be manned on the scale of a safety screen will merely cause the meager defending forces to be expended at an excessive rate. Assuming, that is, that the enemy does not simply overrun them. On the northern wing of the army group, admittedly, the strokes delivered by 4th Panzer Army's 48th Panzer Corps had created a breathing space, but there could not be the slightest doubt that the enemy would resume the offensive there as soon as he had made good his losses. 4th Panzer Army's task must be to postpone that moment as long as possible by continuing to weaken its opponent. Furthermore, as the main forces of the army were now disposed along a front facing north between the Dnieper and the region north of Zitima, there was as much danger as ever that the enemy would try to outflank its western wing a maneuver which 59 Corps, isolated around Karossin, was in no position to prevent. As 4th Panzer Army's forces were in any case insufficient to dislodge the enemy completely from the western bank of the Dnieper by an attack towards Kiev. The army group felt it must at least try to create a margin of safety for the army's western wing. The longer it was possible to retain the initiative regained the by 48 Panzer Corps, the better it would be. Fourth Panzer Army was accordingly directed to exploit the situation on the now open western wing in the Zitama Karossin area with a view to launching further offensive blows against limited objectives. On Army Group instructions, 48 Panzer Corps was taken out of the front facing north and, by the use of extensive camouflage and deception tactics, moved by night into the open western flank of the enemy's 60th Army north of Zitima. In the surprise attack that followed, the latter was rolled up from the west. Immediately afterwards the corps struck another blow at an enemy force in the process of grouping southeast of Karossin, in the course of which at least three mechanized corps were badly mauled. Eventually, then, it was possible not only to smash parts of the new offensive group before it could finish forming west of the Dnieper but also to re-establish a certain degree of control over the area opposite 4th Panzer Army's left wing. This did not alter the fact that another serious storm was brewing on the same wing of the army group. It broke loose on 24 December. I received the first reports of the start of an enemy attack on both sides of the Kiev Zitima road while I was visiting 20 Panzer Grenadier Division, which was in reserve behind the threatened front. I was there to attend the Christmas celebrations of its regiments. At first, the news did not sound any too serious. The only area where things looked at all precarious being that of 25 Panzer Division south of the road. However, the evening situation reports which I saw on arriving back at our headquarters in Vinitsa indicated that the enemy was attempting a large-scale breakthrough towards Zitama. In the next few days the following intelligence picture emerged Ukrainian front in the Kiev sector had concentrated very powerful forces west of the town for a broad breakthrough along and south of the Zitama road. In this main assault group were 38th. First Guards and First Tank Armies, initially embracing over 18 rifle divisions and 6 tank or mechanized corps. Within the next few days 18th Army was also identified. This main attack was extended southwards by 40th Army south of Fastov. On the northern wing of the assault front the recently beaten 60th Army, since brought up to strength, and further north 13th Army were advancing on Karossin with at least 14 rifle divisions and one cavalry corps under command. While some of these forces had been severely weakened in the aforementioned attack by our 48 Panzer Corps, 3rd Guards Tank Army, with a strength of no less than 6 tank or mechanized corps, appeared to be busy assembling behind them. Admittedly three or four of these corps, too, had been badly hit in the recent fighting but the Hydra lost no time in sprouting new heads. Anyway, this concentration of mobile formations implied that the enemy intended to supplement the breakthrough towards Zitama with a far-flung outflanking movement by way of Karossin. It is true that 48 Panzer Corps, consisting of two hard-hitting armored divisions, 168 Infantry Division and 18 Artillery Division, newly formed in the Army Group area, was being held in readiness around Zitama, behind the most badly threatened sector of front, now commanded by 42 Corps. It was open to doubt, however, whether these forces would suffice to halt a thrust by an enemy so many times stronger than themselves. 
and even if they should do so, there would still not be enough forces to meet the threat of an enemy thrust through Karosin, followed by an envelopment of the army group's northern wing. On 25th December, therefore, the army group sent OKH a teleprinter message outlining our own position in relation to the enemies and pointing out what inferences were to be drawn. With the forces it had at present, we reported, 4th Panzer Army could not stop the enemy offensive, which meant that it could not fulfill its task of covering the deep flank of Southern Army Group and Army Group A. Consequently the army must be radically reinforced. If OKH had no more forces for this purpose, the army group would be compelled to detach at least five or six divisions from its right wing. In that event the latter obviously could not remain its present position in the Dnieper bend, and we must accordingly request that it be granted freedom of action. At the same time 4th Panzer Army was directed in the first instance to use all its available forces to stop the main Soviet assault group from breaking through towards Zitomir in 42 core sector. Its northern wing, 13 and 59 core, the army was told must engage the enemy in such a way that he was prevented from turning down on Zitima. 17 Panzer Division, already released from 6th Army, which had temporarily reverted to the Army Group's command, on the Lower Dnieper, was moved over to 4th Panzer Army. In reply to a further inquiry from OKH which, doubtless at the instance of Hitler, was again directed at obtaining a compromise solution in the Dnieper Bend. The Army Group reported that the time for attempting to master the situation on the Army Group's northern wing by such isolated measures as the transfer of single divisions is now past. To judge from the size of the force which the enemy had committed up there, we said, not even a temporary stoppage of his offensive could make any difference now, particularly as he would certainly be throwing further elements of his winter reserves into the battle. In fact the position was such that developments in the area Karosin Zitoma Berdichev Vinitsa south of Kiev in the next few weeks would decide whether or not the southern wing of the German armies in the east would be cut off and forced away to the southwest. It was imperative that energetic measures be taken to counteract this danger. The situation was similar to that in which the army group had found itself during the winter of 1942-3 when the only possible means of repairing the front had been to leapfrog 1st and 4th Panzer armies from the right to the left wing. What must be done now was to release 1st Panzer army from the Dnieper bend and shift it over towards Berdichev with at least 5 or 6 divisions. This could only be achieved by giving up the eastern part of the Dnieper bend and taking the front the back into prepared positions on a line running from the knee of the Dnieper west of Nikopol to Krivoy Rog. By shortening the front in this way, we explained, we should be saving twelve divisions. Six of them, as already stated, were to be sent to 1st Panzer Army on the Army Group's northern wing. The remainder were to be left to 6th Army which was to take over what had hitherto been 1st Panzer Army's sector for the purpose of establishing a defense on the lower Dnieper. The forces to be thrown over to the northern wing of the army group were as far as possible to be directed from the east against the enemy spearhead breaking through to Zitoma. In addition, OKH would have to send further forces to the northern wing of the army group to intercept the enemy outflanking movement which threatened there. Later, if possible, these forces would be used from the west to supplement 1st Panzer Army's attack on the main assault group. We also pointed out that, while the present situation in the Dnieper bend, where the enemy's attacks had temporarily slackened off, would permit this regrouping to take place without any great risk, the proposed withdrawal of the front was liable to prove difficult if we waited until the enemy was again ready to attack the dot in view of the above, as well as of 4th Panzer Army's own position. We concluded, it was essential that the Supreme Command make a quick decision. When, despite promptings from us, there was still no decision on this proposal by 28th December but merely the promise of one or two divisions for 4th Panzer Army, the Army Group issued the appropriate orders on 29th December. HQ 1st Panzer Army was to hand over its present sector to 6th Army by 1st January and, by 3rd January at the latest to take over 4th Panzer Armies, that is 24 Panzer and 7 Corps, front running from the Dnieper to a point some 27 miles southeast of Berdichev.
Behind the left wing of this front three Panzer Corps was to assemble with four divisions drawn from the Dnieper Bend or 6th Army, 6 and 17 Panzer Divisions, 16 Panzer Grenadier Division and 101 Light, Jager, Division. Other divisions would follow. One reason why this switch of 1st Panzer Army was not initiated on an even larger scale was the limited availability of transport. Another, however, was that the army group could not order the evacuation of the eastern part of the Dnieper Bend without Hitler's consent, as it was bound to have direct repercussions on the position of army group A even at army group level. Unfortunately, the possibility of taking decisions independently of the Supreme Command ends where the power to coordinate operations between the army groups begins. To the stretch of front remaining to 4th Panzer Army were to come the forces put at its disposal by OKH HQ 46 Corps, with 16 Panzer Division, 1 Infantry Division, and 4 Mountain Division under command. It remained doubtful, however whether these would suffice for the two counterblows planned against the flanks of the main enemy assault group driving towards the southwest. The first thing, in any case, was to bring the enemy to a standstill. On 30th December the army group reported the steps it had taken to OKH, and the following day Hitler belatedly gave his consent. On the other hand, he continued to evade the urgently needed decision to give up the eastern part of the Dnieper Bend and with it the bridgehead of Nikopol. While the transfer of forces ordered by the army group was being set in motion, the situation in 4th Panzer Army's sector became increasingly ominous by 31st December. The main enemy assault group had achieved a wide breakthrough to the southwest in the direction of Vinitsa. Although the army's front south of Kiev, 24 Panzer and 7 Corps, was still holding, it had had to bend back its western wing considerably. Beyond it, in the area where three Panzer Corps was supposed to assemble, there was a gaping void 50 miles wide. Not until a point less than 30 miles southeast of Berdichev did another thin front belonging to 4th Panzer Army begin, and even this, running hard east of the road from Berdichev to Zitima, petered out again north of the latter. Fighting around Zitima, with a front facing north and east, was 13 Corps. Between 8 and 59 Corps, which had been pushed back to the west of Karosin, yawned another 50 mile gap in which, some distance to the rear, 26 Panzer Corps was to concentrate. Fortunately, the opposing forces were temporarily engaged against the disconnected groups of 4th Panzer Army described above. As for the broad gaps between them, the enemy had so far not fully exploited or else entirely failed to appreciate the chances they offered his mobile elements of driving straight through to the army group's rear areas or else of surrounding 4th Panzer Army. At the beginning of January the position of the army group as a whole grew progressively worse. In the Dnieper Bend, and this also applied to the Nikopol Bridgehead, a fresh offensive was being prepared against 6th and 8th armies. Should it break loose before the eastern part of the river bend had been relinquished in accordance with the army group's demand, the situation of this wing could become extremely grave. Worst of all, it would no longer be possible to disengage the armored divisions which were to follow HQ 1st Panzer Army to the northern wing as a second wave and whose release had already been ordered by the army group. A major enemy attack did in fact materialize east of Kirovograd on 3rd January and the two divisions there were stuck for the time being. All this time it was becoming increasingly urgent that the northern wing should be supplied with further forces, the enemy having meanwhile recognized the big opportunity offered to him by the gaps torn in 4th Panzer Army's front. In what was now the area of 1st Panzer Army, the headquarters of which had assumed command in the sector south and southwest of Kiev with effect from 3rd January, the enemy pushed southwards to a point some 30 miles north of Amman. Here he was provisionally halted by the arrival of three Panzer Cal forward elements. A particularly serious situation had arisen in 4th Panzer Army. Faced with the danger of having both wings outflanked, it had by 4th January been compelled to fall back onto a front which began less than 40 miles east of Vinitsu and ran north towards Berdichev for which a battle was already in progress, 
finally ending about 40 miles west of the town on the former Soviet Polish frontier. In the broad gap between ourselves and Central Army Group further north, 59 Corps had gone back to the former frontier along and north of the highway from Zitoma to Rovno. These developments during the first few days of the month impelled me to fly to Hitler's headquarters on 4th January to try to persuade him once and for all of the need for a radical transposition of forces from the right to the left wing of the army group. I began by describing the new danger threatening us in the Dnieper Bend and the exceedingly critical state of affairs in the area of 4th Panzer Army. Next I gave a detailed explanation of our plan to take the enemy harassing this army in his flanks by attacking with 1st Panzer Army's 3 Panzer Corps from the east and with 26 Panzer Corps, now arriving behind 4th Panzer Army's northern wing, from the northwest. 29 At the same time I warned Hitler that the most these projected counter-attacks could do would be to provide a purely temporary relief from the immediate danger which threatened. From a long-term point of view they offered no solution to the situation on the army group's northern wing. If the position here were not cleared up once and for all, the entire southern wing of the eastern front would be in mortal peril, and southern army group and army grouper would ultimately meet their end in Romania or on the Black Sea. If the Supreme Command, therefore, did not provide substantial reinforcements, it would no longer be possible to put off withdrawing the southern wing of the army group which would mean abandoning Nicopol and, ipso facto, the Crimea, for the purpose of extracting forces for the decisive northern wing. I ought to point out at this stage that the army group regarded a withdrawal from the east of the Dnieper Bend as only the first step towards transposing the main effort to the northern wing on a scale consistent with the overall situation. In order to regroup to that extent, it would be necessary to shorten the front in the south far more radically. For this reason, the army group had already taken the precaution of having a defense line further west reconnoitered and developed, a fact of which Hitler was naturally aware. Taking advantage of favorable stretches of river, this line ran in a more or less northerly or northwesterly direction from the lower reaches of the Bug to the southern extremities of the area in which the battles of the army group's northern wing were at present raging. Occupation of this line would roughly halve the length of front being held by 6th and 8th armies, which had now been stretched to 560 miles through the continued retention of the Dnieper Bend. By cutting our frontage as drastically as this and saving really substantial forces, coupled with the transfer of 17th Army from the Crimea to the mainland, we should at last be able to shift our main effort to our northern wing. At the same time the southern wing would still be left with enough forces to hold the aforementioned line against a far superior opponent. On the other hand, in view of the damage we had done to his railway network, the enemy would scarcely be capable of shifting forces from his own southern wing into the area west of Kiev at the same speed and on the same scale as we could dot the basis for such a sweeping withdrawal of the German southern wing, of course first had to be created by the evacuation of the Dnieper Bend. To have demanded it straight off would have been most inexpedient in view of what we knew Hitler's attitude to be. He just was not the man to recognize the need for a far-sighted operational policy. On the contrary, Hitler even now categorically refused to evacuate the Dnieper Bend or to give up Nikopol, as he contended that the resultant loss of the Crimea would provoke a change of heart in Turkey as well as in Bulgaria and Romania. He went on to declare that he was in no position to let the army group have any further forces for its northern wing, as he would at best be able to take these from northern army group, and then only by pulling it back to Lake Pepus. This might lead to the defection of Finland, which would in turn lose us mastery of the Baltic. Thereafter it would no longer be possible to bring ore from Sweden, and our U-boats would be deprived of a vital training area. As for giving us forces from the west, said Hitler, he could not do this until an enemy landing had first been beaten off or the British did as he expected and tied themselves down in Portugal. What he must do was to play for time until things clarified in the west and our new formations were ready to go into action. From May onwards, moreover, Submarine warfare would begin to make its effect felt. There were so many disagreements on the enemy side, Hitler added, that the coalition was bound to fall apart one day. 
to gain time was therefore a matter of paramount importance. While he took just as grave a view as I did of the threat to my army group, he had to accept a risk here until he had more forces at his disposal. It was quite futile to attempt to refute Hitler's arguments, since he would merely retort as he could usually do in such cases that I lacked an overall perspective. All I could do was to keep referring to the gravity of the situation on our northern wing and to emphasize that the countermeasures being taken by the army group could not possibly offer a final solution to the crisis. It was absolutely imperative that in some way or other a new army be swiftly assembled behind the northern wing of the army group, roughly in the region of Rovno, to meet the threat of a large-scale envelopment by the enemy. As there could be no point in prolonging this discussion with Hitler in front of the large number of people who attended the daily conference, I asked to see him privately, with only the chief of staff present. Obviously wondering what I was going to bring up this time, Hitler reluctantly gave his consent, and the emissaries of OKW and Goring, the various aides, Hitler's historiographer and the two stenographers duly departed. Normally the stenographers had to take down every word at these daily meetings. Having no maps in front of them, however, they often could not grasp the sense of all that was said. I had flown to general headquarters with the firm intention of raising the question of the top-level military leadership again, in addition to discussing the position of my army group. As soon as everyone but General Zietzler had left the room, I asked leave to speak quite openly. Please do, said Hitler. His manner, if not actually icy, was certainly distant. One thing we must be clear about, mein Führer, I began is that the extremely critical situation we are now in cannot be put down to the enemy's superiority alone, great though it is. It is also due to the way in which we are led. As I spoke these words, Hitler's expression hardened. He stared at me with a look which made me feel he wished to crush my will to continue. I cannot remember a human gaze ever conveying such willpower. In his otherwise coarse face, the eyes were probably the only attractive and certainly the most expressive feature, and now they were boring into me as if to force me to my knees. At the same moment the notion of an Indian snake charmer flashed through my mind, and I realized that those eyes must have intimidated many a man before me. I still went on talking, however, and told Hitler that things simply could not go on under the present type of leadership. I must, I said revert to the proposal I had made to him twice already. To handle grand strategy he needed one thoroughly responsible chief of staff on whose advice alone he must rely in all matters of military policy. The logical effect of this arrangement on the Eastern Front must be as was already the case in Italy and the West the appointment of a commander-in-chief enjoying full independence within the framework of grand strategy. As had happened on the two previous occasions when I had approached Hitler about the need for a radical change in his handling of military affairs, amounting in practice, if not formally, to his relinquishment of command, he reacted entirely negatively asserting that he alone could decide what forces were available for the various theatres of war and what policies should be pursued there. In any case, he said, Goring would never submit to another man's orders. As regards the proposed appointment of a commander-in-chief for the Eastern Theatre of War, I have already quoted Hitler's retort that no other man would have the same authority as he had. Even I cannot get the field marshals to obey me. He cried. Do you imagine? for example, that they would obey you any more readily? If it comes to the worst, I can dismiss them. No one else would have the authority to do that. Dot when I replied that my orders were always carried out, he made no further comment and brought the meeting to a close. Dot once again, then, I had failed in a well-disposed attempt to persuade Hitler to change the system of command at the top in such a way as to satisfy the exigencies of the war without outwardly affecting his prestige. His unwillingness to hand over to a soldier was probably due in part to his exaggerated faith in his own powers. Not even in private would he admit to having made mistakes or to being in need of a military adviser. Another cause was probably the mistrust which made the dictator determined to keep the army under his control against any contingency. On the other hand, I was well aware that any attempt to settle the matter by force would lead to the collapse of our armies in the field. As far as I was concerned, 
the prospect of the Russians getting into Germany excluded the use of violent means just as much as the Anglo-Saxon demand for unconditional surrender. And so I had to return to my headquarters without having been able to get the army group's position alleviated or to bring about a rational organization of command at the top. On no account, however, were we going to abandon our efforts to gain freedom of movement for our right wing in the Dnieper Bend and to reinforce our wing in the north. In view of the negative outcome of the conference at Hitler's headquarters, the army group was left with no choice but to carry on with the struggle in the Dnieper Bend. On its northern wing operations had to be conducted in such a way as to prevent the enemy from encircling 4th Panzer Army and breaking through to the south. which would result in the severance of all the southern wing's rear communications. Throughout January the enemy in the Dnieper Bend continued to pit all his strength against the bastion we were still having to hold there. In doing so, he assailed 8th Army's eastern front with particular fury though the sector now commanded by 6th Army also had to fight off repeated attacks. The latter were directed not only against the front facing north inside the river bend but also from the south against the Nikopol bridgehead. Thanks to the heroism of the German troops and the numerous stop gaps devised by the two army commands, the enemy in this combat area continued to have only limited success, despite the fact that he was now many times stronger in numbers and materiel. Although 8th Army's front was pushed back a little to the west and Kirovograd was abandoned, the enemy still did not accomplish a decisive breakthrough for the purpose of trapping our forces in the Dnieper Bend. On the Army Group's left wing, on the other hand, the situation was becoming more and more difficult. 4th Panzer Army, unable to withstand the intensive enemy pressure, found itself compelled to give up Berdichev and in order to preserve a minimum degree of continuity on the main part of its front to fall back further still to the west and southwest. But that was not the worst of it. What constituted an infinitely greater danger was that around 6th January the enemy had realized what opportunities were offered to him by the gap between 1st Panzer Army and the right wing of 4th Panzer Army as well as by the wide open space which had appeared between 4th Panzer Army and Central Army Group. Inside the latter a week, Solitary 59 Corps was making a fighting withdrawal towards Rovno. It became clear that the enemy had now halted along the front of 4th Panzer Army in order to exploit his chances in its exposed flanks. While he sought to demolish 4th Panzer Army's northern wing with three armies, 18th, 1st Guards and 1st Guards Tank. He dispatched his 60th and 13th armies on a pursuit to Rovno further north. At the same time strong Soviet forces, 1st Tank and 40th armies, drove further southwards in the gap between our own 1st and 4th Panzer armies. Their spearheads got to about 20 miles north of Amman, the supply base of 1st Panzer army, and close to Vinitsa, where army group headquarters had previously been. The latter had been transferred to Priskirov a few days earlier when the signals links with the army group's right wing were endangered by the sudden Soviet push. Eventually enemy armor even succeeded in temporarily blocking the most important of the army group's railway supply lines at Zmarinka. Those further south ran through Romanian territory and had a lower efficiency. In this situation the army group had to choose between two courses. Should it take steps to counteract a further enemy thrust in its almost wide open northern flank, where there was an inherent possibility of a far flung outflanking movement round its northern wing later on? Or was it more important to prevent the enemy's final breakthrough in the gap between 1st Panzer and 4th Panzer armies? There were insufficient forces available to discharge both tasks at once. We resolved to tackle the second danger first as the more pressing of the two. If the enemy were allowed to drive through this gap in strength and to head south towards the upper bug, 8th and 6th armies would face an imminent threat of being cut off. Conversely, a continuation of the enemy's advance in the army group's northern flank would not constitute a direct threat to our existence until sometime in the less immediate future. Up here a certain relief would ultimately be provided by the forces which Hitler would sooner or later be compelled to bring up. If, on the other hand, the two armies of the southern wing were once cut off, 
there would no longer be any possibility of extricating them. The only correct solution an extensive withdrawal of the army group's southern wing for the sake of gaining forces to overcome the crisis on the northern one was still categorically vetoed by Hitler. In the light of these considerations we decided first of all to concentrate all the forces that could possibly be spared for a stroke against the enemy advancing southwards in the gap between 1st Panzer and 4th Panzer armies. This gap was rendered even more dangerous by the fact that the enemy's breakthrough in the direction of a man had forced 1st Panzer Army to bend its western wing in the area southwest of Kiev back to the south. It now stood back to back, so to speak, with 8th Army, which had its front facing eastwards in the Dnieper bend. As the inner wings of both armies still held the Dnieper on either side of Kiev, the German position formed a sort of sack of which the top was hitched to the Dnieper in the north and the two sides formed the above-mentioned fronts of the two armies, facing east and west respectively. If the enemy in the gap north of Amman were successful, it would be only too easy for him to isolate this sack in the south. The most sensible thing, of course, would have been to evacuate it, since forces were being unprofitably used on its defense. But here, too, Hitler was on no account prepared to see the Dnieper bank abandoned voluntarily. He was still hoping that by using this salient as a springboard he would one day be able to recapture the eastern part of the Dnieper bend. And so the sack remained in existence. Not very long afterwards it became the Chukasi pocket. The army group intended that the blow to be struck at the enemy advancing between 4th and 1st Panzer armies should take the form of a three pronged pincer attack. From the east out of 1st Panzer armies, Sector 7 Corps had to thrust into the enemy's flank. It was released from the above mentioned salient by an army group order laying down that only a weak defensive screen should remain on the Dnieper. This measure paid off in so far as the corps was not caught in the Chikasi pocket later on. From the west, 46 Panzer Corps was to drive into the other flank. At this moment, it was still on its way over from France. From the south, 3 Panzer Corps, released by the army group from the Dnieper bend, was thrown in to meet the enemy. Its task was to hold him down by mobile fighting until the two other corps were ready to attack. By the second half of January, everything was set for the counterblow. Because of the small number of formations available, however, it had to be carried out in two phases, the gap between 4th and 1st Panzer armies having meanwhile widened to almost 45 miles. In the first instance, Seven Corps and three Panzer Corps defeated 40th Soviet Army in the eastern part of the gap. Thereafter, as the result of another concentric attack by three and 26 Panzer Corps in which one infantry division, four mountain division and 18 artillery division played a substantial part, appreciable elements of the enemy's first tank army were surrounded and smashed in the west of the gap. During the latter attack I no longer possess the figures for the first one approximately 5,000 Soviet troops were killed, and though only 5,500 were taken prisoner, the enemy lost 700 tanks, more than 200 field guns and around 500 anti-tank guns. 14 Soviet infantry divisions and 5 tank corps mechanized corps had been affected by the two strokes though the enemy had doubtless managed to save at least a part of his troops from encirclement. While all this was taking place, of course, the controversy between Army Group and OKH on the question of future operations continued. Time after time we stressed the importance of finally granting freedom of movement to our right wing and ceasing to clamp it down in the Dnieper bend, which had long been an improper policy from the operational point of view. In a letter submitted through the Chief of the General Staff, I took Hitler up on the arguments he had given me on 4th January for holding fast to the Dnieper bend. The attitudes of Turkey, Bulgaria and Romania, I told him, would depend less on the Crimea than the presence of an intact German southern wing forward of the eastern frontier of the two last named countries. The army group was also at pains to emphasize that the final issue on the whole of the German southern wing would depend on the timely assembly of a strong army around Rovno behind the army group's left wing whether this was done by disengaging forces from the right wing after pulling it back onto a shortened front, 
by transferring formations down from Northern Army Group or by evacuating 17th Army from the Crimea. Only if we could assemble this army around Rovno in good time, we said, could the enemy be prevented from executing a wide envelopment movement in our northern flank and thereby from forcing the entire southern wing of our eastern front away to Romania. While the Chief of Staff entirely concurred with our views and made repeated efforts to get Hitler to listen to them, the latter stuck to his principle of stubbornly holding on at all costs. It was impossible to obtain a directive on how he proposed to conduct operations on a longer term basis that is further than holding on for the next 24 hours. What made this sort of leadership more irrational than ever was the fact that even OKH credited the enemy with still having powerful strategic reserves at his disposal which he must be expected to commit sooner or later. How could anyone exercise proper command in the field when Hitler did not even tell the army groups how he conceived the future of operations generally? How, if those enemy reserves actually did exist, was their intervention to be anticipated with any degree of foresight? This impossible state of affairs was the subject of a letter in which I stated the following If any leadership is to be successful, it must be based on a harmonious coordination of policy at all levels which is dependent on clear directives from the top and a unanimous appreciation of the situation obtaining on the enemy's side. The army group cannot merely think from one day to the next. It cannot make do with the directive to hold on regardless when at the very same time it sees the enemy preparing to force the issue by an outflanking movement which it has no means of opposing. I must therefore request OKH either to accept the army group's views on the basis of the appreciations already submitted or else to refute them by passing down its own appreciation of future developments. If the Supreme Command remains dumb as well as deaf to the conclusions drawn by the army group in its own limited sphere of activity, a coordinated policy will be quite out of the question. When there was no reply to this either, I wrote a long letter to Hitler personally. Once again I pointed out the situation of the army group, the operational possibilities open to the enemy, and the state of our own troops. I left no room for doubt as to how the overall situation must develop if no action were taken in accordance with the army group's recommendations. In particular, I underlined the vital necessity of assembling forces with the least possible delay behind the army group's northern wing to counteract the enemy's palpable intention of outflanking it, with all the far-reaching consequences this would entail. Considering the urgency of this, as well as the danger lying in the eventual isolation of the army group's southern wing in the Dnieper bend, I closed with the words allow me to say this in conclusion, mein Führer, as far as we are concerned, it is a matter not of eluding a danger but of taking steps to overcome one which we may shortly be compelled to face. This communication was to play its part in a clash I had with Hitler a few days later. On 27 January, he summoned all army group and army commanders on the Eastern Front, in addition to a large number of other senior officers, to general headquarters. He wished to address us in person on the need for national socialist education inside the army. The more difficult the military situation became, the greater importance he attached to faith as a guarantee of victory. It was an attitude which he sought to apply more and more in the selection of senior officers for posts down to divisional commander. Even in his greeting at the simple luncheon which preceded the meeting, one sensed that he had not forgiven me for the criticism implicit in my comments of 4th January. Now, in his address, he actually went so far as to throw the following words in the faces of the men whose armies had accomplished so much. If the end should come one day, he said. It should really be the field marshals and generals who stand by the flags to the last dot I have never been one to put up with insults. Furthermore, Hitler's words were bound to strike any soldier as a deliberate snub to the army leaders whose courage and will to fulfill their soldierly duty to the bitter end were now being called into question. Being accustomed to listen to a superior in silence, all those present held their peace. But I personally felt the implied insult so strongly that the blood rushed to my head, and when, by way of emphasis, Hitler repeated his remarks, I called out, and so they will, mein Führer. This exclamation of mine naturally had nothing whatever to do with my attitude towards the National Socialist system. 
it was merely intended to show that we were not going to accept imputations of that sort from anyone, including Hitler. I was told afterwards that my comrades, who found Hitler's words just as provocative as I did, had sighed with relief when I spoke. Hitler, however, had probably never experienced an interruption before when making a speech as head of state in this case, as supreme war leader into the bargain. The years when he had heard heckling at public meetings were long past. He obviously lost the thread of what he was saying and, with an icy glare in my direction, called out to me, Thank you, Field Marshal V. Manstein. Thereupon he brought his address to a somewhat abrupt conclusion. While I was taking tea with Zietzler, there was a telephone call to say that Hitler wished to see me in the presence of Geitel. Field Marshal, he told me when I went in, I cannot allow you to interrupt me when I am addressing the generals. You yourself would not tolerate such behavior from your own subordinates. Since there was no answer to this, I did not reply. Then Hitler, who was obviously extremely annoyed, made a mistake. By the way, he said, a few days ago you sent me a paper on the situation. I suppose your idea was to justify yourself to posterity in the war diary. This was really too much. Letters I write to you personally, I retorted, do not get filed in the war diary. You must excuse me if I use an English expression in this connection, but all I can say to your interpretation of my motives is that I am a gentleman. Silence. Hitler, after a short pause, thank you very much. At the evening conference, to which I was specially summoned, Hitler's manner towards me was again thoroughly amiable. He even consulted me on the possibility of defending the Crimea, on which General Janik, commander of 11th Army, had just been reporting. I knew, of course, that he would not forgive me for the retort I had made earlier. But I had much more important things to worry about than my personal relations with the Supreme Commander. During the month of February three sectors in particular were to be very much in the news. They may be distinguished by the names of Nikopol, Chikasi and Rovno. The loss of Nikopol with effect from 6 February, 6th Army reverted to Army Group A, on orders from Hitler. The reason he gave General Zietzler for this decision was a significant one. Hitler wanted to send two of 6th Army's divisions to the Crimea, which was even then a forlorn hope. He now explained that he was putting 6th Army under Army Group A because he would not get these divisions from Southern Army Group. In one way, the latter regarded the handover of 6th Army as a welcome relief, for we had quite enough worries in any case. However, it meant losing a reservoir of forces on which we should have been able to draw had we been free to pull the army out of the east of the Dnieper Bend and the Nikopol bridgehead in good time. But this was just what Hitler had prevented. Now the enemy was to force him to surrender the areas in question. On 31 January, heavy new enemy attacks had started against the northern front of 6th Army east of Krivoy Rog and against the Nikopol bridgehead from the south. The upshot was the penetration of the bridgehead. After three days fighting, the enemy also achieved a decisive breakthrough on the army's northern front, where, despite the fact that the number of divisions was only two, one in favor of the Soviets, 30 corps received a severe battering from 12 rifle divisions and two tank corps. Although there had been six infantry divisions in the line and two armored ones behind it, the former were so short of replacements and weapons that they really only amounted to battle groups, while the armored divisions had only five serviceable tanks left. Even with these brave troops, constant overstrain was bound to tell sooner or later. As Sixth Army was by now already removed from Southern Army Group's control, I cannot deal with the further course of the fighting in this sector. The fact is, at all events, that once the enemy had broken through 6th Army's northern front, the two corps fighting there, like the other two in the Nikopol bridgehead, were well nigh cut off. It was a development which the army group had predicted on numerous occasions. This time even Hitler had to agree to the abandonment of the east of the Dnieper Bend and the Nikopol bridgehead. 6th Army did in fact manage, after heavy fighting, to extricate its corps from the news but only at the cost of considerable losses in equipment. Had this bastion been given up at the proper time, 
it would not only have been possible to withdraw all the forces inside it in good order, but also to free divisions for the far more important northern wing of the army group. Instead, Sixth Army's formations had been expended in the wrong place operationally, and one doubted whether they could ultimately withstand the pressure of the pursuing enemy. The Chikasi pocket in the middle of the army group front, having dealt their successful counterblow against 40th Soviet Army in the east of the gap there, the mobile formations of 1st Panzer Army had passed on to their second leg in the western part. Immediately, our armored divisions left the first battleground. However, the enemy Hydra grew more heads. At the end of January, strong enemy forces, including several tank and mechanized corps, broke into the northwestern section of the projecting arc of front, which the inner wings of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies were still having to hold by the Dnieper upstream from Chikasi. His thrust took the enemy in between 7 and 42 core and as far south as the Zvnigrodkan area. Simultaneously, the enemy had attacked the 8th Army front facing east in the area southwest of Chukasi and broken through it with fresh forces of 4th Guards and 5th Guards tank armies. These succeeded in driving so far westwards that they were able to join hands with the enemy troops which had broken through 1st Panzer Army from the northwest towards Zvnigrodka. This meant that the salient described earlier was cut off, and with it 1st Panzer Army's 42 Corps and 8th Army's 11 Corps. Such was the situation which awaited me when I arrived back at Army Group headquarters on 28 January. Decisive measures were instantly taken to clear an escape route for the encircled corps. First Panzer Army received orders to end the battle against the forces of First Soviet Tank Army on its left wing as soon as possible and to release three Panzer Corps with the utmost speed. It was to be thrown over to the new crisis spot with 16 and 17 Panzer Divisions, the Lbstandarty and the Heavy Panzer Regiment PK, which had already distinguished itself in the battle mentioned above. One Panzer Division was to follow as soon as it could. Eighth Army was instructed to release HQ 47 Panzer Corps and 3 Panzer Division from its front and to form them up in the direction of the point of breakthrough. 24 Panzer Division was also ordered over from 6th Army to reinforce this group. When it arrived, however, Hitler ordered it to be returned to Army Group because the position in the Nikopol bridgehead was already turning critical. In fact it got the too late to do any good. The army group's orders were that the two Cal 1st Panzer armies from the west and 8th armies from the south were to attack the flank and rear of the enemy forces which had surrounded 42 and 11 corps. The number of divisions employed by the army group to get the two corps out was a relatively large one. It appeared necessary, however. In view of the fact that the enemy had crammed no less than 26 rifle divisions and between 7 and 9 tank or mechanized corps into this battleground from the northwest and east. The reason for their plurality, it is true, was that Soviet divisional strengths were also well down by now, except where fresher recently refitted formations were concerned. The task of our two assault groups was first to cut the rear communications of these numerous enemy formations and then to destroy them by concentric attacks. Unfortunately, their assembly was delayed, first by snow and then by the mud which followed. Once they could move off, however, they succeeded in getting to grips with and administering wholesale punishment to a substantial portion of the enemy forces which had isolated the Chikasi pocket. Between them, the two corps reported the capture of more than 700 tanks, over 600 anti-tank guns and about 150 field pieces, but only just over 2,000 prisoners. This indicated that the enemy forces had been largely made up of motorized formations. Eventually impenetrable mud or snow put an end to the advance. Three Panzer Corps spearhead had got within eight miles of the southwestern front of the pocket, while 47 Corps had probably drawn off a substantial proportion of the enemy forces. The Army Group Operations staff had gone to a man in our command train to supervise the cooperation of the two armies in this battle. The headquarters of 1st Panzer Army was at Oman itself and that of 8th Army was easily accessible from the same place. While in Oman I made two attempts to reach the fronts of both assault groups, but each time my car became hopelessly stuck in mud or snow. 
from one day to the next the weather vacillated between blizzards and thaws. Once again it was seen that the broad tracks of the Soviet tanks made them better than our own at moving over snow-covered ground or a saturated subsoil. As there was no further prospect of getting the armor right up to the pocket, I gave orders for the two encircled corps to break out to the southwest. In the meantime they had been crowded together from all sides by recurrent enemy attacks, and the space now left to them measured only about 30 miles from north to south and 10-12 miles from east to west. The Russians had already called on them to capitulate on 4 February. Under command of their commanding generals, Stemmerman and Lib, the two corps commenced their breakout during the night of 16th-17th th February. As they set off towards three Panzer Corps, it made one last effort to get at least a few tanks through the bottomless mud to meet them. The corps in the pocket had instructions from the army group to use their entire artillery and ammunition in support of the breakout. Being unable to move through deep mud across country devoid of roads, the batteries had to stay put after they had fired off their ammunition. Rearguards equipped with a small number of guns covered the breakout against the enemy now moving in from the northeast and south. It can be imagined with what mixed feelings of hope and anxiety we sat in our command train waiting to hear whether the breakout had succeeded. At 0125 hours on the morning of 17th February we received the gratifying news that the first contact had been established between the escaping troops and the spearheads of three Panzer Corps. The enemy in between them was literally overrun. By 28 February we knew that between 30,000 and 32,000 men would come out of the pocket. Considering the drop in the strength of the fronts and the fact that six divisions and one brigade had been surrounded, this figure must be taken to represent the bulk of the fighting troops. 31 most distressing factor was that the majority of the wounded could not be brought out. General Stemmerman was killed during the fighting. It had thus been possible to spare both corps the fates suffered by 6th Army at Stalingrad. In this case, too, Hitler had called for the pocket to be held, but in the end he had consented retrospectively to the breakout preparations ordered by the army group. The latter had then issued the order for the actual breakout without previously notifying Hitler in order to avoid any possibility of a countermand. Naturally, the bulk of the guns and heavy weapons had stuck fast in the mud on the way out, only a small number being extricated as a result of the almost superhuman efforts of the troops. The six and a half liberated divisions obviously had to be pulled out of the line for the time being. However, this loss of fighting power, though it further complicated the army group's position, was to a great extent counterbalanced by the joy of having saved at least the fighting men of the two corps. First Panzer and Eighth Armies still had the task of firmly reuniting their fronts and releasing armor for the mobile reserve as soon as possible. After I had visited units of the divisions which had participated in the breakout, my operations staff returned to Priskirov. This was rendered urgently necessary by the situation on the army group's left wing. Rovno for the reasons stated earlier, the army group had done everything in its power during the month of February to prevent the enemy from finally breaking through the center of its front. It had been able to forestall the threatened isolation of its right wing when the latter was still held fast in the Dnieper bend. Thereupon it had been faced with the necessity of fetching the two encircled corps out of the Chikasi pocket. Once this had been achieved, our attention inevitably became riveted on developments in the north of the army group area. By this time 4th Panzer Army was on a front facing northeast which actually ran fairly continuously from northeast of Vinitsa to the west of the small town of Shepetovka. The latter lies some 50 miles due north of Priskarov, where army group headquarters was located. At Shepetovka the army's continuous front came to an end. For a front some 150 miles in length there were at present only nine weakened but still battle-worthy divisions available under three corps commands five being infantry, two armoured and two panzer grenadiers. For the moment the pressure on the army front had relaxed, the enemy having presumably had to pause in his advance. Nevertheless, 
it was clear that 4th Panzer Army would hardly be able to hold out with the above forces against a far superior enemy. But there was also another danger with far graver implications for the position of the army group as a whole. In front of the western wing of 4th Panzer Army, extending right up to the southern boundary of Central Army Group in the north, there was now a wide open space practically devoid of German forces. From this area, sooner or later, the enemy was liable to launch a large-scale flanking movement against 4th Panzer Army, which would be synonymous with outflanking the whole of Southern Army Group. Even though the northern part of this vacuum the Pinsk Marshes was automatically excluded from any major operations, there was still an east-to-west bridge of land about 40 miles in breadth immediately above 4th Panzer Army's front. Through it ran the highway leading from Kiev to Rovnovysa to Mur and further westwards to land Lublin in the government general. In order to block this bridge of land, the army group had shifted 13 corps on to the extreme north wing. The latter was led with great dash by my former chief of staff at 38 Corps, General Horf, who was unfortunately killed at the head of his troops in March 1944. With the few forces at his disposal, Torf held up the enemy advance on either side of the highway through February and March, again and again evading the pincer movements of his far stronger opponent. Further north, already within the region of the Pinsk marshes, a group of police units was guarding the big railway from Kiev to Poland. Against such odds, of course, the solitary 13 Corps could do no more than delay the enemy advance. As early as the beginning of February the town of Rovno was lost, in consequence of which 13 Corps had to retire westwards towards Dubno. The Rye Commissioner for the Ukraine, Gorlita Koch, who resided in Rovno, had naturally lost no time in making himself scarce though not before enjoining the civil administrators and police forces under his jurisdiction to fight to the last. He was to decamp from East Prussia in exactly the same way later on. Hitler on the other hand, demanded the head of the general responsible for the loss of the town. According to Zietzler, even Key Eitel advocated the immediate shooting of the senior German commander there. When Zietzler energetically opposed this, averring that Hitler would in any case wish to hear his general's views, Goring put his oar in. Oh no, you don't, he said. Where would we be if that happened every time? Anyway, it isn't the job of a head of state. Quite apart from the fact that the affair was no concern whatever of Goring's, he was just about the last person with any right to damn others for alleged dereliction of duty. His utterance was one more example of his notorious hatred of the generals, and the army as a whole. Hitler did not, in fact, accept the recommendations of Key Eitel and Goring, but ordered a court of inquiry as a result of which sentence of death was passed not upon the officer originally accused, but on the divisional commander responsible for the Rovno area. This was subsequently quashed by Hitler, who accepted the appeals put up by myself and the army commander in view of the reasons which had led to the loss of Rovno. The mobile courts martial, which had power to pass summary judgment over the heads of local commanders, had still not been instituted in my day. But let us return to 4th Panzer Army. Even though, as I have said, there was no immediate threat to the army front, it was perfectly clear that that wide expanse of territory to the north, guarded as it was by a mere handful of forces, would shortly become the basis of an enemy offensive. This might be directed at Lau in the west or against 4th Panzer Army in the south in the form of an outflanking movement round its western wing. It will be recalled that in anticipation of this danger the army group had on a number of occasions called for the assembly of an army in the area of Rovno. No such assembly had taken place. The Supreme Command had neither released forces elsewhere for this purpose, that is by detaching them from Northern Army Group or evacuating the Crimea nor had it enabled Southern Army Group to do so by granting it freedom of movement on its southern wing. It goes without saying that on completion of the Chikasi battle the Army Group had drawn strong armoured forces from the centre of its front over to the left wing, where they were in position by 15th March. But as we emphasised to OKH, these forces would at best suffice to maintain a certain degree of stability on 4th Panzer Army's front in the event of another major attack. 
they would on no account be adequate to cope with the wide outflanking movement against the army's western wing. As the issue was as destined as ever to be settled on the northern wing, it was absolutely essential that the latter be provided with additional forces. For the present, however, nothing decisive was done by the supreme command in this respect. Clearly Hitler assumed the enemy's offensive power to be already exhausted. In addition, he was expecting the muddy season to set in shortly and put a stop to any large-scale activity on the part of the Soviets. It was true that the attack we had launched in mid-February to free the two corps from the Chukasi pocket had become bogged down as a result of the spells of mud with which the blizzards had been interspersed. Yet it was still too early to count on the actual muddy season to start. As for the hopefully awaited exhaustion of the enemy's offensive power, it was only permissible to consider this within the context of our own diminished formation strengths. For OKH's consideration, the Army Group submitted a series of figures which gave a graphic picture of the respective losses and replacements on both sides of the front. We had deduced from numerous prisoner of war interrogations that in the period from July 1943 to January 1944 the enemy formations facing our front must have received about 1,080,000 men as replacements. This figure could be taken to correspond with the losses suffered by the enemy in the same period. On the other hand, Southern Army Group's casualties in dead, wounded and missing during the same space of time had amounted to 405,409 men. The corresponding number of replacements in this case was 221,893. So although the enemy's formations had suffered far more heavily than our own and the combat value of his infantry in particular was declining at an ever-increasing rate, it was still evident from the figures in question that the ratio of forces had shifted very much to our disadvantage. The present position with armored formations was that the Soviet tank corps in the line possessed an average of 5,100 tanks each, except for one isolated case in which there were only 20, as against a planned establishment of 200 250. In contrast to this, the average number of tanks which our own armored divisions could send into action was at best just over 30. Only the armored divisions recently sent to the army group were in any better shape, but with others the position was even worse. In all, the enemy opposite our front had received approximately 2,700 new tanks during the period under review, whereas we and this included self-propelled assault guns had had only 872. In producing these figures, we took no account of the large number of reserve formations at the enemy's disposal. A characteristic picture is offered by the following breakdown of data supplied by the armies under our command. The may, of course, have been occasional duplication, specifically in the case of knocked out tanks. According to these returns, the enemy losses had been as follows one thing these figures show is the extraordinarily high scale of equipment enjoyed by the Red Army even at that stage. The time was past when it had been compelled to throw masses of men into battle. On the other hand, the figures revealed a striking discrepancy between the number of prisoners taken and the amount of material captured or destroyed. Either the Soviets had often been able to avoid capture by abandoning their heavy weapons, which could possibly indicate a deterioration of battle morale, or they must have been suffering exceptionally bloody losses. As for Hitler's own attitude in the light of the above figures regarding the future conduct of operations and the possibility of a perilous turn of events on the Army Group's northern wing, a telephone conversation I had with General Zietzler on 18 February proved most informative. In pointing out the danger which could be foreseen on our northern wing, I had drawn attention to the ratio of forces and mentioned that the figure in our own case was still unfavorable in comparison with the other army groups. I will now quote from a transcript of the conversation made by one of my staff officers, Zietzler, I've had another long talk to the Führer on that subject, as well as on the consequences involved, but got no change. Myself, how does he envisage our future operations, then? Zietzler, he says the Russians are bound to stop attacking some time. They have been attacking non-stop since last July and can't go on forever. So I said, mein Führer, if you were a Russian now, what would you do? Nothing at all, he said. 
Well, I told him, I should attack, and I should go for Lao. Hitler, however, obviously went on counting on exhaustion and the weather to put an end to the enemy's offensive operations. By May, as he had told me earlier, he would have new divisions at his disposal. Had he only put the personnel and equipment they required into our own battle-tested divisions, things might have turned out very differently. The day of reckoning in March 1944 it was time to foot the bill for the Supreme Command's cardinal error of never having been willing to give anything up, either in the East itself or some other theatre, for the sake of being stronger than the enemy at the decisive spot. What we had to pay for, first and foremost, was Germany's failure to stake absolutely everything on bringing about a showdown in the East in 1943 in order to achieve at least a stalemate or to exhaust the Russians' offensive power before a real second front emerged in the West. Then there was the mistake of having persisted to the very last in keeping the southern wing of the Eastern Front clamped down in bastions jutting far out to the East first in the Dunitz Basin and the Kuban, and then in the Dnieper Bend and the Crimea thereby offering the enemy every chance to cut these forces off. In doing so the Supreme Command had overlooked the fact that ultimately the issue would not be decided in the struggle for these bastions, but in the place from which the enemy could proceed to push the entire southern wing of German armies away towards the Black Sea or Romania. Ever since Citadel this decisive spot had been the northern wing of Southern Army Group. Now it was too late. The crucial year of 1943 had slipped by without the achievement of so much as a stalemate. Whether this could ever be accomplished now depended on the outcome of the invasion which would certainly come in 1944. But first the account had to be settled on the southern wing of the Eastern Front. Hitler now proved to have been premature, to say the least in voicing the hope at the end of February that the exhaustion of Soviet strength and the onset of the muddy season would halt the enemy offensive. It was perfectly true that, thanks to the spirit displayed by the German troops, the enemy's hard-won gains had cost him extraordinary sacrifices. It was also apparent that the quality of his infantry formations, into which he had relentlessly pressed all the able-bodied male inhabitants of reconquered territories, was steadily deteriorating. But the plain fact remained that he still had abundant formations of fresh arrested troops on which to draw. Even if the number of tanks in his tank and mechanized corps had fallen off in consequence of the high losses mentioned earlier, it was still many times greater than that of the German armored divisions. On the German side even a rigorous comb out of units in the rear areas had failed to make good the shortage of replacements. Already we had enlisted hundreds of thousands of indigenous volunteers in our B echelon units and supply columns. These men mainly Ukrainians and Caucasians did their duty with the utmost loyalty, preferring to fight in the German army, in spite of the policy pursued by the party authorities in the occupied territories, rather than to go back under Bolshevik domination. The muddy season, though interrupted by spells of frost, set in at the beginning of March. Initially, however, it affected us far more unfavorably than it did the Russians. It has already been remarked that the Soviet tanks were more mobile than ours in snow and mud, thanks to their wider tracks. At the same time, however, enormous numbers of American trucks made their appearance on the enemy side. As they were still able to drive over open country when our own were already tied to the few firm roads. The enemy was also able to move the infantry element of his tank and mechanized corps quickly. In addition, the worse the mud became, the more the lack of tractors was felt on the German side. Consequently our mobile formations could only be moved long distances at the cost of considerable delays, and tended to get the worst of the struggle against a more mobile opponent. Dot until such time as mud put a temporary stop to the enemy's offensive operations and also for the later period when the struggle could be resumed, the army group was faced with the necessity of preserving a strong northern wing. The enemy would, of course, also continue to attack army group A, that is 6th army, and our own 8th army. He had just as good a prospect as ever of smashing this wing, which was still echelon well out to the east, and of pushing it back against the Black Sea or at all events of winning the crossings over the Bug and later over the Dniester. 
Here lay the chance of recapturing Bessarabia and opening the route to Romania and the rest of the Balkans. The area, incidentally, which Roosevelt was so keen to cede to Uncle Joe. Dot nonetheless, the German side was still capable of effecting an elastic withdrawal on this wing and saving considerable forces from Sixth Army's front, which could be very much shortened in the process. It would still be possible either behind the Bug or the Lower Dniester, in any case, therefore, still forward of the old Romanian frontier, to bring the enemy to a definite standstill on a front adequately manned for a decisive defensive. So, when signs of fresh offensive preparations were noticed opposite the southern wing of 8th Army as early as 22 February, the Army Group asked that the Army should be given freedom to take evasive action. We were neither able nor inclined to supply this part of the front with forces which were far more urgently needed on the left wing of the Army Group. Eighth Army's ability to adopt elastic tactics depended, of course, on whether its southern neighbor, Sixth Army, which was Eckel and even further to the east, could cooperate in the movement we suggested. This was our reason for seeking OKH's prior agreement. Not surprisingly, Hitler would not give it. On the contrary, the army group was subsequently made to hand over more forces, 3 and 24 panzer divisions, to launch an attack in support of 6th army when a new setback ensued on its much too extended front. Operationally, however, far greater chances than those offered to the enemy by advancing along the Black Sea coast against army grouper would present themselves if he were to achieve a decisive success opposite the northern wing of southern army group. If by throwing in a maximum concentration of forces, he should manage perhaps even before the muddy season began to overrun the front of 4th Panzer Army, he would in the first place gain possession of the railway line which ran from Lao through Zmarinka into the southern Ukraine and was vital for the supply of the whole of the German southern wing. Subsequently, by continuing to advance southwards, the enemy would get into the deep flank and rear of the southern wing. Over and above this, it was certain that he would make use of the gap which had opened up between the northern wing of Southern Army Group and the southern wing of Central Army Group in order to assemble another powerful assault force. Its task would be to go round the Army Group's left wing or carry out the drive on Lao, which General Zietzler had foreshadowed to Hitler. The recent appearance of HQ-1 below Russian front in this area at the end of February provided an unmistakable pointer to such intentions. With its left wing outflanked in this way, the army group would inevitably be pushed away to the south, perhaps while still east of the Carpathians. Through Lao, on the other hand, the Soviets would be free to drive into Galicia or Poland proper. Any development of this nature had to be forestalled at all costs. As soon as the struggle to liberate the two corps surrounded near Chikasi was over and contact had been re established between the fronts of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies in this area, the Army Group had ordered a radical shift of forces to its left wing. In the sectors of 1st Panzer and 8th Armies HQ, 3 Panzer Corps was released with 1. 11 and 16 Panzer Divisions. They were to be followed as early as possible by 17 Panzer and the Artillery Division to an assembly area around Priskarov, behind 4th Panzer Army. Also transferred to the latter from the above named armies were 7 Panzer Division, the Lbstandarty and a battalion of heavy tanks, 305. 4th Panzer Army was to assemble these latter formations around Tarnopol under HQ-48 Panzer Corps. While 3 Panzer Corps task would be to foil an enemy breakthrough on the front north of Priskarov, 48 Panzer Corps was to prevent an envelopment of the western wing by way of Tarnopol. 3 Infantry Divisions granted by OKH-68, 357 and 359, were also moved into 4th Panzer Army's area. The disengagement of these divisions from the fronts of their parent armies naturally took time. On top of that, the state of the roads and transport no longer permitted any rapid moves. As a result, they could not reach their appointed destinations before the middle of March. At the beginning of that month, the Army Group also ordered its army areas to be extended over towards the left wing. The object here was to enable 4th Panzer Army to take charge of the area now acquiring special importance between Tarnopol and Dubno. The army handed over its present front, 
which ended at Shepetovka, to first Panzer Army and assumed command in the area from east of Tarnopol to Dubno. The only forces available there at the time, however, were 48 Panzer Corps, which was busy assembling around Tarnopol, 13 Corps, which was in action around Dubno, and a group of police units at Kovaldot First Panzer Army in turn surrendered its sector of front north of Amman to 8th Army. On orders from OKH, the Corps on the latter army's right wing went over to 6th Army. At the beginning of March, the army group moved its headquarters first to Kamenek Poldalsk and later to Lao, in order to be behind the vital left wing. We had instructions from Hitler not to enter Romanian territory, inside which our vantage point could have been behind the center of the army group front. It was still debatable whether the measures outlined above would suffice to intercept any enemy offensive launched before the muddy season set in. For the period which followed it, as the army group repeatedly emphasized to OKH, it would in any case be essential to bring forces with an equivalent strength of two armies comprising between 15 and 20 divisions, up to Lao. Only then could we prevent a large-scale outflanking of the army group's left wing, with all the consequences already described. It could be assumed, however, that the newly drafted forces of which Hitler had spoken, but of whose numbers the army group was told nothing, would be inadequate for this purpose. It was imperative to acquire forces by further shortening the fronts of both Northern Army Group and Sixth Army, as well as by evacuating the Crimea. It goes without saying that the freeing of forces within the Army Group's own area on the scale already indicated implied a big risk for Eighth and First Panzer Armies, since the enemy would continue to attack them, too, as long as the ground and weather gave him the least opportunity of doing so. His object in this case would be to break through in the direction of the middle bug and its crossings at Vinitsa and Voznesensk. With things as they now were, however, the army group had to choose between two evils. In terms of the overall situation, the lesser evil was undoubtedly that the enemy would come forward in the area of First Panzer Army's right wing and opposite 8th Army. The operational effects of such an advance could still be counteracted by withdrawing the neighboring 6th Army behind the Bug or at worst behind the Dniester. On the other hand, the operational consequences of a decisive enemy success against the army group's left wing would be irreparable. To prevent it, and at all costs to bar the Russians' way into the deep flank of Southern Army Group and Army Group Waterloo must now be Southern Army Group's operational aim until the muddy season became fully effective. The possibility that its right wing, and consequently the whole of Army Group A, might be forced to withdraw further westwards was a risk which it had to accept. The struggle continues. Despite the mute alt off the weather prevented our air reconnaissance from telling what movements or troop concentrations were taking place on the other side. The army group was able to assess the enemy's intentions as follows by the end of February the recently identified one below Russian front would assemble forces in the Rovno area to envelop the army group's western wing. One Ukrainian front was expected to attack the front facing north on both sides of Priskarov, now under command of 1st Panzer Army. Two Ukrainian front, we assumed, would renew its attacks on 8th Army and the right wing of 1st Panzer Army and, if it succeeded in crossing the bughead for Chsinowitz, Sonorty. Three and four Ukrainian fronts would continue their attempts to score a success against 6th Army and the right wing of 8th Army. On 3rd March, the assault broke loose against the army group's left wing in the area of 4th and 1st Panzer Armies. Superior enemy forces, including a tank corps, seized hold of 13 corps around Dubno and tried to envelop it. The main thrust, which was carried out by two tank armies plus 60th Soviet Army, was aimed at a breakthrough to the south across the line Priskarov down Nepal, the enemy's intention obviously being to cut the army group's most important communication line and provided that the weather still permitted to drive right through to the Dniester. Simultaneously 18th Soviet Army was attempting to force the right wing of 1st Panzer Army away to the southeast. The survey given below gives some idea of the relative strengths during this period, 
westward shift of army boundaries within army group at end of march resulted in the following transfers of forces when i visited the front line at shepetovka on 4th of march 59 core position there was already extremely serious the enemy had penetrated our fronts on either side of it and was preparing to entrap the core by means of enveloping attacks from east and west to eliminate this danger it had to be pulled back a maneuver which duly succeeded thanks to the firm, unflurried leadership of the commanding general, my erstwhile chief of staff, Schultz, and the intervention of one panzer division, which had just arrived on the scene. Nonetheless, the enemy maintained his efforts to encircle the corps by pursuing it towards Proskirov. Both of the panzer corps which had been brought up behind this wing of the army group now went into action. Three Panzer Corps was thrown to the northwest from Priskirov to smash the enemy advancing in the gap between 1st and 4th Panzer Armies. 48 Panzer Corps was directed to attack the enemy armor driving on Tarnopol. By 7th March the enemy had committed a total of 22 to 25 rifle divisions and 7 tank or mechanized corps in this sector. At the beginning of March the enemy also started an offensive against the left wing of 8th Army having within two weeks managed to replace the losses inflicted by our Panzer Corps in their thrust to free the Chikasi pocket. Hardly had we withdrawn the two Kal from that sector to bring them behind the left wing of the army group when he began his offensive in the direction of a man. Having staked no less than twenty rifle divisions on his breakthrough, he succeeded in smashing seven corps and by 9th March he was at the gates of the town. In the area of Army Group A, 6th Army, the enemy likewise resumed his offensive and achieved a breakthrough towards Nikolaev at the mouth of the bug. In a situation report to OKH on 7th March the Army Group had stated that it had no alternative but to fight on as best it could until mud put a stop to the enemy's operations. At the same time, However, it had emphasized the decisive importance of having sufficient forces available in the Tarnopol Lucklau area at the end of the muddy season to prevent a breakthrough towards the last named town or to drive into the enemy's flank if he should try to advance southwards from Tarnopol. The army group's prime consideration just now, therefore, must be to fight for time and to do its utmost, even at the cost of giving up further ground to keep its formations in fighting trim until the mud forced the enemy to call off his attacks. Unfortunately a great deal of time was to elapse before then. At this stage of operations Hitler thought he had found a new means of bringing the enemy's advance to a standstill. Henceforth places which had acquired tactical significance as nodal points of road or rail traffic were to be declared strongholds. Each was allotted an ad hoc commander, or camp commandant, who was in honor bound to defend the locality in question and answered for it with his head. The armies in whose sectors Hitler had personally selected such strongholds were responsible for stocking them up at early date and providing adequate garrisons. Hitler assumed that by blocking important roads or diverting Soviet forces, these places would serve to delay the advance. In fact it was clear from the outset that they would achieve no such thing. In practice they required more troops to defend them than was worth devoting to their attention. Since strongholds without proper fortifications or adequate garrisons must inevitably fall to the enemy sooner or later without fulfilling their intended purpose. The army group in every case but one contrived to get them abandoned before they were hopelessly surrounded. The exception was Tarnopol, where in the end only remnants of the garrison were able to break out. Later in 1944 this method of Hitler's led to considerable losses. In line with its policy of fighting for time and preserving the armies from encirclement, the army group on NTH March had to order 8th Army to move back after the enemy had broken through the front on its left wing. Two days later, for the same reason, the right wing of 1st Panzer Army was withdrawn behind the bug dot on its left wing. 1st Panzer Army had to go on fighting in the Proskirov area so as to restore contact with 4th Panzer Army and relieve the pressure on its right wing. 4th Panzer Army's task was to prevent the enemy arm east of Tarnopol from breaking through to the Dniester in the south and forcing 1st Panzer Army away to the southeast. At the same time, by throwing in the OKH divisions mentioned earlier, 
it was to clear the lines of communication from Lao via Tarnopol to Proskirov. From now on, however, things moved increasingly fast. By 15 March, the enemy succeeded in almost completely destroying the left wing of 8th Army, causing a broad gap to appear between Arman and 1st Panzer Army at Vinitsa. Continuing his southwesterly advance, he was able to get the leading elements of five armies, including an armored one, across the Bugin 8th Army's area. While the latter threw over all detachable forces from its right to its left wing to attack the enemy now across the river, it was clear that they could only impede him on a purely local basis and had no hope of gaining the bug as a defense line over a sector of this breadth or of restoring contact with 1st Panzer Army. On the contrary, the strong enemy forces now crossing the river would be in a position to push 8th Army off to the south and get to the Dniester before it dot on 1st Panzer Army's right wing, too, the enemy had achieved a breakthrough which took him to the bug south of Vinitsa. Although Hitler immediately proclaimed the town a stronghold, there was never any question of its being able to put up a protracted defense, since this would have called for at least three divisions. And where were they to be found? On the army's left wing, west of Priskarov, there were indications of an enemy envelopment by 3rd Guards Tank Army, which had three tank corps under command. In 4th Panzer Army's sector, a successful attack by the infantry divisions supplied by OKH made it possible to restore the situation in the Tarnopol area for the time being. In contrast to this, 13 Corps was threatened with encirclement as it retired in the direction of Brody. It was plain from the overall picture that there was no further possibility of regaining and holding the bug on the army group's right wing. As early as 16 March it emerged that the enemy forces which had crossed the river were heading west with a tank army towards the nearest Dniester crossings. Three other armies, one of them armored, were turning south against the northern flank of 8th Army. At the same time both wings of 1st Panzer Army were in danger of being enveloped. Despite the success at Tarnopol it was doubtful whether 4th Panzer Army could in the long run prevent the enemy from advancing on Lao or turning off to the south. Such was the tense situation prevailing when I was summoned to the Ober Salzburg. A few days previously Hitler's military assistant, General Schmunt, had been out to see me to obtain my signature to a rather curious document. This was by way of being a declaration of loyalty to Hitler by all field marshals in view of the propaganda disseminated by V. Seidlitz, the general taken prisoner at Stalingrad. The idea had probably come from Schmund himself, who thought it might strengthen Hitler's trust in the army. Since every field marshal but myself had already signed, significantly enough Schmund had included model among the signatories, although his rank at the time was still Colonel General. I had no choice but to follow suit. Refusal to do so would have implied that I sympathized with Seidlitz's activities. All the same, I told Schmunt that I considered the declaration quite unnecessary from a soldier's point of view, as it was perfectly obvious that German troops would pay no attention to the propaganda of the Free Germany Committee. I might mention in this connection that leaflets dropped over the Chikasi pocket earlier on had completely failed to achieve their purpose as, of course, had a letter from Seidlitz to General Lubb, the man in command there. About the same time another letter which gave every impression of being genuine had found its way onto my own desk. It had been handed in to us after being picked up by a Ukrainian partisan. 31 on 19 March the document I mentioned above was ceremoniously handed over to Hitler by Field Marshal V. Rundstedt in the presence of numerous senior members of the three armed services. Hitler appeared deeply moved by the occasion. Yet how little it really accorded with the soldier's code of values. In view of Hitler's negative response to all my recommendations in the past and his persistent refusals to recognize irrevocable necessities, this call for a demonstration of loyalty makes it pertinent to ask why I still remained at my post. As regards the more general implications of this question, I can only say that it was not granted to me, as one, who had for several years past been engrossed in arduous duties at the front to perceive Hitler's true nature, or the moral deterioration of the regime, to the extent to which we can obviously do today. Rumors of the kind that circulated at home hardly penetrated to the front, 
perhaps least of all to ourselves. The anxieties and problems which the fighting brought us left little time for reflection on matters of wider interest. In this respect our position was entirely different from that of soldiers or politicians in Germany or occupied territories where no fighting was taking place. In the military sphere, however, I could not overlook the faults of Hitler's leadership. My grounds for not believing it possible to remove him by violent means in wartime have already been stated. As for the reasons which impelled me to remain at my post, I often used to wish that I could leave it. On many an occasion, when Hitler refused to accept my recommendations or tried to meddle in the affairs of my headquarters, I had told the chief of the general staff that he, Hitler, had better find someone else to take over Southern Army Group. But apart from the pleas of my immediate staff, what always dissuaded me from resigning my command was not the desire so often advanced as a motive in such cases to prevent worse things from happening. It was rather the conviction that no other headquarters but ours would be capable of mastering the tasks which confronted a commander in our decisive sector of the front. My departure would have meant more than a change in the person of the army group commander. Something told me that I had no right to leave my troops in the lurch. Unless, of course, some impending disaster compelled me to tender my resignation as a last resort in order to force Hitler's hand. This very contingency was shortly to arise in connection with the fate of First Panzer Army. The meeting on the Oberst Salzburg afforded me an opportunity to make the following proposals to Hitler by reason of the ever increasing gravity of the situation i. immediate withdrawal of Sixth Army behind the Dniester. This formation was still situated in a salient extending well east of the lower bug and requiring far too many forces. The commander of Army Group A. Field Marshal V. Klest, had himself recommended the same action. 2. Rapid northward switch of the strong forces thus released by 6th Army into the area between the Dniester and Pruth, which formed the old Romanian frontier, in order to prevent 8th Army from being forced away from the Dniester to the southeast. 3. A clear decision laying down that the task of covering Romania, either on the Dniester or the Pruth, should henceforth devolve on army group in conjunction with Romanian forces. 4. Quick assistance for southern army group's northern wing to prevent the enemy from forcing it back into the Carpathians or driving through to LWOW. This solution, I added, would initially mean putting up with a gap between army group and southern army group if a strong front were to be formed north of the Carpathians. Should the enemy later attempt to get through this gap to the Balkans by way of Hungary, we should be able to thrust into his rear from the north as soon as we received the reinforcements which Hitler had promised to let us have in May. Hitler, however, declined to consider any such far reaching conceptions. He directed that Army Grouper should remain on the bug and announced only small scale assistance for the Southern Army Group's northern wing. In a detailed appreciation of the situation sent to General Zietziller on 22nd March, I repeated the above proposals, basing them on both the state of the fighting troops and the fact that the existing situation no longer allowed us to close the front between 8th and 1st Panzer Armies. It was of the utmost importance, I said that Army Group A, which must now take 8th Army under command should cover Romania while Southern Army Group prevented an enemy advance westwards in the area north of the Carpathians. To this end it was essential that 4th Panzer Army should be able to hold its present positions, which meant that it must at all costs be reinforced. 1st Panzer Army's main commitment must be to link up with 4th Panzer Army again and prevent itself from being pushed away to the south. The Carpathian passes between the two army groups could be held by Hungarian forces. The Hungarians, who had been more or less coerced into the war, still had their eyes on Siebenbergen, which they had lost to Romania in 1918. Our Romanian and Hungarian allies were known to view each other with such mistrust that they were holding crack troops ready in their respective countries to use against one another if the need arose. After the defeats on the Don in winter 1942-3 the two Romanian armies, and later the Hungarian army, had been taken out of the front. However, Marshal Antonsky had again made forces available for coastal defense on the Sea of Azov. 
He also allowed the Romanian formations forming part of 17th Army to remain in the Cuban bridgehead and later in the Crimea. Now he was providing new armies for the defense of Romania as part of Army Group A. After the withdrawal of their army from the battlefront, the Hungarians had left only a few divisions behind in the Ukraine. It was expressly laid down that these should not become involved in any fighting with the Soviets, so that whenever the front line drew closer we had to pull them back in good time. Their duties were confined to guarding roads and railways against partisans in the communications zones. Now the situation was becoming critical for Hungary, too, and to defend the Carpathians and the area up to the Dniester we had to have the services of the intact army she had on home territory. At the same time, however, the attitude of her government had become dubious and on 15th March General Lindman came down from OKH with instructions for the swift disarmament of the Hungarian forces behind our front in the event of Hungary's defection. Fortunately we were spared the necessity of carrying out such a task. Following Horthy's visit to the Obra Salzburg, 1st Hungarian Army was placed under our command on 23rd March. Each of its two corps comprised one motorized and four infantry divisions but all of them had first to mobilize. Apart from this, the scale and quality of the Hungarians' weapons did not meet the requirements of warfare against Soviet armored units. Nonetheless, these forces could be expected to hold their own against the Soviets in the Carpathians, as we felt that the Russians would only be able to put their armor to very limited use in the mountainous terrain. We were reinforced in this belief by the recollection of how bravely the Honved had defended the Carpathian passes against the Russians in World War I. Everything would depend, of course, on energetic leadership on the Hungarian side. In this connection we were not encouraged by a visit paid to us on 28 March by General Lakatos, who, as far as I remember, was then Chief of Staff or Minister for War, and the Commander of 1st Hungarian Army. All these two men did in response to our demands was to plead the unpreparedness of their troops, in March 1944, of all times, and their shortage of anti-tank weapons. We could not escape the impression that certain highly placed circles in the Hungarian army were not disposed to defend the frontiers of their homeland with any real vigor. What could they possibly be expecting of the Russians? It had already been clear from the evening situation report sent through to me at the Ober Salzburg on 19 March that the situation of Southern Army Group had taken a further turn for the worse. It appeared that 8th Army, in spite of having thrown all available armor onto its left wing, would no longer be able to prevent the latter from being outflanked to the west and forced away in a southerly direction. Since Hitler would not agree to the solution we had suggested, that is that of throwing forces over to this spot from 6th Army simultaneously with a withdrawal of the latter, all we could do was to try to persuade Marshal Antonsko to place forces at our disposal even at this early stage in order to prolong 8th Army's front to the northwest. In point of fact the Marshal had only envisaged using them to defend the Pruth. Apart from this aggravation of 8th Army's position, an even more ominous development occurred on the army group's northern wing. Up here, having been unable to maintain its right wing on the bug, 1st Panzer Army now held a front facing northeast and extending roughly from the Dniester, northwest of Mogilev Podolsk, to the Zbruchs, which formed the frontier with Poland. Further west, as has already been noted, 4th Panzer Army had temporarily restored the situation east of Tanapol by a counter-attack with some newly arrived divisions. On 20th March, however, after committing two tank armies, 1st and 4th, for this purpose, the enemy had achieved a breakthrough on both sides of the entire army boundary and headed southwards in the direction of the Upper Dniester. On 23rd March the spearheads of 1st and 4th tank armies were already approaching the Dniester crossings north of Chsenowitz and south of Kamenek Bodolsk. This put the enemy squarely across 1st Panzer Army's lines of communication. The moment the danger became apparent, the army group had ordered 1st Panzer Army to take its front back onto a shortened line in order to acquire forces with which to fight its rear free. 
the army had also been given control of a group from 4th Panzer Army commanded by General Maus which had continued to stand like a solitary pillar in the rear of 1st Panzer Army after everything else in that area had been driven away by the two enemy armies. The task of General Maus's force was to halt the main body of the enemy behind the armored spearheads thereby cutting the latter off from their supplies. Obviously these measures could not restore the situation on the army group's northern wing. Although, for the moment, the enemy had nothing but armor straddling the communications deep in 1st Panzer Army's rear, as a result of which its headquarters had already arranged for an airlift, there was every indication that the army would shortly be surrounded in the fullest sense of the word. If a front of any durability was still to be established north of the Carpathians, it was imperative that 1st Panzer Army be extricated forthwith. On 23 March, the army group had asked OKH for the speedy provision of forces to free 1st Panzer Army's rear communications. These, we considered, could be released from Hungary, which had meanwhile been occupied. On 24 March we received an answer to the effect that 1st Panzer Army was not only to hold its present extended front but also to prolong it as far as Tarnopol in the west, as well as to clear its communications zone of the enemy. Thereupon the army group reported at noon the same day that it would order 1st Panzer Army to break out to the west if it did not receive a directive appropriate to its earlier request by 1500 hours. At 1600 hours we received the Solomon like reply that the Fuhrer agreed to the fundamental idea of 1st Panzer Army's clearing its communications to the west but still insisted that it should mainly continue to hold the present front between the Dniester and Tarnopol. Where the army was to find the forces to drive west and clear its communications zone of the enemy was quite beyond us. It was exactly the same as at Stalingrad in December 1942, when Hitler had likewise been ready to let 6th Army attempt to break out in the direction of 4th Panzer Army. In that case, too, he had demanded the simultaneous retention of the city which simply meant that 6th Army could not assemble any forces for a breakout. When I rang up General Zietzilla to point out once again how utterly impossible Hitler's demand was, he replied that the latter just did not grasp the full gravity of the situation. Nevertheless, I still received a summons late that evening to report to General Headquarters the following day. Concurrently with this controversy, another was going on between myself and the commander of 1st Panzer Army. Colonel General Hube. 32 While Hube agreed with us that 1st Panzer Army's situation had become untenable and that it must without fail evade the encirclement which now threatened it, he did not want it to break through to the west but to be taken back southwards over the Dniester. This was certainly the easier course at that particular moment. If the army took the western route it would have to fight its way to freedom against two Soviet tank armies, whereas it presented could escape across the Dniester without becoming involved in any really serious fighting. I still could not accept Colonel General Hube's view, however. First of all, it was indispensable that 1st Panzer Army should re-establish contact with 4th Panzer Army in the west. How else could the enemy be prevented from breaking through to Galicia north of the Carpathians? The best that could happen if the army took the southern route was that it would finish up being forced away into mountains. Yet even this was uncertain. Superficially, the way across the Dniester looked the less hazardous of the two. But closer examination showed that it would lead to disaster. The army possessed no bridging materials for crossing the river on a broad front. Any attempt to cross by the few secure bridges now in existence would expose it to attack from the enemy air force and cause the loss of most of the heavy equipment. Worst of all, the enemy was already advancing from the east south of the Dniester, and sooner or later First Panzer Army must become sandwiched between the latter and the two tank armies which, having just cut its rear communications, were now preparing to cross the river behind it. I therefore made it quite clear to General Hube that the army group would not permit his army to retire towards the south bank of the Dniester but would order a breakthrough to the west. Even before I flew to the Ober Salzburg, he was given a warning order to link up initially with the group of German forces on the Sbruchs by a thrust to the west. Having taken off from Allau early on the morning of 25 March, 
I reached the Berghof in time for the midday conference. In describing first Panzer Army's situation to Hitler, I emphasized that its eastern and northern fronts were under strong enemy pressure, to which the long overtaxed divisions, particularly in view of the inadequacy of the airlift, would not be equal in the long run. In the deep western flank of the army, I added, the enemy was across its rear communications, with the spearheads of one tank army already making for the south bank of the Dniester and those of another aiming southeast at Kamenek Podolsky in the army's rear. South of the river, too, the enemy was advancing from the east to bar the Dniester in the army's rear. In this situation, I said, there was no alternative but to strike through to the west with the army's tank formations, clear its supple lines and restore contact with 4th Panzer Army. By such tactics it might even be possible to paralyze the supplies of the two enemy armies operating in 1st Panzer Army's rear. This westward thrust must obviously be covered off to the east and northeast by the army's remaining forces. Although they would not be able to do so on their present extended fronts, the army's southern wing must still remain resting on the Dniester. On no account, I said, could I agree to General Hube's proposal to take his army onto the southern bank of the Dniester? First, because operations made it necessary to concentrate 1st and 4th Panzer armies north of the Carpathians. Secondly, because any withdrawal to the south of the river would probably result in 1st Panzer armies being encircled all over again and ultimately annihilated. The success of the proposed breakthrough, I added, would depend on a simultaneous drive by 4th Panzer Army from the west. For this reason the latter must be reinforced immediately. Hitler replied that he was unable to release any forces for this purpose. As long as he had to expect an invasion in Western Europe, he said, no formations must be taken away from that theatre. In similar vein he contended that our divisions in Hungary were indispensable there for political reasons. Furthermore, he still refused to acknowledge that a breakthrough by 1st Panzer Army to the west inevitably necessitated a corresponding withdrawal of its front in the east. A sharp exchange took place between Hitler and myself when he tried to hold me responsible for the unfavorable position in which Southern Army Group had landed. Some days previously I had gathered from General Zietzler that Hitler had accused the Army Group of having frittered away the numerous forces supplied to it over a period of months. I had asked Zietzilla to tell Hitler from me that the army group had had no other choice but to commit these divisions in driblets, as they had only been given to us sporadically and in most cases too late. Had Hitler ever held out any prospect of our getting the strong forces we had so often demanded for our northern wing, even if only for some date in the future or else granted us operational freedom on our southern wing, he would have had nothing to complain about today. Zietzler had entirely agreed with me. Indeed, this very factor had done more than anything else to influence the trend of events since Citadel. Now Hitler asserted that all we, that is the army group, were ever interested in doing was playing at grand tactics. 33, last autumn, he said, he had been told that the Dnieper would be held. Hardly had he given his reluctant approval for us to retire behind that river when the need for a further withdrawal had been announced on account of a breakthrough at Kiev. I retorted that things had been bound to turn out that way. He was the person who had detained our forces on the southern wing to hold the Dunitz and Dnieper areas instead of letting us strengthen our northern wing. Next, Hitler declared that according to the Luftwaffe, there were very few enemy tanks to be seen but that whole German units were running away from them, thereby causing the front to be constantly pulled back. As the only Luftwaffe reports Hitler received came from its high command, I assumed that Göring had once again been giving vent to his hatred for the army. I replied with some asperity that if the fighting troops could no longer hold out in some places, this must be attributed to constant overstrain physical exhaustion and the extent to which unit strengths had dwindled away. If ever proof were needed that over leniency was not one of our failings, it could be found in the number of senior commanders we had replaced. All of these men, I emphasized, were actually brave and experienced soldiers, but not one had been able to check the decline in the troops' powers of resistance. 
The fact that the two newly drafted divisions sent to 4th Panzer Army had now been overrun by enemy tanks was the result of inadequate training and deficient battle experience. This was another aspect which we had covered often enough in our reports. As there was nothing to be gained from all this wrangling, I sought to clinch matters by stating that I assumed we agreed on the need for First Panzer Army to concentrate its armor and break through to the West for the purpose both of regaining contact with Fourth Panzer Army and of freeing its own communications at the rear. I also assumed, I said, that the balance of the Army's forces would be covering the operation to the north and east though on what line they could do so would be seen later. The order to 1st Panzer Army, I insisted, must be issued by me that very same day. I reiterated that no success could be expected unless 4th Panzer Army were put in a position to drive towards 1st Panzer Army from the west. Hitler, however, again rejected this demand and ordered a resumption of the talks at the evening conference. Despite the sharpness of our disagreements, by the way, he had maintained the normal courtesies throughout. After leaving the familiar conference room with its glorious outlook towards Salzburg, I sent a message into General Schmunt that I should like to speak to him outside. I asked him to inform Hitler that I considered it futile to remain in command of the army group unless he accepted my recommendations. If he could not see his way to approving my actions, I said, I wished the command of Southern Army Group to be entrusted to somebody else. That afternoon a telephone call from my Chief of Staff, General Buss, was put through to my quarters in Birchtsgaden. He informed me that General Hube had again made an urgent request for permission to head south across the Dniester instead of breaking through to the west. In the evening I was sent a further signal from the army describing the western breakthrough as impracticable and insisting that the correct solution was to head southwards. General Buss, who had already sent a negative reply to the first request, now asked for my final decision. I directed that the breakthrough be carried out as ordered. When I appeared at the evening conference Hitler's mood had completely changed. His opening words were approximately these. I have been thinking the matter over again and agree with your plan to make 1st Panzer Army fight its way through to the west. I have also decided, with great reluctance to provide an SS Panzer Corps of 9 and 10 SS Panzer divisions which we have just set up in the west, plus 100 light and 367 infantry division. For 4th Panzer Army's proposed assault group. I reported that I had meanwhile turned down a fresh request from General Hube to break out to the south and had insisted that his army must drive west. I said I thought the thrust would succeed because the two enemy tank armies appeared to be scattering their forces in the direction of the Dniester crossings. After this, my operations officer, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Butger, Read out the text of my operation order to 1st Panzer Army. In view of the unexpected change in Hitler's attitude, I followed up with one or two ideas of my own on the future conduct of operations. Southern Army Group's task, I said, must be to erect a stable front between the Carpathians and the Pripyat marshes, and in this connection we had ordered 1st Hungarian Army to assemble in the area of Stridge to guard the hilly country between the mountain range and the upper Dniester. 8th Army, I went on, must henceforth be under command of Army Group A, to whose lot it would fall to protect Romania. As for the gap between the two Army Groups, this was something we must provisionally accept. It could be sealed off at the Carpathian passes by the forces still in Hungary. I then made the suggestion that a unified command should be constituted to cover all forces on the southern wing, including the Allied armies. Having regard to the defense of Romania, I felt it might be advisable to bring in Marshal Antonescu in conjunction with a German chief of staff. Hitler, however, did not take this up merely expressing the opinion that the marshal would refuse for political reasons. Following this talk, which, in contrast to that held at midday, had proceeded most harmoniously, Hitler came out with us into the anteroom to inquire whether there was a meal laid on for us. With every sign of satisfaction he read me a Turkish press comment that Germany had not acted a moment too soon in Hungary, where, it said, Things had gone much further than most people supposed. Early on 26th March, I flew back to the Army Group. 
8th Army had meanwhile passed under command of Army Group A. The next day I visited 4th Panzer Army to discuss the thrust it would be delivering towards 1st Panzer Army with the new forces promised by Hitler. General Raus was confident that he would make contact with the other army, although he was not entirely happy about things on his own front. Darnapol, having previously been declared a stronghold by Hitler, was surrounded. On the left wing of the army a similar fate threatened 13 corps at Brody, but this it managed to elude. Dot now that Hitler had given in to our demands, however, we could confidently expect to get 1st Panzer Army out and concentrate it with 4th Panzer Army north of the Carpathians. But although my success at the Obas Salzburg talks on 25th March guaranteed the survival of 1st Panzer Army, it soon emerged that the pressure I had exerted on Hitler on that occasion had tired him of working with me any longer. The same applied in the case of Field Marshal V. Klest, who arrived at the Obas Salzburg two days after me to get some definite action taken about withdrawing his army group to the Lower Dniester. On the morning of 30th March I was awakened with the startling news that Hitler's Condor aircraft, which had already picked up V. Klest from his headquarters, would shortly land in Lau to take the pair of us to the Oba Salzburg. While I, Schultz Butker and my ADC, Stahlberg, were awaiting its arrival on Lau airfield, my chief of staff talked to Zietzler on the telephone. The latter revealed that Hitler as we had already guessed was going to relieve both Klist and myself of our commands. On reaching Birchtsgaden, we first had a talk with General Zietzler, as Hitler did not wish to see us until just before the evening conference. Zietzler told us that after the last Ober Salzburg talks, Goring and Himmler, and probably also Key Eitel, had again started agitating against me in particular. This, he thought, had probably contributed towards Hitler's decision to part company with Klist and myself. When Hitler had informed him of his intention, he, Zietzler, had instantly tendered his resignation on the grounds that he had always fully agreed with me and could not remain in office if I went. His request, though repeated in writing, had met with a curt refusal. This upright attitude of Zietzler's did him great credit. In describing my last meeting with Hitler, I proposed to quote an entry I made in my diary the following day, while my memory was still fresh. Saw the Fuhrer in the evening. After handing me the swords to my knight's cross, he announced that he had decided to place the army group in other hands, models, as the time for grand style operations in the east, for which I had been particularly qualified, was now past. All that counted now, he said, was to cling stubbornly to what we held. This new type of leadership must be inaugurated under a new name and a new symbol. Hence the change in the command of the army group whose name he also intended to alter. Dot he expressly wished to state that there was not the least question of a crisis of confidence between us, as had previously been the case with other field marshals, whose names he mentioned. He still had the utmost faith in me, indeed, far from ever having had any criticism of the way the army group was led, he had always been in complete agreement with it. At the same time, however, he realized that the army group had had an excessive burden of responsibility to bear for a period of one and a half years and that it now appeared in need of a rest. He knew me to be one of his most capable commanders and for this reason intended to give me another appointment before long. At the moment, however, there was no further scope for me in the east. For the tasks now pending the he considered model, who had stopped a difficult retreat in northern army group, to be especially suitable. After once again assuring me that there was no crisis of confidence between us, the Fuhrer added that he would never forget that prior to the Western campaign I had been the only man to advise him of the possibility of deciding the whole issue in the West by a breakthrough at Sedan. In reply, I told the Fuhrer that I naturally could not object if he thought he would be able to work better with another army group commander in the present situation. Furthermore, I did not think any great harm would be done by my handing over to model now, as the decisions regarding the release of 1st Panzer Army had already been taken partly by Hitler's decision to bring over the SS Panzer Corps from the west and partly by my order to the army to fight its way out north of the Dniester. By and large, I said, 
This largely concluded what the army group had to do at the moment. Its only remaining commitment was to assist the fighting troops and give them moral support. That model would certainly be able to do. The Fuhrer emphatically agreed that model was a particularly suitable choice in this respect, as he would dash round the divisions and get the very utmost out of the troops. To this I retorted that the army group's divisions had long been giving of their best under my command and that no one else could get them to give anything more. Whatever one may think of Hitler's various remarks to me at what was destined to be our last meeting, he had at any rate chosen to conduct it on decent lines. This was due at least in part to Zietzler's insistence that Hitler owed it to Clist and myself to inform us in person of his motives for relieving us of our commands. That Goring and Himmler had long been working for my removal I was well aware. Yet the main reason for Hitler's decision was probably the fact that he had had to give in to me on 25th March when he had already rejected my proposals in front of a large audience. As he shook hands with me before I left, I said, I trust, mein Führer, that the step you have taken today will not have any untoward effects. After me, Field Marshal V. List was dismissed in similar fashion. As we left the Berghof, our successors were already waiting at the door. Colonel General Model, who was to take over Southern Army Group, now redesignated North Ukrainian Army Group, and General Skorner, who was to replace V. List. The next morning I flew back to Lao in my JU 52. My successor was grounded in Krakow by a snowstorm as a result of which I was able to issue a last army group order ensuring the cooperation of our two Panzer armies in the breakthrough operation which had now started. On the afternoon of that day I visited 4th Panzer Army to discuss the employment of the SS Panzer Corps with the army commander and also to say goodbye. My farewells to the other army commanders had to be said in writing. On the afternoon of 2nd April I handed over to my successor, who had meanwhile arrived in Lao. As far as anyone could judge, the measures to extricate 1st Panzer Army and to bring about the concentration of both armies so decisive for the overall situation between the Carpathians and the Pripyat marshes were guaranteed, even if they were still to involve some bitter fighting. On 5th April 4th Panzer Army duly began its thrust to the east, and by 9th April 1st Panzer Army was freed. I still had to take leave of my staff and was not alone in finding the parting a hard one. These comrades in arms had accompanied me through the victorious Crimean battles, they had lived to see the eventual success of that arduous winter campaign of 1942-3, and they had stood beside me throughout the critical months of 1943 and 1944 it was deeply gratifying to know how close our mutual trust had grown in those years and what genuine sorrow they felt now that our work together was finished. I feel entitled to say the same of the army commanders who had served under me. My staff were thunderstruck by my dismissal. My closest collaborators, the chief of staff, the chief of operations, the assistant quartermaster general, and the assistant adjutant general, all put in for postings. Their requests were duly granted, though General Bus had to stay on for some time to preserve the continuity. As far as I personally was concerned, my removal was a release from responsibility which it had become increasingly difficult to bear under the conditions which I have described. What had weighed most heavily of all on my staff and myself to say nothing of the commanders and staffs of our subordinate armies was the perpetual struggle we had had to wage with the Supreme Command to get operational necessities recognized. Our repeated demands for the establishment of a clear focal point of effort at the decisive spot in this campaign that is on the northern wing of the army group, and for operational freedom of movement in general, more particularly for our southern wing, were merely outward manifestations of the struggle. The basic issue was between two incompatible conceptions of strategy and grand tactics, I, Hitler's, which rose from the personal characteristics and opinions which have already been fully discussed in the chapter dealing with him as a supreme commander, and two, that of Southern Army Group Headquarters, which was based on the traditional principles and outlook of the German General Staff. On one side we had the conceptions of a dictator who believed in the power of his will not only to nail down his armies wherever they might be but even to hold the enemy at bay. 
The same dictator, however, who fought shy of risks because of their inherent threat to his prestige and who, for all his talent, lacked the groundwork of real military ability. On the other side stood the views of military leaders who by virtue of their education and training still firmly believed that warfare was an art in which clarity of appreciation and boldness of decision constituted the essential elements. An art which could find success only in mobile operations, because it was only in these that the superiority of German leadership and German fighting troops could attain full effect. It is only fair to add, however, that recourse to the kind of operations which the army group had in mind would have compelled Hitler to accept considerable risks in other theatres of war and other sectors of the Eastern Front, as well as serious drawbacks in the political and economic spheres. Nonetheless, it would probably have been the only way to exhaust the Soviet Union's offensive power in 1943, and thus to pave the way to a political stalemate in the East. Even if the army group was largely unsuccessful in its struggle for a different operational policy, and therefore deceived in its belief that it could master the enemy, it still had one achievement to its credit. The enemy had not succeeded in encircling the whole southern wing which the operational situation and his tremendous superiority offered him every prospect of doing. Southern Army Group, though bleeding from a thousand wounds, had maintained itself in the field. The greatest satisfaction of all for my staff and myself was that in this unequal struggle with a far superior opponent, as indeed with a supreme command which would not recognize what was clearly foreseeable, we had still been able to prevent any forces under our command from suffering the fate of Stalingrad. At Chukasi, and now with 1st Panzer Army, it was still possible to deprive the enemy of the prey which he believed to have safely in his grasp. What made it hard for me to hand over my command was solely the fact that I could no longer be of assistance to the troops who had always trusted in the army group's leadership. I left our headquarters in Laos on 3rd of April 1944. All my faithful comrades had come to the station to see me off. The train had already begun moving when someone called out to me. It was my personal pilot, Lieutenant Langer the man who had flown me safely through every imaginable kind of weather. Now he had volunteered for the fighter arm, in whose ranks he was soon to give his life. For me his words were a last salute from my comrades. Herfeld Marshal, he cried, today we took the Crimean shield our victory sign off the aircraft 